Chapter One of A Shepherd's Life Impressions of the South Wiltshire Downs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. A Shepherd's Life Impressions of the South Wiltshire Downs by William Henry Hudson. Chapter One Salisbury Plain introductory remarks wiltshire little favoured by tourists aspect of the downs bad weather desolate aspect the bird scarer fascination of the downs the larger salisbury plain effect of the military occupation a century's changes birds old wiltshire sheep sheep horns in a well changes wrought by cultivation rabbit warrens on the downs barrows obliterated by the plough and by rabbits wiltshire looks large on the map of england a great green county yet it never appears to be a favourite one to those who go on rambles in the land at all events i am unable to bring to mind an instance of a lover of wiltshire who was not a native or a resident or had not been to marlborough and loved the country on account of early associations nor can i regard myself as an exception since owing to a certain kind of adaptiveness in me a sense of being at home wherever grass grows i am in a way a native too again listen to any half dozen of your friends discussing the places they have visited or intend visiting comparing notes about the counties towns churches castles scenery all that draws them and satisfies their nature and the chances are they will not even mention wiltshire they all know it in a way they have seen salisbury cathedral and stonehenge which everybody must go to look at once in his life and they have also viewed the country from the windows of a railway carriage as they pass through on their flight to bath or to wales with its mountains and to the west country which many of us love best of all somerset devon and cornwall for there is nothing striking in wiltshire at all events to those who love nature first nor mountains nor sea nor anything to compare with the places they are hastening to west or north the downs yes the downs are there full in sight of your window in their flowing forms resembling vast pale green waves wave beyond wave in fluctuation fixed a fine country to walk on in fine weather for all those who regard the mere exercise of walking as sufficient pleasure but to those who wish for something more these downs may be neglected since if downs are wanted there is the higher nobler sussex range within an hour of london there are others on whom the naked aspect of the downs has a repelling effect like gilpin they love not an undecorated earth and false and ridiculous as gilpin's taste may seem to me and to all those who love the chalk which spoils everything as gilpin said he certainly expresses a feeling common to those who are unaccustomed to the emptiness and silence of these great spaces as to walking on the downs one remembers that the fine days are not so many even in the season when they are looked for they have certainly been few during this wet and discomfortable one of nineteen o nine it is indeed only on the chalk hills that i ever feel disposed to quarrel with the english climate for all weathers are good to those who love the open air and have their special attractions what a pleasure it is to be out in rough weather in october when the equinoctial gales are on the wind euclodian to listen to its roaring in the bending trees to watch the dead leaves flying the pestilence stricken multitudes yellow and black and red whirled away in flight on flight before the volleying blast and to hear and see and feel the tempests of rain the big silver-gray drops that smite you like hail and what pleasure too in the still grey november weather the time of suspense and melancholy before winter a strange quietude like a sense of apprehension in nature and so on through the revolving year in all places in all weathers there is pleasure in the open air except on these chalk hills because of their bleak nakedness there the wind and driving rain are not for but against you and may overcome you with misery 
one feels their loneliness monotony and desolation on many days sometimes even when it is not wet and i here recall an amusing encounter with a bird scarer during one of these dreary spells it was in march bitterly cold with an east wind which had been blowing many days and overhead the sky was of a hard steely grey i was cycling along the valley of the ebble and finally leaving it pushed up a long steep slope and set off over the high plain by a dusty road with the wind hard against me a more desolate scene than the one before me it would be hard to imagine for the land was all ploughed and stretched away before me an endless succession of vast grey fields divided by wire fences on all that space there was but one living thing in sight a human form a boy far away on the left side standing in the middle of a big field with something which looked like a gun in his hand immediately after i saw him he too appeared to have caught sight of me for turning he set off running as fast as he could over the ploughed ground towards the road as if intending to speak to me the distance he would have to run was about a quarter of a mile and i doubted that he would be there in time to catch me but he ran fast and the wind was against me and he arrived at the road just as i got to that point there by the side of the fence he stood panting from his race his handsome face glowing with colour a boy about twelve or thirteen with a fine strong figure remarkably well dressed for a bird scarer for that was what he was and he carried a queer heavy-looking old gun i got off my wheel and waited for him to speak but he was silent and continued regarding me with the smiling countenance of one well pleased with himself well i said but there was no answer he only kept on smiling what do you want i demanded impatiently i don't want anything but you started running here as fast as you could the moment you caught sight of me well yes i did well what did you do it for what was your object in running here just to see you pass he answered it was a little ridiculous and vexed me at first but by and by when i left him after some more conversation i felt rather pleased for it was a new and somewhat flattering experience to have any person run a long distance over a ploughed field burdened with a heavy gun just to see me pass but it was not strange in the circumstances his hours in that grey windy desolation must have seemed like days and it was a break in the monotony a little joyful excitement in getting to the road in time to see a passer-by more closely and for a few moments gave him a sense of human companionship i began even to feel a little sorry for him alone there in his high dreary world but presently thought he was better off and better employed than most of his fellows poring over miserable books in school and i wished we had a more rational system of education for the agricultural districts one which would not keep the children shut up in a room during all the best hours of the day when to be out of doors seeing hearing and doing would fit them so much better for the life work before them squeers method was a wiser one we think less of it than of the delightful caricature which makes squeers a joy for ever as mr lang has said of pecksniff but dickens was a londoner and incapable of looking at this or any other question from any other than the londoner's standpoint can you have a better system for the children of all england than this one which will turn out the most perfect draper's assistant in oxford street or to go higher the most efficient mr guppy in a solicitor's office it is true that we have nature's unconscious intelligence against us that by and by when at the age of fourteen the boy is finally released she will set to work to undo the wrong by discharging from his mind its accumulations of useless knowledge as soon as he begins the work of life but what a waste of time and energy and money one can only hope that the slow intellect of the country will wake to this question some day that the countryman will say to the townsman go on making your laws and systems of education for your own children who will live as you do indoors while i shall devise a different one for mine 
one which will give them hard muscles and teach them to raise the mutton and pork and cultivate the potatoes and cabbage on which we all feed to return to the downs their very emptiness and desolation which frightens the stranger from them only serves to make them more fascinating to those who are intimate with and have learned to love them that dreary aspect brings to mind the other one when on waking with the early sunlight in the room you look out on a blue sky cloudless or with white clouds it may be fancy or the effect of contrast but it has always seemed to me that just as the air is purer and fresher on these chalk heights than on the earth below and as the water is of a more crystal purity and the sky perhaps bluer so do all colours and all sounds have a purity and vividness and intensity beyond that of other places i see it in the yellows of hawkweed rock rose and bird's foot trefoil in the innumerable specks of brilliant colour blue and white and rose of milkwort and squinancy wort and in the large flowers of the dwarf thistle glowing purple in its green setting and i hear it in every bird sound in the trivial songs of yellowhammer and corn bunting and of dunnock and wren and whitethroat the pleasure of walking on the downs is not however a subject which concerns me now it is one i have written about in a former work nature in downland descriptive of the south downs the theme of the present work is the life human and other of the south wiltshire downs or of salisbury plain it is the part of wiltshire which has most attracted me most persons would say that the marlborough downs are greater more like the great sussex range as it appears from the weald but chance brought me farther south and the character and life of the village people when i came to know them made this appear the best place to be in the plain itself is not a precisely denned area and may be made to include as much or little as will suit the writer's purpose if you want a continuous plain with no dividing valley cutting through it you must place it between the avon and wiley rivers a distance about fifteen miles broad and as many long with the village of teshed in its centre or if you don't mind the valleys you can say it extends from downton and tollard royal south of salisbury to the pesey vale in the north and from the hampshire border on the east side to dorset and somerset on the west about twenty-five to thirty miles each way my own range is over this larger salisbury plain which includes the river ebble or eberly with its numerous interesting villages from odstock and calm Bisset, near salisbury and the chalks to pretty alvadiston near the dorset line and all those in the nadder valley and westward to white sheet hill above mere you can picture this high chalk country as an open hand the left hand with salisbury in the hollow of the palm placed nearest the wrist and the five valleys which cut through it as the five spread fingers from the bourne the little finger succeeding by avon wiley and nadder to the ebley which comes in lower down as the thumb and has its junction with the main stream below salisbury a very large portion of this high country is now in a transitional state that was once a sheep walk and is now a training ground for the army where the sheep are taken away the turf loses the smooth elastic character which makes it better to walk on than the most perfect lawn the sheep fed closely and everything that grew on the down grasses clovers and numerous small creeping herbs had acquired the habit of growing and flowering close to the ground every species and each individual plant striving with the unconscious intelligence that is in all growing things to hide its leaves and pushing sprays under the others to escape the nibbling teeth by keeping close to the surface there are grasses and some herbs the plantain among them which keep down very close but must grow up a tall stem to flower and seed look at the plantain when its flowering time comes each particular plant growing with its leaves so close down on the surface as to be safe from the busy searching mouths then all at once throwing up tall straight stems to flower and ripen its seeds quickly 
watch a flock at this time and you will see a sheep walking about rapidly plucking the flowering spikes cutting them from the stalk with a sharp snap taking them off at the rate of a dozen or so in twenty seconds but the sheep cannot be all over the downs at the same time and the time is short myriads of plants throwing up their stems at once so that many escape and it has besides a deep perennial root so that the plant keeps its own life though it may be unable to sow any seeds for many seasons so with other species which must send up a tall flower stem and by and by the flowering over and the seeds ripened or lost the dead scattered stems remain like long hairs growing out of a close fur the turf remains unchanged but take the sheep away and it is like the removal of a pressure or a danger the plant recovers liberty and confidence and casts off the old habit it springs and presses up to get the better of its fellows to get all the dew and rain and sunshine that it can and the result is a rough surface another effect of the military occupation is the destruction of all the wild life of the plain but that is a matter i have written about in my last book afoot in england in a chapter on stonehenge and need not dwell on here to the lover of salisbury plain as it was the sight of military camps with white tents or zinc houses and of bodies of men in khaki marching and drilling and the sounds of guns now informs him that he is in a district which has lost its attraction where nature has been dispossessed meanwhile there is a corresponding change going on in the human life of the district let any one describe it as he thinks best as an improvement or a deterioration it is a great change nevertheless which in my case and probably that of many others is as disagreeable to contemplate as that which we are beginning to see in the down which was once a sheep walk and is no longer on this account i have ceased to frequent that portion of the plain where the war office is in possession of the land and to keep to the southern side in my rambles out of sight and hearing of the white tented camps and mimic warfare here is salisbury plain as it has been these thousand years past or ever since sheep were pastured here more than in any other district in england and that may well date even more than ten centuries back undoubtedly changes have taken place even here some very great chiefly during the last or from the late eighteenth century changes both in the land and the animal life wild and domestic of the losses in wild bird life there will be something to say in another chapter they relate chiefly to the extermination of the finest species the big bird especially the soaring bird which is now gone out of all this wide wiltshire sky as a naturalist i must also lament the loss of the old wiltshire breed of sheep although so long gone once it was the only breed known in wilts and extended over the entire county it was a big animal the largest of the fine wooled sheep in england but for looks it certainly compared badly with modern downland breeds and possessed it was said all the points which the breeder or improver was against thus its head was big and clumsy with a round nose its legs were long and thick its belly without wool and both sexes were horned horns even in a ram are an abomination to the modern sheep farmer in southern england finally it was hard to fatten on the other hand it was a sheep which had been from of old on the bare open downs and was modified to suit the conditions the scanty feed the bleak bare country and the long distances it had to travel to and from the pasture ground it was a strong healthy intelligent animal in appearance and character like the old original breed of sheep on the pampas of south america which i knew as a boy a coarse wooled sheep with naked belly tall and hardy a greatly modified variety of the sheep introduced by the spanish colonist three centuries ago at all events the old wiltshire sheep had its merits and when the southdown breed was introduced during the late eighteenth century the farmer viewed it with disfavour 
they liked their old native animal and did not want to lose it but it had to go in time just as in later times the south down had to go when the hampshire down took its place the breed which is now universal in south wilts at all events a solitary flock of the pure-bred old wiltshire sheep existed in the county as late as eighteen forty but the breed has now so entirely disappeared from the country that you find many shepherds who have never even heard of it not many days ago i met with a curious instance of this ignorance of the past i was talking to a shepherd a fine intelligent fellow keenly interested in the subjects of sheep and sheep dogs on the high down above the village of broadchalk on the ebble and he told me that his dog was of mixed breed but on its mother's side came from a welsh sheep dog that his father had always had the welsh dog once common in wiltshire and he wondered why it had gone out as it was so good an animal this led me to say something about the old sheep having gone out too and as he had never heard of the old breed i described the animal to him what i told him he said explained something which had been a puzzle to him for some years there was a deep hollow in the down near the spot where we were standing and at the bottom he said there was an old well which had been used in former times to water the sheep but masses of earth had fallen down from the sides and in that condition it had remained for no one knew how long perhaps fifty perhaps a hundred years some years ago it came into his master's head to have this old well cleaned out and this was done with a good deal of labour the sides having first been boarded over to make it safe for the workmen below at the bottom of the well a vast store of ram's horns were discovered and brought out it was a mystery to the farmer and the men how so large a number of sheep's horns had been got together for rams are few and do not die often and here there were hundreds of horns he understood it now for if all the sheep ewes as well as rams were horned in the old breed a collection like this might easily have been made the greatest change of the last hundred years is no doubt that which the plough has wrought in the aspect of the downs there is a certain pleasure to the eye in the wide fields of golden corn especially of wheat in july and august but a ploughed down is a down made ugly and it strikes one as a mistake even from a purely economic point of view that this old rich turf the slow product of centuries should be ruined for ever as sheep pasture when so great an extent of uncultivated land exists elsewhere especially the heavy clays of the midlands better suited for corn the effect of breaking up the turf on the high downs is often disastrous the thin soil which was preserved by the close hard turf is blown or washed away and the soil becomes poorer year by year in spite of dressing until it is hardly worth cultivating clover may be grown on it but it continues to deteriorate or the tenant or landlord may turn it into a rabbit warren the most fatal policy of all how hideous they are those great stretches of downland enclosed in big wire fences and rabbit netting with little but wiry weeds moss and lichen growing on them the earth dug up everywhere by the disorderly little beasts for a while there is a profit it will serve me my time the owner says but the end is utter barrenness one must lament too the destruction of the ancient earthworks especially of the barrows which is going on all over the downs most rapidly where the land is broken up by the plough one wonders if the ever-increasing curiosity of our day with regard to the history of the human race in the land continues to grow what our descendants of the next half of the century to go no farther will say of us and our incredible carelessness in the matter so small a matter to us but one which will perhaps be immensely important to them it is perhaps better for our peace that we do not know it would not be pleasant to have our children's and children's children's contemptuous expressions sounding in our prophetic ears perhaps we have no right to complain of the obliteration of these memorials of antiquity by the plough 
the living are more than the dead and in this case it may be said that we are only following the artemisian example in consuming in our daily bread minute portions of the ashes of our old relations albeit untearfully with a cheerful countenance still one cannot but experience a shock on seeing the plough driven through an ancient smooth turf curiously marked with barrows lynchets and other mysterious mounds and depressions where sheep have been pastured for a thousand years without obscuring these strange hieroglyphs scored by men on the surface of the hills it is not however only on the cultivated ground that the destruction is going on the rabbit too is an active agent in demolishing the barrows and other earthworks he burrows into the mound and throws out bushels of chalk and clay which is soon washed away by the rains he tunnels it through and through and sometimes makes it his village then one day the farmer or keeper who is not an archaeologist comes along and puts his ferrets into the holes and one of them after drinking his fill of blood falls asleep by the side of his victim and the keeper sets to work with pick and shovel to dig him out and demolishes half the barrows to recover his vile little beast End of chapter one chapter two of a shepherd's life by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two salisbury as i see it the salisbury of the villager the cathedral from the meadow walks to wilton and old sarum the spire and a rainbow charm of old sarum the devastation salisbury from old sarum leland's description salisbury and the village mind market day the infirmary the cathedral the lesson of a child's desire in the streets again an apollo of the downs to the dwellers on the plain salisbury itself is an exceedingly important place the most important in the world for if they have seen a greater london let us say it has left but a confused a phantasmagoric image on the mind an impression of endless thoroughfares and of innumerable people all apparently in a desperate hurry to do something yet doing nothing a labyrinth of streets and wilderness of houses swarming with beings who have no definite object and no more to do with realities than so many lunatics and are unconfined because they are so numerous that all the asylums in the world could not contain them but of salisbury they have a very clear image inexpressibly rich as it is in sights in wonders full of people hundreds of people in the streets and market-place they can take it all in and know its meaning every man and woman of all classes in all that concourse is there for some definite purpose which they can guess and understand and the busy street and market the red houses and soaring spire are all one and part and parcel too of their own lives in their own distant little village by the avon or wiley or anywhere on the plain and that soaring spire which rising so high above the red town first catches the eye the one object which gives unity and distinction to the whole picture is not more distinct in the mind than the entire salisbury with its manifold interests and activities there is nothing in the architecture of england more beautiful than that same spire i have seen it many times far and near from all points of view and am never in or near the place but i go to some spot where i look and enjoy the sight but i will speak here of the two best points of view the nearest which is the artist's favourite point is from the meadows there from the waterside you have the cathedral not too far away nor too near for a picture whether on canvas or in the mind standing amidst its great old trees with nothing but the moist green meadows and the river between one evening during the late summer of this wettest season when the rain was beginning to cease i went out this way for my stroll the pleasantest if not the only walk there is in salisbury it is true there are two others one to wilton by its long shady avenue the other to old sarum 
but these are now motor roads and until the loathed hooting and dusting engines are thrust away into roads of their own there is little pleasure in them for the man on foot the rain ceased but the sky was still stormy with a great blackness beyond the cathedral and still other black clouds coming in from the west behind me then the sun near its setting broke out sending a flame of orange colour through the dark masses around it and at the same time flinging a magnificent rainbow on that black cloud against which the immense spire stood wet with rain and flushed with light so that it looked like a spire built of a stone impregnated with silver never had nature so glorified man's work it was indeed a marvellous thing to see an effect so rare that in all the years i had known salisbury and the many times i had taken that stroll in all weathers it was my first experience of such a thing how lucky then was constable to have seen it when he set himself to paint his famous picture and how brave he was and even wise to have attempted such a subject one which i am informed by artists with the brush only a madman would undertake however great a genius he might be it was impossible we know even to a constable but we admire his failure nevertheless even as we admire turner's many failures but when we go back to nature we are only too glad to forget all about the picture the view from the meadows will not in the future i fear seem so interesting to me i shall miss the rainbow and shall never see again except in that treasured image the great spire as constable saw and tried to paint it in like manner though for a different reason my future visits to old sarum will no longer give me the same pleasure experienced on former occasions old sarum stands over the avon a mile and a half from salisbury a round chalk hill about three hundred feet high in its round shape and isolation resembling a stupendous tumulus in which the giants of antiquity were buried its steeply sloping green sides ringed about with vast concentric earthworks and ditches the work of the old people as they say on the plain when referring to the ancient britons but how ancient whether invading celts or aborigines the true britons who possessed the land from neolithic times even the anthropologists the wise men of to-day are unable to tell us later it was a roman station one of the most important and in after ages a great norman castle and cathedral city until early in the thirteenth century when the old church was pulled down and a new and better one to last for ever was built in the green plain by many running waters church and people gone the castle fell into ruin though some believe it existed down to the fifteenth century but from that time onwards the site has been a place of historical memories and a wilderness nature had made it a sweet and beautiful spot the earth over the old buried ruins was covered with an elastic turf jewelled with the bright little flowers of the chalk the ramparts and ditches being all overgrown with a dense thicket of thorn holly elder bramble and ash tangled up with ivy briony and traveller's joy once only during the last five or six centuries some slight excavations were made when in eighteen thirty four as the result of an excessively dry summer the lines of the cathedral foundation were discernible on the surface but it will no longer be the place it was the society of antiquaries having received permission from the dean and chapter of salisbury to work their sweet will on the site that ancient beautiful carcass which had long made their mouths water on which they have now fallen like a pack of hungry hyenas to tear off the old hide of green turf and burrow down to open to the light or drag out the deep stony framework the beautiful surrounding thickets too must go they tell me since you cannot turn the hill inside out without destroying the trees and bushes that crown it what person who has known it and has often sought that spot for the sake of its ancient associations and of the sweet solace they have found in the solitude or for the noble view of the sacred city from its summit 
will not deplore this fatal amiability of the authorities this weak desire to please every one and inability to say no to such a proposal but let me now return to the object which brings me to this spot it was not to lament the loss of the beautiful which cannot be preserved in our age even this best one of all which salisbury possessed cannot be preserved but to look at salisbury from this point of view it is not as from the meadows a view of the cathedral only but of the whole town amidst its circle of vast green downs it has a beautiful aspect from that point a red brick and red tiled town set low on that circumscribed space whose soft brilliant green is in lovely contrast with the paler hue of the downs beyond the perennial moist green of its water meadows for many swift clear currents flow around and through salisbury and doubtless in former days there were many more channels in the town itself leland's description is worth quoting Quote, there are many fair streets in the cite sabarisi and especially the high street and castle street all the streets in a manner in new salisbury hath little streamlets and arms derived out of avon that runneth through them the site of the very town of salisbury and much ground thereabout is plain and low and as a pan or receiver of most part of the waters of wiltshire End quote on this scene this red town with the great spire set down among water meadows encircled by paler green chalk hills i look from the top of the inner and highest rampart or earthwork or going a little distant down sit at ease on the turf to gaze at it by the hour nor could a sweeter resting-place be found especially at the time of ripe elderberries when the thickets are purple with their clusters and the starlings come in flocks to feed on them and feeding keep up a perpetual low musical jangle about me it is not however of new sarsbury as seen by the tourist with a mind full of history archaeology and the aesthetic delight in cathedrals that i desire to write but of salisbury as it appears to the dweller on the plain for salisbury is the capital of the plain the head and heart of all those villages too many to count scattered far and wide over the surrounding country it is the villagers own peculiar city and even as the spot it stands upon is the pan or receiver of most part of the waters of wiltshire so is it the receiver of all he accomplishes in his laborious life and thitherward flow all his thoughts and ambitions perhaps it is not so difficult for me as it would be for most persons who are not natives to identify myself with him and see it as he sees it that greater place we have been in that mighty monstrous london is ever present to the mind and is like a mist before the sight when we look at other places but for me there is no such mist no image so immense and persistent as to cover and obscure all others and no such mental habit as that of regarding people as a mere crowd a mass a monstrous organism in and on which each individual is but a cell a scale this feeling troubles and confuses my mind when i am in london where we live too thick but quitting it i am absolutely free it has not entered my soul and coloured me with its colour or shut me out from those who have never known it even of the simplest dwellers on the soil who to our sophisticated minds may seem like beings of another species this is my happiness to feel in all places that i am one with them to say for instance that i am going to salisbury to-morrow and catch the gleam in the children's eye and watch them furtively watching me whisper to one another that there will be something for them too on the morrow to set out betimes and overtake the early carriers carts on the road each with its little cargo of packages and women with baskets and an old man or two to recognize acquaintances among those who sit in front and as i go on overtaking and passing carriers and the half gypsy little general dealer in his dirty ramshackle little cart drawn by a rough fast-trotting pony 
all of us intent on business and pleasure bound for salisbury the great market and emporium and place of all delights for all the great plain i remember that on my very last expedition when i had come twelve miles in the rain and was standing at a street corner wet to the skin waiting for my carrier a man in a hurry said to me i say just keep an eye on my cart for a minute or two while i run around to see somebody i've got some fowls in it and if you see any one come poking round just ask them what they want you can't trust every one i'll be back in a minute and he was gone and i was very pleased to watch his cart and fowls till he came back business is business and must be attended to in fair or foul weather but for business with pleasure we prefer it fine on market day the one great and chief pleasure in which all participate is just to be there to be in the crowd a joyful occasion which gives a festive look to every face the mere sight of it exhilarates like wine the numbers the people and the animals the carriers carts drawn up in rows on rows carriers from a hundred little villages on the bourne the avon the wiley the nadder the ebel and from all over the plain each bringing its little contingent hundreds and hundreds more coming by train you see them pouring down fisherton street in a continuous procession all hurrying marketwards and what a lively scene the market presents now full of cattle and sheep and pigs and crowds of people standing round the shouting auctioneers and horses too the beribboned hacks and ponderous draught horses with manes and tails decorated with golden straw thundering over the stone pavement as they are trotted up and down and what a profusion of fruit and vegetables fish and meat and all kinds of provisions on the stalls where women with baskets on their arms are jostling and bargaining the corn exchange is like a huge beehive humming with the noise of talk full of brown-faced farmers in their riding and driving clothes and leggings standing in knots or thrusting their hands into sacks of oats and barley you would think that all the farmers from all the plain were congregated there there is a joyful contagion in it all even the depressed young lover the forlornest of beings repairs his wasted spirits and takes heart again why if i've seen a girl with a pretty face to-day i've seen a hundred and more and she thinks they be so few she can treat me like that and barely give me a pleasant word in a month let her come to salisbury and see how many there be and so with every one in that vast assemblage vast to the dweller in the plain each one is present as it were in two places since each has in his or her heart the constant image of home the little peaceful village in the remote valley a father and mother and neighbours and children in school just now or at play or home to dinner home cares and concerns and the business in salisbury the selling and buying friends and relations to visit or to meet in the market-place and how often the sick one to be seen at the infirmary this home of the injured and ailing which is in the mind of so many of the people gathered together is indeed the cord that draws and binds the city and the village closest together and makes the two like one that great comely building of warm red brick in fisherton street set well back so that you can see it as a whole behind its cedar and beech trees how familiar it is to the villagers in numberless humble homes in hundreds of villages of the plain and all over the surrounding country the infirmary is a name of the deepest meaning and a place of many gad and tender and beautiful associations i heard it spoken of in a manner which surprised me at first for i know some of the london poor and am accustomed to their attitude towards the metropolitan hospitals the londoner uses them very freely they have come to be as necessary to him as the grocer's shop and the public-house but for all the benefits he receives from them he has no faintest sense of gratitude and it is my experience that if you speak to him of this he is roused to anger and demands what are they for 
so far is he from having any thankful thoughts for all that has been given him for nothing and done for him and for his if he has anything to say at all on the matter it is to find fault with the hospitals and cast blame on them for not having healed him more quickly or thoroughly the country town hospital and infirmary is differently regarded by the villagers of the plain it is curious to find how many among them are personally acquainted with it perhaps it is not easy for any one even in this most healthy district to get through life without sickness and all are liable to accidents the injured or afflicted youth taken straight from his rough hard life and poor cottage wonders at the place he finds himself in the wide clean airy room and white easy bed the care and skill of the doctors the tender nursing by women and comforts and luxuries all without payment but given as it seems to him out of pure divine love and compassion all this comes to him as something strange almost incredible he suffers much perhaps but can bear pain stoically and forget it when it is past but the loving kindness he has experienced is remembered that is one of the very great things salisbury has for the villagers and there are many more which may not be spoken of since we do not want to lose sight of the wood on account of the trees only one must be mentioned for a special reason and that is the cathedral the villager is extremely familiar with it as he sees it from the market and the street and from a distance from all the roads which lead him to salisbury seeing it he sees everything beneath it all the familiar places and objects all the streets high and castle and crane streets and many others including endless street which reminds one of sidney smith's last flicker of fun before that candle went out and the white heart and the angel and old george and the humbler goat and green man and shoulder of mutton with many besides and the great red building with its cedar tree and the knot of men and boys standing on the bridge gazing down on the trout in the swift river below and the market-place and its busy crowds all the familiar sights and scenes that come under the spire like a flock of sheep on a burning day in summer grouped about a great tree growing in the pasture-land but he is not familiar with the interior of the great fane it fails to draw him doubtless because he has no time in his busy practical life for the cultivation of the aesthetic faculties there is a crust over that part of his mind but it need not always and ever be so the crust is not on the mind of the child before a stall in the market-place a child is standing with her mother a commonplace-looking little girl of about twelve blue-eyed light-haired with thin arms and legs dressed poorly enough for her holiday the mother stoutish in her best but much worn black gown and a brown straw out-of-shape hat decorated with bits of ribbon and a few soiled and frayed artificial flowers probably she is the wife of a labourer who works hard to keep himself and family on fourteen shillings a week and she too shows in her hard hands and sunburnt face with little wrinkles appearing that she is a hard worker but she is very jolly for she is in salisbury on market day in fine weather with several shillings in her purse a shilling for the fares and perhaps eightpence for refreshments and the rest to be expended in necessaries for the house and now to increase the pleasures of the day she has unexpectedly run against a friend there they stand the two friends basket on arm right in the midst of the jostling crowd talking in their loud tinny voices at a tremendous rate while the girl with a half-eager half listless expression stands by with her hand on her mother's dress and every time there is a second's pause in the eager talk she gives a little tug at the gown and ejaculates mother the woman impatiently shakes off the hand and says sharply what now marty can't he let me say just a word without bothering and on the talk runs again then another tug and mother and then you promised mother and by and by mother you said you'd take me to the cathedral next time having heard so much i wanted to hear more 
and addressing the woman i asked her why her child wanted to go she answered me with a good-humoured laugh tis all because she heard em talking about it last winter and she'd never been and i says to her never you mind marty i'll take you there the next time i go to salisbury and she's never forgot it said the other woman not she marty ain't one to forget and you been four times mother put in the girl have i now well tis too late now half past two and we must be golden four oh mother you promised well then come along you worrying child and let's have it over or you'll give me no peace and away they went and i would have followed to know the result if it had been in my power to look into that young brain and see the thoughts and feelings there as the crystal gazer sees things in a crystal in a vague way with some very early memories to help me i can imagine it the shock of pleased wonder at the sight of that immense interior that far-extending nave with pillars that stand like the tall trunks of pines and beeches and at the end the light screen which allows the eye to travel on through the rich choir to see with fresh wonder and delight high up and far off that glory of coloured glass as of a window half open to an unimaginable place beyond a heavenly cathedral to which all this is but a dim porch or passage we do not properly appreciate the educational value of such early experiences and i use that dismal word not because it is perfectly right or for want of a better one but because it is in everybody's mouth and understood by all for all i know to the contrary village schools may be bundled in and out of the cathedral from time to time but that is not the right way seeing that the child's mind is not the crowd of children's mind but i can imagine that when we have a wiser better system of education in the villages in which books will not be everything and to be shut up six or seven hours every day to prevent the children from learning the things that matter most i can imagine at such a time that the schoolmaster or mistress will say to the village woman i hear you're going to salisbury to-morrow or next tuesday and i want you to take janey or little dan or peter and leave him for an hour to play about on the cathedral green and watch the daws flying round the spire and take a peep inside while you are doing your marketing back from the cathedral once more from the infirmary and from shops and refreshment houses out in the sun among the busy people let us delay a little longer for the sake of our last scene it was past noon on a hot brilliant day in august and that splendid weather had brought in more people than i had ever before seen congregated in salisbury and never had the people seemed so talkative and merry and full of life as on that day i was standing at a busy spot by a row of carriers carts drawn up at the side of the pavement just where there are three public houses close together when i caught sight of a young man of about twenty-two or twenty-three a shepherd in a grey suit and thick iron-shod old boots and brown leggings with a soft felt hat thrust jauntily on the back of his head coming along towards me with that half-slouching, half-swinging gait peculiar to the men of the downs, especially when they are in the town on pleasure bent. Decidedly he was there on pleasure, and had been indulging in a glass or two of beer, perhaps three, and was very happy, trolling out a song in a pleasant musical voice as he swung along, taking no notice of the people stopping and turning round to stare after him or of those of his own party who were following and trying to keep up with him calling to him all the time to stop to wait to go slow and give them a chance there were seven following him a stout middle-aged woman then a grey-haired old woman and two girls and last a youngish married woman with a small boy by the hand and the stout woman with a red laughing face cried out oh dave do stop can't he where be goin so fast man don't ee see we can't keep up with ee but he would not stop nor listen it was his day out his great day in salisbury a very rare occasion and he was very happy then she would turn back to the others and cry tisn't no use he won't bide for us 
did he ever see such a boy and laughing and perspiring she would start on after him again now this incident would have been too trivial to relate had it not been for the appearance of the man himself his powerful and perfect physique and marvellously handsome face such a face as the old greek sculptors have left to the world to be universally regarded and admired for all time as the most perfect i do not think that this was my feeling only i imagine that the others in that street who were standing still and staring after him had something of the same sense of surprise and admiration he excited in me just then it happened that there was a great commotion outside one of the public-houses where a considerable party of gipsies in their little carts had drawn up and were all engaged in a violent confused altercation probably they or one of them had just disposed of a couple of stolen ducks or a sheepskin or a few rabbits and they were quarrelling over the division of the spoil at all events they were violently excited scowling at each other and one or two in a dancing rage and had collected a crowd of amused lookers-on but when the young man came singing by they all turned to stare at him as he came on i placed myself directly in his path and stared straight into his eyes grey eyes and very beautiful but he refused to see me he stared through me like an animal when you try to catch its eyes and went by still trolling out his song with all the others streaming after him End of chapter two chapter three of a shepherd's life by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three winterbourne bishop a favorite village isolated situation appearance of the village hedge fruit the winterbourne human interest the home feeling man in harmony with nature human bones thrown out by a rabbit a spot unspoiled and unchanged of the few widely separated villages hidden away among the lonely downs in the large blank spaces between the rivers the one i love best is winterbourne bishop yet of the entire number i know them all intimately i dare say it would be pronounced by most persons the least attractive it has less shade from trees in summer and is more exposed in winter to the bleak winds of this high country from whichever quarter they may blow placed high itself on a wide unwooded valley or depression with the low sloping downs at some distance away the village is about as cold a place to pass a winter in as one could find in this district and it may be added the most inconvenient to live in at any time the nearest town or the easiest to get to being salisbury twelve miles distant by a hilly road the only means of getting to that great centre of life which the inhabitants possess is by carrier's cart which makes the weary four hours journey once a week on market day naturally not many of them see that place of delights oftener than once a year and some but once in five or more years then as to the village itself when you have got down into its one long rather winding street or road this has a green bank five or six feet high on either side on which stand the cottages mostly facing the road real houses there are none buildings worthy of being called houses in these great days unless the three small farmhouses are considered better than cottages and the rather mean-looking rectory the rector poor man is very poor just in the middle part where the church stands in its green churchyard the shadiest spot in the village a few of the cottages are close together almost touching then farther apart twenty yards or so then farther still forty or fifty yards they are small old cottages a few have seventeenth-century dates cut on stone tablets on their fronts but the undated ones look equally old some thatched others tiled but none particularly attractive certainly they are without the added charm of a green drapery creeper or ivy rose clematis and honeysuckle and they are also mostly without the cottage garden flowers unprofitably gay like the blossoming firs but dear to the soul 
the flowers we find in so many of the villages along the rivers especially in those of the wiley valley to be described in a later chapter the trees i have said are few though the churchyard is shady where you can refresh yourself beneath its ancient beeches and its one wide-branching yew or sit on a tomb in the sun when you wish for warmth and brightness the trees growing by or near the street are mostly ash or beech with a pine or two old but not large and there are small or dwarf yew holly and thorn trees very little fruit is grown two or three to half a dozen apple and damson trees are called an orchard and one is sorry for the children but in late summer and autumn they get their fruit from the hedges these run up towards the downs on either side of the village at right angles with its street long unkept hedges beautiful with scarlet haws and traveller's joy rich in bramble and elderberries and purple sloes and nuts a thousand times more nuts than the little dormice require for their own modest wants finally to go back to its disadvantages the village is waterless at all events in summer when water is most wanted water is such a blessing and joy in a village a joy forever when it flows throughout the year as at nether stowey and winsford and burton on the water to mention but three of all those happy villages in the land which are known to most of us what man on coming to such places and watching the rushing sparkling foaming torrent by day and listening to its splashing gurgling sounds by night does not resolve that he will live in no village that has not a perennial stream in it this unblessed high and dry village has nothing but the winter born which gives it its name a sort of surname common to a score or two villages in wiltshire dorset somerset and hants here the bed of the stream lies by the bank on one side of the village street and when the autumn and early winter rains have fallen abundantly the hidden reservoirs within the chalk hills are filled to overflowing then the water finds its way out and fills the dry old channel and sometimes turns the whole street into a rushing river to the immense joy of the village children they are like ducks hatched and reared at some upland farm where there was not even a muddy pool to dibble in for a season the wet one the village women have water at their own doors and can go out and dip pails in it as often as they want when spring comes it is still flowing merrily trying to make you believe that it is going to flow forever beautiful green water-loving plants and grasses spring up and flourish along the roadside and you may see comfrey and water forget-me-not in flower pools too have been formed in some deep hollow places they are fringed with tall grasses whitened over with bloom of water crowfoot and poa grass grows up from the bottom to spread its green tresses over the surface better still by and by a couple of stray moor hens make their appearance in the pool strange birds coloured glossy olive brown slashed with white with splendid scarlet and yellow beaks if by some strange chance a shining blue kingfisher were to appear it could not create a greater excitement so much attention do they receive that the poor strangers have no peace of their own lives it is a happy time for the children and a good time for the busy housewife who has all the water she wants for cooking and washing and cleaning she may now dash as many pailfuls over her brick floor as she likes then the clear swift current begins to diminish and scarcely have you had time to notice the change than it is altogether gone the women must go back to the well and let the bucket down and laboriously turn and turn the handle of the windlass till it mounts to the top again the pretty moist green herbage the graceful grasses quickly wither away dust and straws and rubbish from the road lie in the dry channel and by and by it is filled with a summer growth of dock and loveless nettles which no child may touch with impunity no i cannot think that any person for whom it had no association no secret interest would after looking at this village with its dried-up winter-born care to make his home in it and no person i imagine wants to see it 
for it has no special attraction and is away from any road at a distance from everywhere i knew a great many villages in salisbury plain and was always adding to their number but there was no intention of visiting this one perhaps there is not a village on the plain or anywhere in wiltshire for that matter which sees fewer strangers then i fell in with the old shepherd whose life will be related in the succeeding chapters and who away from his native place had no story about his past life and the lives of those he had known no thought in his mind i might almost say which was not connected with the village of winterbourne bishop and many of his anecdotes and reflections proved so interesting that i fell into the habit of putting them down in my notebook until in the end the place itself where he had followed his homely trade so long seeing and feeling so much drew me to it i knew there was nothing to see in it that it was without the usual attractions that there was in fact nothing but the human interest but that was enough so i came to it to satisfy an idle curiosity just to see how it would accord with the mental picture produced by his descriptions of it i came i may say prepared to like the place for the sole but sufficient reason that it had been his home had it not been for this feeling he had produced in me i should not i imagine have cared to stay long in it as it was i did stay then came again and found that it was growing on me i wondered why for the mere interest in the old shepherd's life memories did not seem enough to account for this deepening attachment it began to seem to me that i liked it more and more because of its very barrenness the entire absence of all the features which make a place attractive noble scenery woods and waters deer parks and old houses tudor elizabethan jacobean stately and beautiful full of art treasures ancient monuments and historical associations there were none of these things there was nothing here but that wide vacant expanse very thinly populated with humble rural folk farmers shepherds labourers living in very humble houses england is so full of riches in ancient monuments and grand and interesting and lovely buildings and objects and scenes that it is perhaps too rich for we may get into the habit of looking for such things expecting them at every turn every mile of the way i found it a relief at winterbourne bishop to be in a country which had nothing to draw a man out of a town a wide empty land with nothing on it to look at but a furze bush or when i had gained the summit of the down and to get a little higher still stood on the top of one of its many barrows a sight of the distant village its low grey or reddish-brown cottages half hidden among its few trees the square stone tower of its little church looking at a distance no taller than a milestone that emptiness seemed good for both mind and body i could spend long hours idly sauntering or sitting or lying on the turf thinking of nothing or only of one thing that it was a relief to have no thoughts about anything but no something was secretly saying to me all the time that it was more than what i have said which continued to draw me to this vacant place more than the mere relief experienced on coming back to nature and solitude and the freedom of a wide earth and sky i was not fully conscious of what that something more was until after repeated visits on each occasion it was a pleasure to leave salisbury behind and set out on that long hilly road and the feeling would keep with me all the journey even in bad weather sultry or cold or with the wind hard against me blowing the white chalk dust into my eyes from the time i left the turnpike to go the last two and a half to three miles by the side road i would gaze eagerly ahead for a sight of my destination long before it could possibly be seen until on gaining the summit of a low intervening down the wished scene would be disclosed the veil-like wide depression with its line of trees blue-green in the distance flecks of red and grey colour of the houses among them and at that sight there would come a sense of elation like that of coming home this in fact was the secret 
this empty place was in its aspect despite the difference in configuration between down and undulating plain more like the home of my early years than any other place known to me in the country i can note many differences but they do not deprive me of this home feeling it is the likenesses that hold me the spirit of the place one which is not a desert with a desert's melancholy or sense of desolation but inhabited although thinly and by humble-minded men whose work and dwellings are unobtrusive the final effect of this wide green space with signs of human life and labour on it and sight of animals sheep and cattle at various distances is that we are not aliens here intruders or invaders on the earth living in it but apart perhaps hating and spoiling it but with the very animals our children of nature like them living and seeking our subsistence under her sky familiar with her sun and wind and rain if some ostentatious person had come to this strangely quiet spot and raised a staring big house the sight of it in the landscape would have made it impossible to have such a feeling as i have described this sense of man's harmony and oneness with nature from how much of england has this expression which nature has for the spirit which is so much more to us than beauty of scenery been blotted out this quiet spot in wiltshire has been inhabited from of old how far back in time the barrows raised by an ancient barbarous people are there to tell us and to show us how long it is possible for the race of men in all stages of culture to exist on the earth without spoiling it one afternoon while walking on bishop down i noticed at a distance of a hundred yards or more that a rabbit had started making a burrow in a new place and had thrown out a vast quantity of earth going to the spot to see what kind of chalk or soil he was digging so deeply in i found that he had thrown out a human thigh bone and a rib or two they were of a reddish white colour and had been embedded in a hard mixture of chalk and red earth the following day i went again and there were more bones and every day after that the number increased until it seemed to me that he had brought out the entire skeleton minus the skull which i had been curious to see then the bones disappeared the man who looked after the game had seen them and recognizing that they were human remains had judiciously taken them away to destroy or stow them away in some safe place for if the village constable had discovered them or heard of their presence he would perhaps have made a fuss and even thought it necessary to communicate with the coroner of the district such things occasionally happen even in wiltshire where the chalk hills are full of the bones of dead men and a solemn crowner's quest is held on the remains of a saxon or dane or an ancient briton when some important person a sir richard colt hoare for example who dug up three hundred and seventy-nine barrows in wiltshire or a general pitt rivers throws out human remains nobody minds but if an unauthorized rabbit kicks out a lot of bones the matter should be inquired into but the man whose bones had been thus thrown out into the sunlight after lying so long at that spot which commanded a view of the distant little village looking so small in that immense green space who and what he was and how long ago did he live on the earth at winterbourne bishop let us say there were two barrows in that part of the down but quite a stone's throw away from the spot where the rabbit was working so that he may not have been one of the people of that period still it is probable that he was buried a very long time ago centuries back perhaps a thousand years perhaps longer and by chance there was a slope there which prevented the water from percolating and the soil in which he had been deposited under that close-knit turf which looks as if it had never been disturbed was one in which bones might keep uncrumbled for ever the thought that occurred to me at the time was that if the man himself had come back to life after so long a period to stand once more on that down surveying the scene he would have noticed little change in it certainly nothing of a startling description 
the village itself looking so small at that distance in the centre of the vast depression would probably not be strange to him it was doubtless there as far back as history goes and probably still farther back in time for at that point just where the winterborne gushes out from the low hills is the spot man would naturally select to make his home and he would see no mansion or big building no puff of white steam and sight of a long black train creeping over the earth nor any other strange thing it would appear to him even as he knew it before he fell asleep the same familiar scene with firs and bramble and bracken on the slope the wide expanse with sheep and cattle grazing in the distance and the dark green of trees in the hollows and fold on fold of the low down beyond stretching away to the dim farthest horizon End of chapter three chapter four of a shepherd's life by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four a shepherd of the downs caleb Balcom an old shepherd's love of his home fifty years shepherding Balcom's singular appearance a tale of a titlark caleb Balcom's father father and son a grateful sportsman and isaac Balcom's pension death following death in old married couples in a village churchyard a farm labourer's gravestone and his story it is now several years since i first met caleb Balcom, a shepherd of the south wiltshire downs but already old and infirm and past work i met him at a distance from his native village and it was only after i had known him a long time and had spent many afternoons and evenings in his company listening to his anecdotes of his shepherding days that i went to see his own old home for myself the village of winterbourne bishop already described to find it a place after my own heart but as i have said if i had never known caleb and heard so much from him about his own life and the lives of many of his fellow villagers i should probably never have seen this village one of his memories was of an old shepherd named john whose acquaintance he made when a very young man john being at that time seventy-eight years old on the winterborne bishop farm where he had served for an unbroken period of close on sixty years though so aged he was still head shepherd and he continued to hold that place seven years longer until his master who had taken over old john with the place finally gave up the farm and farming at the same time he too was getting past work and wished to spend his declining years in his native village in an adjoining parish where he owned some house and cottage property and now what was to become of the old shepherd since the new tenant had brought his own men with him and he moreover considered that john at eighty-five was too old to tend a flock on the hills even of tegs his old master anxious to help him tried to get him some employment in the village where he wished to stay and failing in this he at last offered him a cottage rent-free in the village where he was going to live himself and in addition twelve shillings a week for the rest of his life it was in those days an exceedingly generous offer but john refused it master he said i am going to stay in my own native village and if i can't make a living the parish have to keep i but keep or not keep here i be and here i be going to stay where i were born from this position the stubborn old man refused to be moved and there at winterborne bishop his master had to leave him although not without having first made him a sufficient provision the way in which my old friend caleb Balcom told the story plainly revealed his own feeling in the matter he understood and had the keenest sympathy with old john dead now over half a century or rather let us say resting very peacefully in that green spot under the old grey tower of winterborne bishop church where as a small boy he had played among the old gravestones as far back in time as the middle of the eighteenth century 
but old john had long survived wife and children and having no one but himself to think of was at liberty to end his days where he pleased not so with caleb for although his undying passion for home and his love of the shepherd's calling were as great as john's he was not so free and he was compelled at last to leave his native downs which he may never see again to settle for the remainder of his days in another part of the country early in life he caught a chill through long exposure to wet and cold in winter this brought on rheumatic fever and a malady of the thigh which finally affected the whole limb and made him lame for life thus handicapped he had continued as shepherd for close on fifty years during which time his sons and daughters had grown up married and gone away mostly to a considerable distance leaving their aged parents alone once more then the wife who was a strong woman and of an enterprising temper found an opening for herself at a distance from home where she could start a little business caleb indignantly refused to give up shepherding in his place to take part in so unheard of an adventure but after a year or more of life in his lonely hut among the hills and cold empty cottage in the village he at length tore himself away from that beloved spot and set forth on the longest journey of his life about forty-five miles to join her and help in the work of her new home here a few years later i found him aged seventy-two but owing to his increasing infirmities looking considerably more when he considered that his father a shepherd before him on those same wiltshire downs lived to eighty-six and his mother to eighty-four and that both were vigorous and led active lives almost to the end he thought it strange that his own work should be so soon done for in heart and mind he was still young he did not want to rest yet since that first meeting nine years have passed and as he is actually better in health to-day than he was then there is good reason to hope that his staying power will equal that of his father i was at first struck with the singularity of caleb's appearance and later by the expression of his eyes a very tall big-boned lean round-shouldered man he was uncouth almost to the verge of grotesqueness and walked painfully with the aid of a stick dragging his shrunken and shortened bad leg his head was long and narrow and his high forehead long nose long chin and long coarse grey whiskers worn like a beard on his throat produced a goat-like effect this was heightened by the ears and eyes the big ears stood out from his head and owing to a peculiar bend or curl in the membrane at the top they looked at certain angles almost pointed the hazel eyes were wonderfully clear but that quality was less remarkable than the unhuman intelligence in them fawn-like eyes that gazed steadily at you as one may gaze through the window open back and front of a house at the landscape beyond this peculiarity was a little disconcerting at first when after making his acquaintance out of doors i went in uninvited and sat down with him at his own fireside the busy old wife talked of this and that and hinted as politely as she knew how that i was in her way to her practical peasant mind there was no sense in my being there he be a stranger to we and we be strangers to he caleb was silent and his clear eyes showed neither annoyance nor pleasure but only their native wild alertness but the caste feeling is always less strong in the hill shepherd than in other men who are on the land in some cases it will vanish at a touch and it was so in this one a canary in a cage hanging in the kitchen served to introduce the subject of birds captive and birds free i said that i liked the little yellow bird and was not vexed to see him in a cage since he was cage born but i considered that those who caught wild birds and kept them prisoners did not properly understand things this happened to be caleb's view he had a curiously tender feeling about the little wild birds and one amusing incident of his boyhood which he remembered came out during our talk he was out on the down one summer day in charge of his father's flock when two boys of the village on a ramble in the hills came and sat down on the turf by his side one of them had a titlark or meadow pipit 
which he had just caught in his hand and there was a hot argument as to which of the two was the lawful owner of the poor little captive the facts were as follows one of the boys having found the nest became possessed with the desire to get the bird his companion at once offered to catch it for him and together they withdrew to a distance and sat down and waited until the bird returned to sit on the eggs then the young bird-catcher returned to the spot and creeping silently up to within five or six feet of the nest threw his hat so that it fell over the sitting titlark but after having thus secured it he refused to give it up the dispute waxed hotter as they sat there and at last when it got to the point of threats of cuffs on the ear and slaps on the face they agreed to fight it out the victor to have the titlark the bird was then put under a hat for safety on the smooth turf a few feet away and the boys proceeded to take off their jackets and roll up their shirt-sleeves after which they faced one another and were just about to begin when caleb thrusting out his crook turned the hat over and away flew the titlark the boys deprived of their bird and of an excuse for a fight would gladly have discharged their fury on caleb but they durst not seeing that his dog was lying at his side they could only threaten and abuse him call him bad names and finally put on their coats and walk off that pretty little tale of a titlark was but the first of a long succession of memories of his early years with half a century of shepherding life on the downs which came out during our talks on many autumn and winter evenings as we sat by his kitchen fire the earlier of these memories were always the best to me because they took one back sixty years or more to a time when there was more wildness in the earth than now and a nobler wild animal life even more interesting were some of the memories of his father isaac balcombe whose time went back to the early years of the nineteenth century caleb cherished an admiration and reverence for his father's memory which were almost a worship and he loved to describe him as he appeared in his old age when upwards of eighty he was erect and tall standing six feet two in height well proportioned with a clean-shaved florid face clear dark eyes and silver-white hair and at this later period of his life he always wore the dress of an old order of pensioners to which he had been admitted a soft broad white felt hat thick boots and brown leather leggings and a long grey cloth overcoat with red collar and brass buttons according to caleb he must have been an exceedingly fine specimen of a man both physically and morally born in eighteen hundred he began following a flock as a boy and continued as shepherd on the same farm until he was sixty never rising to more than seven shillings a week and nothing found since he lived in the cottage where he was born and which he inherited from his father that a man of his fine powers a head shepherd on a large hill farm should have had no better pay than that down to the year eighteen sixty after nearly half a century of work in one place seems almost incredible even his sons as they grew up to man's estate advised him to ask for an increase but he would not seven shillings a week he had always had and that small sum with something his wife earned by making highly finished smock frocks had been sufficient to keep them all in a decent way and his sons were now all earning their own living but caleb got married and resolved to leave the old farm at bishop to take a better place at a distance from home at warminster which had been offered him he would there have a cottage to live in nine shillings a week and a sack of barley for his dog at that time the shepherd had to keep his own dog no small expense to him when his wages were no more than six to eight shillings a week but caleb was his father's favourite son and the old man could not endure the thought of losing sight of him and at last finding that he could not persuade him not to leave the old home he became angry and told him that if he went away to warminster for the sake of the higher wages and barley for the dog he would disown him this was a serious matter to caleb in spite of the fact that a shepherd has no money to leave to his children when he passes away he went nevertheless for though he loved and reverenced his father he had a young wife who pulled the other way 
and he was absent for years, and when he returned, the old man's heart had softened, so that he was glad to welcome him back to the old home. Meanwhile, at that humble cottage at Winterbourne Bishop, great things had happened. Old Isaac was no longer shepherding on the downs, but living very comfortably in his own cottage in the village. The change came about in this way. The downland shepherds, Caleb said, were as a rule clever poachers, and it is really not surprising, when one considers the temptation to a man with a wife and several hungry children, besides himself and a dog, to feed out of about seven shillings a week. But old Balcom was an exception. He would take no game, furred or feathered, nor, if he could prevent it, allow another to take anything from the land fed by his flock. Caleb and his brothers, when as boys and youths they began their shepherding, sometimes caught a rabbit, or their dog caught and killed one without their encouragement. But however the thing came into their hands, they could not take it home on account of their father. Now it happened that an elderly gentleman who had the shooting was a keen sportsman, and that in several successive years he found a wonderful difference in the amount of game at one spot among the hills, and in all the rest of his hill property. The only explanation the keeper could give was that Isaac Balcombe tended his flock on that down, where rabbits, hares, and partridges were so plentiful. One autumn day the gentleman was shooting over that down, and seeing a big man in a smock-frock, standing motionless, crook in hand, regarding him, he called out to his keeper, who was with him, "'Who is that big man?' and was told that it was Shepherd Balcombe. The old gentleman pulled some money out of his pocket and said, "'Give him this half-crown, and thank him for the good sport I've had to-day.' But after the coin had been given, the giver still remained standing there, thinking, perhaps, that he had not yet sufficiently rewarded the man. And at last, before turning away, he shouted, "'Balcombe, that's not all. You'll get something more by and by.' Isaac had not long to wait for the something more, and it turned out not to be the hare or brace of birds he had half expected. It happened that the sportsman was one of the trustees of an ancient charity, which provided for six of the most deserving old men of the parish of Bishop. Now, one of the six had recently died, and on this gentleman's recommendation, Balcombe had been elected to fill the vacant place. The letter from Salisbury, informing him of his election, and commanding his presence in that city, filled him with astonishment, for though he was sixty years old and the father of three sons now out in the world, he could not yet regard himself as an old man, for he had never known a day's illness nor an ache, and was famed in all that neighbourhood for his great physical strength and endurance. And now, with his own cottage to live in, eight shillings a week, and his pensioner's garment, with certain benefits, and a shilling a day besides, which his old master paid him for some services at the farmhouse in the village, Isaac found himself very well off indeed, and he enjoyed his prosperous state for twenty-six years. Then, in 1886, his old wife fell ill and died, and no sooner was she in her grave than he too began to droop, and soon before the year was out he followed her because, as the neighbors said, they had always been a loving pair, and one could not bide without the other. This chapter has already had its proper ending, and there was no intention of adding to it, but now, for a special reason, which I trust the reader will pardon when he hears it, I must go on to say something about that strange phenomenon of death succeeding death in old married couples, one dying for no other reason than that the other has died for it is our instinct to hold fast to life and the older a man gets if he be sane the more he becomes like a new-born child in the impulse to grip tightly a strange and a rare thing among people generally the people we know it is nevertheless quite common among persons of the labouring class in the rural districts I have sometimes marvelled at the number of such cases to be met with in the villages, but when one comes to think about it, one ceases to wonder that it should be so. 
for the laborer on the land goes on from boyhood to the end of life in the same everlasting round the changes from task to task according to the seasons being no greater than in the case of the animals that alter their actions and habits to suit the varying conditions of the year march and august and december and every month will bring about the changes in the atmosphere and earth and vegetation and in the animals which have been of old which he knows how to meet and the old familiar task lambing time shearing time root and seed crops hoeing haymaking harvesting it is a life of the extremest simplicity without all those interests outside the home and the daily task the innumerable distractions common to all persons in other classes and to the workmen in towns as well incidentally it may be said that it is also the healthiest that speaking generally the agricultural laborer is the healthiest and sanest man in the land if not also the happiest as some believe it is this life of simple unchanging actions and of habits that are like instincts of hard labor in sun and wind and rain from day to day with its weekly break and rest and of but few comforts and no luxuries which serves to bind man and wife so closely and the longer their life goes on together the closer and more unbreakable the union grows they are growing old old friends and companions have died or left them their children have married and gone away and have their own families and affairs so that the old folks at home are little remembered and to all others they have become of little consequence in the world but they do not know it for they are together cherishing the same memories speaking of the same old familiar things and their lost friends and companions their absent perhaps estranged children are with them still in mind as in the old days the past is with them more than the present to give an undying interest to life for they share it and it is only when one goes when the old wife gets the tea ready and goes mechanically to the door to gaze out knowing that her tired man will come in no more to take his customary place and listen to all the things she has stored up in her mind during the day to tell him and when the tired laborer comes in at dusk to find no old wife waiting to give him his tea and talk to him while he refreshes himself he all at once realizes his position he finds himself cut off from the entire world from all of his kind where are they all the enduring sympathy of that one soul that was with him till now had kept him in touch with life had made it seem unchanged and unchangeable and with that soul has vanished the old sweet illusion as well as all ties all common human affection he is desolate indeed alone in a desert world and it is not strange that in many and many a case even in that of a man still strong untouched by disease and good for another decade or two the loss the awful solitude has proved too much for him such cases i have said are common but they are not recorded though it is possible with labor to pick them out in the church registers but in the churchyards you do not find them since the farm laborer has only a green mound to mark the spot where he lies nevertheless he is sometimes honored with a gravestone and last august i came by chance on one on which was recorded a case like that of isaac bawcombe and his life mate the churchyard is in one of the prettiest and most secluded villages in the downland country described in this book the church is ancient and beautiful and interesting in many ways and the churchyard too is one of the most interesting i know a beautiful green tree-shaded spot with an extraordinary number of tombs and gravestones many of them dated in the eighteenth and seventeenth centuries inscribed with names of families which have long died out i went on that afternoon to pass an hour in the churchyard and finding an old man in laborer's clothes resting on a tomb i sat down and entered into conversation with him he was seventy-nine he told me and past work and he had three shillings a week from the parish but he was very deaf and it fatigued me to talk to him and seeing the church open i went in on previous visits i had had a good deal of trouble to get the key and to find it open now was a pleasant surprise 
an old woman was there dusting the seats and by and by while i was talking with her the old labourer came stumping in with his ponderous iron-shod boots and without taking off his old rusty hat and began shouting at the church cleaner about a pair of trousers he had given her to mend which he wanted badly leaving them to their arguing i went out and began studying the inscriptions on the stones so hard to make out in some instances the old man followed and went his way then the church cleaner came out to where i was standing a tiresome old man she said he's that deaf he has to shout to hear himself speak then you've got to shout back and all about his old trousers i suppose he wants them i returned and you promised to do them so he has some reason for going at you about it oh no he hasn't she replied the girl brought them for me to mend and i said leave them and i'll do them when i've time how did i know he wanted them in a hurry a troublesome old man by and by taking a pair of spectacles out of her pocket she put them on and going down on her knees she began industriously picking the old brown dead moss out of the lettering on one side of the tomb i'd like to know what it says on this stone she said well you can read it for yourself now you've got your glasses on i can't read you see i'm old seventy-six years and when i were little we were very poor and i couldn't get no schooling i've got these glasses to do my sewing and only put them on to get this stuff out so you could read it i'd like to hear you read it i began to get interested in the old dame who talked to me so freely she was small and weak-looking and appeared very thin in her limp old faded gown she had a meek patient expression on her face and her voice too like her face expressed weariness and resignation but if you have always lived here you must know what is said on this stone no i don't nobody never read it to me and i couldn't read it because i wasn't taught to read but i'd like to hear you read it it was a long inscription to a person named ash gentleman of this parish who departed this life over a century ago and was a man of noble and generous disposition good as a husband a father a friend and charitable to the poor under all were some lines of verse scarcely legible in spite of the trouble she had taken to remove the old moss from the letters she listened with profound interest then said i never heard all that before i didn't know the name though i've known this stone since i was a child i used to climb on to it then can you read me another i read her another and several more then came to one which she said she knew every word of it for this was the grave of the sweetest kindest woman that ever lived oh how good this dear woman had been to her in her young married life more than fifty years ago if that dear lady had only lived it would not have been so hard for her when her trouble come and what was your trouble it was the loss of my poor man he was such a good man a thatcher and he fell from a rick and injured his spine and he died poor fellow and left me with our five little children then having told me her own tragedy to my surprise she brightened up and begged me to read other inscriptions to her i went on reading and presently she said no that's wrong there wasn't ever a lampard in this parish that i know you don't know there certainly was a lampard or it would not be stated here cut in deep letters on this stone no there wasn't a lampard i've never known such a name and i've lived here all my life but there were people living here before you came on the scene he died a long time ago this lampard in uh, seventeen fourteen it says and you are only seventy-six you tell me that is to say you were born in eighteen thirty five and that would be one hundred and twenty-one years after he died that's a long time it must be very old this stone and the church too i've heard say it was once a roman catholic church is that true why of course it's true all the old churches were and we were all of that faith until the king of england had a quarrel with the pope and determined he would be pope himself as well as king in his own country so he turned all the priests and monks out and took their property and churches and had his own men put in that was henry the eighth i've heard something about that king and his wives 
but about lampard it do seem strange i've never heard that name before oh, not strange at all it was a common name in this part of wiltshire in former days you find it in dozens of churchyards but you'll find very few lampards living in the villages why i could tell you a dozen or twenty surnames some queer funny names that were common in these parts not more than a century ago which seem to have quite died out i should like to hear some of them if you'll tell me well, let me think a moment there was thor pizzy g every poddle kiddle tumor shergold and here she interrupted to say that she knew three of the names i had mentioned then pointing to a small upright gravestone about twenty feet away she added and there's one very well i said but don't keep putting me out i've got more names in my mind to tell you maidment marchmont velvin burpet windsor rideout cullern of these she only knew one rideout then i went over to the stone she had pointed to and read the inscription to john toomer and his wife rebecca she died first in march eighteen seventy seven aged seventy two he in july the same year aged seventy five you knew them i suppose yes they belonged here both of them well tell me about them there's nothing to tell he was only a laborer and worked on the same farm all his life who put a stone over them their children no they're all poor and live away i think it was a lady who lived here she'd been good to them and she came and stood here when they put old john in the ground but i want to hear more there's no more i've said he was a laborer and after she died he died yes go on how can i go on there's no more i knew them so well they lived in the little thatched cottage over there where the millards live now did they fall ill at the same time oh no he was as well as could be still at work till she died then he went on in a strange way he would come in of an evening and call his wife mother mother where are you you'd hear him call mother be you upstairs mother ain't you coming down for a bit of bread and cheese before you go to bed and then in a little while he just died and you said there was nothing to tell no there wasn't anything he was just one of us a laborer on the farm i then gave her something and to my surprise after taking it she made me an elaborate curtsy it rather upset me for i had thought we had got on very well together and were quite free and easy in our talk very much on a level but she was not done with me yet she followed to the gate and holding out her open hand with that small gift in it she said in a pathetic voice did you think sir i was expecting this i had no such thought and didn't want it and i had no thought of saying or writing a word about her but since that day she has haunted me she and her old john toomer and it has just now occurred to me that by putting her in my book i may be able to get her out of my mind End of chapter four chapter five of a shepherd's life by william henry hudson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5. Early Memories A Child Shepherd, Isaac and His Children, Shepherding in Boyhood, Two Notable Sheep Dogs, Jack the Adder Killer, Sitting on an Adder, Ruff and the Drovers, The Salisbury Coach, A Sheep Dog Suckling a Lamb. Caleb's shepherding began in childhood at all events he had his first experience of it at that time many an old shepherd whose father was shepherd before him has told me that he began to go with the flock very early in life when he was no more than ten to twelve years of age caleb remembered being put in charge of his father's flock at the tender age of six it was a new and wonderful experience and made so vivid and lasting an impression on his mind that now when he is past eighty he speaks of it very feelingly 
as of something which happened yesterday it was harvesting time and isaac who was a good reaper was wanted in the field but he could find no one not even a boy to take charge of his flock in the meantime and so to be able to reap and keep an eye on the flock at the same time he brought his sheep down to the part of the down adjoining the field it was on his liberty or that part of the down where he was entitled to have his flock he then took his very small boy caleb and placing him with the sheep told him they were now in his charge that he was not to lose sight of them and at the same time not to run about among the furze bushes for fear of treading on an adder by and by the sheep began straying off among the furze bushes and no sooner would they disappear from sight than he imagined they were lost for ever or would be unless he quickly found them and to find them he had to run about among the bushes with the terror of adders in his mind and the two troubles together kept him crying with misery all the time then at intervals isaac would leave his reaping and come to see how he was getting on and the tears would vanish from his eyes and he would feel very brave again and to his father's question he would reply that he was getting on very well finally his father came and took him to the field to his great relief but he did not carry him in his arms he strode along at his usual pace and let the little fellow run after him stumbling and falling and picking himself up again and running on and by and by one of the women in the field cried out be you not ashamed isaac to go that pace and not bide for the little child i do believe he's no more'n seven year poor mite no more'n six answered isaac proudly with a laugh but though not soft or tender with his children he was very fond of them and when he came home early in the evening he would get them round him and talk to them and sing old songs and ballads he had learnt in his young days down in the village the days of queen elizabeth the blacksmith the gown of green the dawning of the day and many others which caleb in the end got by heart and used to sing too when he was grown up caleb was about nine when he began to help regularly with the flock that was in the summer time when the flock was put every day on the down and when isaac's services were required for the haymaking and later for harvesting and other work his best memories of this period relate to his mother and to two sheep-dogs jack at first and afterwards rough both animals of original character jack was a great favourite of his master who considered him a terrible good dog he was rather short-haired like the old welsh sheep-dog once common in wiltshire but entirely black instead of the usual colour blue with a sprinkling of black spots this dog had an intense hatred of adders and never failed to kill every one he discovered at the same time he knew that they were dangerous enemies to tackle and on catching sight of one his hair would instantly bristle up and he would stand as if paralyzed for some moments glaring at it and gnashing his teeth then springing like a cat upon it he would seize it in his mouth only to hurl it from him to a distance this action he would repeat until the adder was dead and isaac would then put it under a furze bush to take it home and hang it on a certain gate the farmer too like the dog hated adders and paid his shepherd sixpence for every one his dog killed one day caleb with one of his brothers was out with the flock amusing themselves in their usual way on the turf with nine morris men and the shepherd's puzzle when all at once their mother appeared unexpectedly on the scene it was her custom when the boys were sent out with the flock to make expeditions to the down just to see what they were up to and hiding her approach by keeping to a hedge side or by means of the furze bushes she would sometimes come upon them with disconcerting suddenness on this occasion just where the boys had been playing there was a low stout furze bush so dense and flat-topped that one could use it as a seat and his mother taking off and folding her shawl placed it on the bush and sat down on it to rest herself after her long walk i can see her now said caleb sitting on that furze bush in her smock and leggings with a big hat like a man's on her head for that's how she dressed but in a few moments she jumped up 
crying out that she felt a snake under her, and snatched off the shawl, and there, sure enough, out of the middle of the flat bush-top, appeared the head of an adder, flicking out its tongue. The dog, too, saw it, dashed at the bush, forcing his muzzle and head into the middle of it, seized the serpent by its body, and plucked it out and threw it from him, only to follow it up and kill it in the usual way. Ruff was a large, shaggy, grey-blue bobtail bitch with a white collar. She was a clever, good, all-round dog, but had originally been trained for the road, and one of the shepherd's stories about her relates of her intelligence in her own special line, the driving of sheep. One day he and his smaller brother were in charge of the flock on the down, and were on the side where it dips down to the turnpike road about a mile and a half from the village, where a large flock, driven by two men and two dogs, came by. They were going to the Britford Sheep Fair, and were behind time. Isaac had started at daylight that morning with sheep for the same fair, and that was the reason of the boys being with the flock. As the flock on the down was feeding quietly, the boys determined to go to the road to watch the sheep and men pass, and arriving at the roadside they saw that the dogs were too tired to work, and the men were getting on with great difficulty. One of them, looking intently at Ruff, asked if she would work. "'Oh, yes, she'll work,' said the boy proudly, and calling Ruff he pointed to the flock moving very slowly along the road and over the turf on either side of it. Ruff knew what was wanted. She had been looking on and had taken the situation in with her professional eye. Away she dashed, and running up and down, first on one side, then on the other, quickly put the whole flock— numbering eight hundred into the road and gave them a good start why she be a road dog exclaimed the drover delightedly she's better for me on the road than for you on the down i'll buy her of you no i mustn't sell her said caleb look here boy said the other i'll give you a sovereign and this young dog and he'll be a good one with a little more training no i mustn't said caleb distressed at the other's persistence "'Well, will you come a little way on the road with us?' asked the drover. This the boys agreed to, and went on for about a quarter of a mile, when all at once the Salisbury coach appeared on the road, coming to meet them. This new trouble was pointed out to Ruff, and at once, when her little master had given the order, she dashed, barking, into the midst of the mass of sheep, and drove them furiously to the side, from end to end of the extended flock, making a clear passage for the coach, which— was not delayed a minute, and no sooner was the coach gone than the sheep were put back into the road. Then the drover pulled out his sovereign once more and tried to make the boy take it. "'I mustn't,' he repeated, almost in tears. "'What would father say?' "'Say? He won't say nothing. He'll think you've done well.' But Caleb thought that perhaps his father would say something, and when he remembered certain whippings he had experienced in the past, he had an uncomfortable sensation about his back. "'No, I mustn't,' was all he could say, and then the drovers, with a laugh, went on with their sheep. When Isaac came home and the adventure was told to him, he laughed, and said that he meant to sell Ruff some day. He used to say this occasionally to tease his wife because of the dog's intense devotion to her and she, being without a sense of humour, and half thinking that he meant it, would get up out of her seat and solemnly declare that if he ever sold Ruff, she would never again go out to the down and see what the boys were up to. One day she visited the boys when they had the flock near the turnpike, and, seating herself on the turf a few yards from the road, got out her work and began sewing. Presently they spied a big, singular-looking man coming at a swinging pace along the road. He was in shirt-sleeves, barefooted, and wore a straw hat without a rim. Ruff eyed the strange being's approach with suspicion, and going to her mistress placed herself at her side. The man came up and sat down at a distance of three or four yards from the group, and Ruff, looking dangerous, started up and put her forepaws on her mistress's lap, and began uttering a low growl. "'Will that dog bite, missus?' said the man. "'Maybe he will,' said she. "'I won't answer for he if you come any nearer.' 
the two boys had been occupied cutting a faggot from a furze bush with a bill-hook and now held a whispered consultation as to what they would do if the man tried to hurt mother and agreed that as soon as ruff had got her teeth in his leg they would attack him about the head with the bill-hook they were not required to go into action the stranger could not long endure ruff's savage aspect and very soon he got up and resumed his travels the shepherd remembered another curious incident in ruff's career at one time when she had a litter of pups at home she was yet compelled to be a great part of the day with the flock of ewes as they could not do without her the boys just then were bringing up a motherless lamb by hand and they would put it with the sheep and to feed it during the day were obliged to catch a ewe with milk the lamb trotted at caleb's heels like a dog and one day when it was hungry and crying to be fed when ruff happened to be sitting on her haunches close by it occurred to him that ruff's milk might serve as well as a sheep's the lamb was put to her and took very kindly to its canine foster mother wriggling its tail and pushing vigorously with its nose ruff submitted patiently to the trial and the result was that the lamb adopted the sheep-dog as its mother and sucked her milk several times every day to the great admiration of all who witnessed it End of chapter 5chapter six of a shepherd's life by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six shepherd isaac balcombe a noble shepherd a fighting village blacksmith old joe the collier a story of his strength donkeys poisoned by you the shepherd without his sheep how the shepherd killed a deer to me the most interesting of caleb's old memories were those relating to his father partly on account of the man's fine character and partly because they went so far back beginning in the early years of the last century altogether he must have been a very fine specimen of a man both physically and morally in caleb's mind he was undoubtedly the first among men morally but there were two other men supposed to be his equals in bodily strength one a native of the village the other a periodical visitor the first was jarvis the blacksmith a man of an immense chest and big arms one of isaac's greatest friends and very good-tempered except when in his cups for he did occasionally get drunk and then he quarrelled with any one and every one one afternoon he had made himself quite tipsy at the inn and when going home swaying about and walking all over the road he all at once caught sight of the big shepherd coming soberly on behind no sooner had he seen him than it occurred to his wild and muddled mind that he had a quarrel with this very man shepherd isaac a quarrel of so pressing a nature that there was nothing to do but to fight it out there and then he planted himself before the shepherd and challenged him to fight isaac smiled and said nothing i'll fight thee about this he repeated and began tugging at his coat and after getting it off again made up to isaac who still smiled and said no word then he pulled his waistcoat off and finally his shirt and with nothing but his boots and breeches on once more squared up to isaac and threw himself into his best fighting attitude i don't want to fight thee said isaac at length but i be thinkin twould be best to take thee home and suddenly dashing in he seized jarvis around the waist with one arm grasped him round the legs with the other and flung the big man across his shoulder and carried him off struggling and shouting to his cottage there at the door pale and distressed stood the poor wife waiting for her lord when isaac arrived and going straight in dropped the smith down on his own floor with the remark here be your man walked off to his cottage and his tea the other powerful man was old joe the collier who flourished and was known in every village in the salisbury plain district during the first thirty-five years of the last century i first heard of this once famous man from caleb whose boyish imagination had been affected by his gigantic figure mighty voice and his wandering life over all that wide world of salisbury plain 
afterwards when i became acquainted with a good many old men aged from seventy-five to ninety and upwards i found that old joe's memory is still green in a good many villages of the district from the upper waters of the avon to the borders of dorset but it is only these ancients who knew him that keep it green by and by when they are gone old joe and his netties will be remembered no more in those days down to about eighteen forty it was customary to burn peat in the cottages the first cost of which was about four and sixpence the wagon load as much as i should require to keep me warm for a month in winter but the cost of its conveyance to the villages of the plain was about five to six shillings per load as it came from a considerable distance mostly from the new forest how the labourers at that time when they were paid seven or eight shillings a week could afford to buy fuel at such prices to bake their rye bread and keep the frost out of their bones is a marvel to us isaac was a good deal better off than most of the villagers in this respect as his master for he never had but one allowed him the use of a wagon and the driver's services for the conveyance of one load of peat each year the wagon load of peat and another of faggots lasted him the year with the furs obtained from his liberty on the down coal at that time was only used by the blacksmiths in the villages and was conveyed in sacks on ponies or donkeys and of those who were engaged in this business the best known was old joe he appeared periodically in the village with his eight donkeys or neddies as he called them with jingling bells on their headstalls and their burdens of two sacks of small coal on each in stature he was a giant of about six feet three very broad-chested and invariably wore a broad-rimmed hat a slate-coloured smock-frock and blue worsted stockings to his knees he walked behind the donkeys a very long staff in his hand shouting at them from time to time and occasionally swinging his long staff and bringing it down on the back of a donkey who was not keeping up the pace in this way he wandered from village to village from end to end of the plain getting rid of his small coal and loading his animals with scrap iron which the blacksmith would keep for him and as he continued his rounds for nearly forty years he was a familiar figure to every inhabitant throughout the district there are some stories still told of his great strength one of which is worth giving he was a man of iron constitution and gave himself a hard life and he was hard on his neddies but he had to feed them well and this he often contrived to do at some one else's expense one night at a village on the wylie it was discovered that he had put his eight donkeys in a meadow in which the grass was just ripe for mowing the enraged farmer took them to the village pound and locked them up but in the morning the donkeys and joe with them had vanished and the whole village wondered how he had done it the stone wall of the pound was four feet and a half high and the iron gate was locked yet he had lifted the donkeys up and put them over and had loaded them and gone before any one was up once joe met with a very great misfortune he arrived late at a village and finding there was good feed in the churchyard and that everybody was in bed he put his donkeys in and stretched himself out among the gravestones to sleep he had no nerves and no imagination and was tired and slept very soundly until it was light and time to put his netties out before any person came by and discovered that he had been making free with the rector's grass glancing round he could see no donkeys and only when he stood up he found that they had not made their escape but were there all about him lying among the gravestones stone dead every one he had forgotten that a churchyard was a dangerous place to put hungry animals in they had browsed on the luxuriant yew tree that grew there and this was the result in time he recovered from his loss and replaced his dead neddies with others and continued for many years longer on his rounds to return to isaac balcombe he was born we have seen in eighteen hundred and began following a flock as a boy and continued as shepherd on the same farm for a period of fifty-five years the care of sheep was the one all-absorbing occupation of his life 
and how much it was to him appears in this anecdote of his state of mind when he was deprived of it for a time the flock was sold and isaac was left without sheep and with little to do except to wait from michaelmas to candlemas when there would be sheep again at the farm it was a long time to isaac and he found his enforced holiday so tedious that he made himself a nuisance to his wife in the house forty times a day he would throw off his hat and sit down resolved to be happy at his own fireside but after a few minutes the desire to be up and doing would return and up he would get and out he would go again one dark cloudy evening a man from the farm put his head in at the door isaac he said there be sheep for ye up the farm two hundred ewes and a hundred more to come in three days master he sent i to say you be wanted and away the man went isaac jumped up and hurried forth without taking his crook from the corner and actually without putting on his hat his wife called out after him and getting no response sent the boy with his hat to overtake him but the little fellow soon returned with the hat he could not overtake his father he was away three or four hours at the farm then returned his hair very wet his face beaming and sat down with a great sigh of pleasure two hundred ewes he said and a hundred more to come what do you think of that well isaac said she i hope thee'll be happy now and let i alone after all that had been told to me about the elder balcombe's life and character it came somewhat as a shock to learn that at one period during his early manhood he had indulged in one form of poaching a sport which had a marvellous fascination for the people of england in former times but was pretty well extinguished during the first quarter of the last century deer he had taken and the whole tale of the deer stealing which was a common offence in that part of wiltshire down to about eighteen thirty four sounds strange at the present day large herds of deer were kept at that time at an estate a few miles from winterbourne bishop and it often happened that many of the animals broke bounds and roamed singly and in small bands over the hills when deer were observed in the open certain of the villagers would settle on some plan of action watchers would be sent out not only to keep an eye on the deer but on the keepers too much depended on the state of the weather and the moon as some light was necessary then when the conditions were favourable and the keepers had been watched to their cottages the gang would go out for a night's hunting but it was a dangerous sport as the keepers also knew that deer were out of bounds and they would form some counter plan and one peculiarly nasty plan they had was to go out about three or four o'clock in the morning and secrete themselves somewhere close to the village to intercept the poachers on their return Balcombe, who never in his life associated with the village idlers and frequenters of the alehouse had no connection with these men his expeditions were made alone on some dark unpromising night when the regular poachers were in bed and asleep he would steal away after bedtime or would go out ostensibly to look after the sheep and if fortunate would return in the small hours with a deer on his back then helped by his mother with whom he lived for this was when he was a young unmarried man about eighteen twenty he would quickly skin and cut up the carcass stow the meat away in some secret place and bury the head hide and offal deep in the earth and when morning came it would find isaac out following his flock as usual with no trace of guilt or fatigue in his rosy cheeks and clear honest eyes this was a very astonishing story to hear from caleb but to suspect him of inventing or of exaggerating was impossible to any one who knew him and we have seen that isaac balcombe was an exceptional man physically a kind of alexander selkirk of the wiltshire downs and he moreover had a dog to help him one as superior in speed and strength to the ordinary sheep-dog as he himself was to the rack of his fellow-men it was only after much questioning on my part that caleb brought himself to tell me of these ancient adventures and finally to give a detailed account of how his father came to take his first deer 
it was in the depth of winter bitterly cold with a strong north wind blowing on the snow-covered downs when one evening isaac caught sight of two deer out on his sheep walk in that part of wiltshire there is a famous monument of antiquity a vast mound-like wall with a deep depression or fosse running at its side now it happened that on the higher part of the down where the wall or mound was most exposed to the blast the snow had been blown clear off the top and the deer were feeding here on the short turf keeping to the ridge so that outlined against the sky they had become visible to isaac at a great distance he saw and pondered these deer just now while out of bounds were no man's property and it would be no sin to kill and eat one if he could catch it and it was a season of bitter want for many many days he had eaten his barley bread and on some days barley flour dumplings and had been content with this poor fare but now the sight of these animals made him crave for meat with an intolerable craving and he determined to do something to satisfy it he went home and had his poor supper and when it was dark set forth again with his dog he found the deer still feeding on the mound stealing softly along among the furze bushes he got the black line of the mound against the starry sky and by and by as he moved along the black figures of the deer with their heads down came into view he then doubled back and proceeding some distance got down into the fosse and stole forward to them again under the wall his idea was that on taking alarm they would immediately make for the forest which was their home and would probably pass near him they did not hear him until he was within sixty yards and then bounded down from the wall over the dyke and away but in almost opposite directions one alone making for the forest and on this one the dog was set out he shot like an arrow from the bow and after him ran isaac as he had never run afore in his life for a short space deer and dog in hot pursuit were visible on the snow then the darkness swallowed them up as they rushed down the slope but in less than half a minute a sound came back to isaac flying too down the incline the long wailing cry of a deer in distress the dog had seized his quarry by one of the front legs a little above the hoof and held it fast and they were struggling on the snow when isaac came up and flung himself upon his victim then thrust his knife through its windpipe to stop its noise having killed it he threw it on his back and went home not by the turnpike nor by any road or path but over fields and through copses until he got to the back of his mother's cottage there was no door on that side but there was a window and when he had rapped at it and his mother opened it without speaking a word he thrust the dead deer through then made his way round to the front that was how he killed his first deer how the others were taken i do not know i wish i did since this one exploit of a wiltshire shepherd has more interest for me than i find in fifty narratives of elephants slaughtered wholesale with explosive bullets written for the delight and astonishment of the reading public by our most glorious nimrods End of chapter six Chapter Seven of A Shepherd's Life by William Henry Hudson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven: The Deer Stealers. Deer stealing on Salisbury Plain. The Headkeeper Harbutt. Strange story of a baby. Found as a surname. John Barter, the village carpenter. How the keeper was fooled. A poaching attack planned. The fight. Headkeeper and carpenter the carpenter hides his son the arrest barter's sons forsake the village there were other memories of deer taking handed down to caleb by his parents and the one best worth preserving relates to the head keeper of the preserves or chase and to a great fight in which he was engaged with two brothers of the girl who was afterwards to be isaac's wife 
here it may be necessary to explain that formerly the owner of cranbourn chase at that time lord rivers claimed the deer and the right to preserve and hunt deer over a considerable extent of country outside of his own lands on the wiltshire side these rights extended from cranbourn chase over the south wiltshire downs to salisbury and the whole territory about thirty miles broad was divided into beats or walks six or eight in number each beat provided with a keeper's lodge this state of things continued to the year eighteen thirty four when the chase was disfranchised by act of parliament the incident i am going to relate occurred about eighteen fifteen or perhaps two or three years later the border of one of the deer walks was at a spot known as three downs place two miles and a half from winterbourne bishop here in a hollow of the downs there was an extensive wood and just within the wood a large stone house said to be centuries old but long pulled down called ralston house in which the head keeper lived with two under keepers he had a wife but no children and was a middle-aged thick-set very dark man powerful and vigilant a terrible hater and persecutor of poachers feared and hated by them in turn and his name was harbutt it happened that one morning when he had unbarred the front door to go out he found a great difficulty in opening it caused by a heavy object having been fastened to the door handle it proved to be a basket or box in which a well-nourished nice-looking boy baby was sleeping well wrapped up and covered with a cloth on the cloth a scrap of paper was pinned with the following lines written on it take me in and treat me well for in this house my father dwell harbutt read the lines and didn't even smile at the grammar on the contrary he appeared very much upset and was still standing holding the paper staring stupidly at it when his wife came on the scene what be this she exclaimed and looked first at the paper then at him then at the rosy child fast asleep in its cradle and instantly with a great cry she fell on it and snatched it up in her arms and holding it clasped to her bosom began lavishing caresses and endearing expressions on it tears of rapture in her eyes not one word of inquiry or bitter jealous reproach all that part of her was swallowed up and annihilated in the joy of a woman who had been denied a child of her own to love and nourish and worship and now one had come to her and it mattered little how two or three days later the infant was baptized at the village church with the quaint name of moses found caleb was a little surprised at my thinking it a laughable name it was to his mind a singularly appropriate one he assured me it was not the only case he knew of in which the surname found had been bestowed on a child of unknown parentage and he told me the story of one of the founds who had gone to salisbury as a boy and worked and saved and eventually become quite a prosperous and important person there was really nothing funny in it the story of moses found had been told him by his old mother she he remarked significantly had good cause to remember it she was herself a native of the village born two or three years later than the mysterious moses her father john barter by name was a carpenter and lived in an old thatched house which still exists and is very familiar to me he had five sons then after an interval of some years a daughter was born who in due time was to be isaac's wife when she was a little girl her brothers were all grown up or on the verge of manhood and moses too was a young man the spit of his father people said meaning the head-keeper and he was now one of harbutt's under-keepers about this time some of the more ardent spirits in the village not satisfied with an occasional hunt when a deer broke out and roamed over the downs took to poaching them in the woods one night a hunt having been arranged one of the most daring of the men secreted himself close to the keeper's house and having watched the keepers go in and the lights put out he actually succeeded in fastening up the doors from the outside with screws and pieces of wood without creating an alarm 
he then met his confederates at an agreed spot and the hunting began during which one deer was chased to the house and actually pulled down and killed on the lawn meanwhile the inmates were in a state of great excitement the underkeepers feared that a force it would be dangerous to oppose had taken possession of the woods while harbutt raved and roared like a maddened wild beast in a cage and put forth all his strength to pull the doors open finally he smashed a window and leaped out gun in hand and calling the others to follow rushed into the wood but he was too late the hunt was over and the poachers had made good their escape taking the carcasses of two or three deer they had succeeded in killing the keeper was not to be fooled in the same way a second time and before very long he had his revenge a fresh raid was planned and on this occasion two of the five brothers were in it and there were four more the blacksmith of winterbourne bishop their best man two famous shearers father and son from a neighbouring village and a young farm labourer they knew very well that with the head-keeper in his present frame of mind it was a risky affair and they made a solemn compact that if caught they would stand by one another to the end and caught they were and on this occasion the keepers were four at the very beginning the blacksmith their ablest man and virtual leader was knocked down senseless with a blow on his head with the butt end of a gun immediately on seeing this the two famous shearers took to their heels and the young labourer followed their example the brothers were left but refused to be taken although harbutt roared at them in his bull's voice that he would shoot them unless they surrendered they made light of his threats and fought against the four and eventually were separated by and by the younger of the two was driven into a brambly thicket where his opponents imagined that it would be impossible for him to escape but he was a youth of indomitable spirit strong and agile as a wild cat and returning blow for blow he succeeded in tearing himself from them then after a running fight through the darkest part of the wood for a distance of two or three hundred yards they at length lost him or gave him up and went back to assist harbutt and moses against the other man left to himself he got out of the wood and made his way back to the village it was long past midnight when he turned up at his father's cottage a pitiable object covered with mud and blood hatless his clothes torn to shreds his face and whole body covered with bruises and bleeding wounds the old man was in a great state of distress about his other son and early in the morning went to examine the ground where the fight had been it was only too easily found the sod was trampled down and branches broken as though a score of men had been engaged then he found his eldest son's cap and a little farther away a sleeve of his coat shreds and rags were numerous on the bramble bushes and by and by he came on a pool of blood they've killed a he cried in despair they've killed my poor boy and straight to ralston house he went to inquire and was met by harbutt himself who came out limping one boot on the other foot bound up with rags one arm in a sling and a cloth tied round his head he was told that his son was alive and safe indoors and that he would be taken to salisbury later in the day his clothes be all torn to pieces added the keeper you can just go home at once and get him others before the constable comes to take him you've tore them to pieces yourself and you can get him others retorted the old man in a rage very well said the keeper but bide a moment i've something more to say to you when your son comes out of jail in a year or so you can tell him from me that if he'll just step up this way i'll give him five shillings and as much beer as he likes to drink i never seed a better fighter it was a great compliment to his son but the old man was troubled in his mind what dost mean keeper by a year or so he asked when i said that returned the other with a grin i was just thinking that twould be he deserves to get and you've got your deserts by god cried the angry father if that boy of mine hadn't a been alone to fight ye harbutt regarded him with a smile of gratified malice you can go home now he said if you'd see your son you'll find un in salisbury jail maybe you'll be wantin new locks on your doors you can get they in salisbury too 
you've no blacksmith in your village now no your boy weren't alone and you know that damned well i know not about it he returned and started to walk home with a heavy heart until now he had been clinging to the hope that the other son had not been identified in the dark wood and now what would he do to save one of the two from hateful imprisonment the boy was not in a fit condition to make his escape he could hardly get across the room and could not sit or lie down without groaning he could only try to hide him in the cottage and pray that they would not discover him the cottage was in the middle of the village and had but little ground to it but there was a small boarded-up cavity or cell at one end of an attic and it might be possible to save him by putting him in there here then in a bed placed for him on the floor his bruised son was obliged to lie in the close dark hole for some days one day about a week later when he was recovering from his hurts he crawled out of his box and climbed down the narrow stairs to the ground floor to see the light and breathe a better air for a short time and while down he was tempted to take a peep at the street through the small latticed window but he quickly withdrew his head and by and by said to his father i'm feared moses has seen me just now when i was at the window he came by and looked up and seed me with my head all tied up and i'm feared he knew twas i after that they could only wait in fear and trembling and on the next day quite early there came a loud rap at the door and on its being opened by the old man the constable and two keepers appeared standing before him i've come to take your son said the constable the old man stepped back without a word and took down his gun from its place on the wall and spoke if you've got a search warrant you may come in if you haven't got un i'll blow the brains out of the first man that puts a foot inside my door they hesitated a few moments then silently withdrew after consulting together the constable went off to the nearest magistrate leaving the two keepers to keep watch on the house moses found was one of them later in the day the constable returned armed with a warrant and was thereupon admitted with the result that the poor youth was soon discovered in his hiding-place and carried off and that was the last he saw of his home his young sister crying bitterly and his old father white and trembling with grief and impotent rage a month or two later the two brothers were tried and sentenced each to six months imprisonment they never came home on their release they went to woolwich where men were wanted and the pay was good and by and by the accounts they sent home induced first one then the other brother to go and join them and the poor old father who had been very proud of his five sons was left alone with his young daughter isaac's destined wife End of chapter 7chapter eight of a shepherd's life by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight shepherds and poaching general remarks on poaching farmer shepherd and dog a sheep dog that would not hunt taking a partridge from a hawk old garge and young garge partridge poaching the shepherd robbed of his rabbits wisdom of shepherd gather good hair trapping on the down hair taking with a crook when caleb was at length free from his father's tutelage and as an under shepherd practically independent he did not follow isaac's strict example with regard to wild animals good for the pot which came by chance in his way he even allowed himself to go a little out of his way on occasion to get them we know that about this matter the law of the land does not square with the moral law as it is written in the heart of the peasant a wounded partridge or other bird which he finds in his walks abroad or which comes by chance to him is his by a natural right and he will take and eat or dispose of it without scruple with rabbits he is very free he doesn't wait to find a distressed one with a stoat on its track stoats are not sufficiently abundant and a hare too may be picked up at any moment only in this case he must be very sure that no one is looking 
knowing the law and being perhaps a respectable religious person he is anxious to abstain from all appearance of evil this taking a hare or rabbit or wounded partridge is in his mind a very different thing from systematic poaching but he is aware that to the classes above him it is not so the law has made them one it is a hard arbitrary unnatural law made by and for them his betters and outwardly he must conform to it thus you will find the best of men among the shepherds and labourers freely helping themselves to any wild creature that falls in their way yet sharing the game preserver's hatred of the real poacher the village poacher as a rule is an idle dissolute fellow and the sober industrious righteous shepherd or ploughman or carter does not like to be put on a level with such a person but there is no escape from the hard and fast rule in such things and however open and truthful he may be in everything else in this one matter he is obliged to practice a certain amount of deception here is a case to serve as an illustration i have only just heard of it after putting together the material i had collected for this chapter in conversation with an old shepherd friend of mine he is a fine old man who has followed a flock these fifty years and will i have no doubt carry his crook for yet another ten not only is he a good shepherd in the sense in which caleb uses that phrase with a more intimate knowledge of sheep and all the ailments they are subject to than i have found in any other but he is also a truly religious man one that walks with god he told me this story of a sheep-dog he owned when head shepherd on a large farm on the dorsetshire border with a master whose chief delight in life was in coursing hares they abounded on his land and he naturally wanted the men employed on the farm to regard them as sacred animals one day he came out to the shepherd to complain that some one had seen his dog hunting a hare the shepherd indignantly asked who had said such a thing never mind about that said the farmer is it true it is a lie said the shepherd my dog never hunts a hare or anything else tis my belief the one that said that has got a dog himself that hunts the hares and he wants to put the blame on some one else maybe so said the farmer unconvinced just then a hare made its appearance coming across the field directly towards them and either because they never moved or it did not smell them it came on and on stopping at intervals to sit for a minute or so on its haunches then on again until it was within forty yards of where they were standing the farmer watched it approach and at the same time kept an eye on the dog sitting at their feet and watching the hare too very steadily now shepherd said the farmer don't you say one word to the dog and i'll see for myself not a word did he say and the hare came and sat for some seconds near them then limped away out of sight and the dog made not the slightest movement that's all right said the farmer well pleased i know now twas a lie i heard about your dog i've seen for myself and i'll keep a sharp eye on the man that told me my comment on this story was that the farmer had displayed an almost incredible ignorance of a sheep-dog and a shepherd how would it have been if you had said catch him bob or whatever his name was i asked he looked at me with a twinkle in his eye and replied i do believe he'd a gotten but he'd never move till i told un it comes to this the shepherd refuses to believe that by taking a hare he is robbing any man of his property and if he is obliged to tell a lie to save himself from the consequences he does not consider that it is a lie when he understood that i was on his side in this question he told me about a good sheep-dog he once possessed which he had to get rid of because he would not take a hare a dog when broken is made to distinguish between the things he must and must not do he is feelingly persuaded by kind words and caresses in one case and hard words and hard blows in the other he learns that if he hunts hares and rabbits it will be very bad for him and in due time after some suffering he is able to overcome this strongest instinct of a dog he acquires an artificial conscience then when his education is finished he must be made to understand that it is not quite finished after all 
that he must partially unlearn one of the saddest of the lessons instilled in him he must hunt a hare or rabbit when told by his master to do so it is a compact between man and dog thus they have got a law which the dog has sworn to obey but the man who made it is above the law and can when he thinks proper command his servant to break it the dog as a rule takes it all in very readily and often allows himself more liberty than his master gives him the most highly accomplished animal is one that like my shepherd's dog in the former instance will not stir till he is told in the other case the poor brute could not rise to the position it was too complex for him and when ordered to catch a rabbit he could only put his tail between his legs and look in a puzzled way at his master why do you tell me to do a thing for which i shall be thrashed it was only after caleb had known me some time when we were fast friends that he talked with perfect freedom of these things and told me of his own small illicit takings without excuse or explanation one day he saw a sparrow-hawk dash down upon a running partridge and struggle with it on the ground it was in a grass field divided from the one he was walking in by a large unkept hedge without a gap in it to let him through presently the hawk rose up with the partridge still violently struggling in its talons and flew over the hedge to caleb's side but was no sooner over than it came down again and the struggle went on once more on the ground on caleb running to the spot the hawk flew off leaving his prey behind he had grasped it in its sides driving his sharp claws well in and the partridge though unable to fly was still alive the shepherd killed it and put it in his pocket and enjoyed it very much when he came to eat it from this case a most innocent form of poaching he went on to relate how he had once been able to deprive a cunning poacher and bad man a human sparrow-hawk of his quarry there were two persons in the village father and son he very heartily detested known respectively as old garge and young garge inveterate poachers both they were worse than the real reprobate who haunted the public-house and did no work and was not ashamed of his evil ways for these two were hypocrites and were outwardly sober righteous men who kept themselves a little apart from their neighbours and were very severe in their condemnation of other people's faults one sunday morning caleb was on his way to his ewes folded at a distance from the village walking by a hedgerow at the foot of the down when he heard a shot fired some way ahead and after a minute or two a second shot this greatly excited his curiosity and caused him to keep a sharp lookout in the direction the sounds had come from and by and by he caught sight of a man walking towards him it was old garge in his long smock-frock proceeding in a leisurely way towards the village but catching sight of the shepherd he turned aside through a gap in the hedge and went off in another direction to avoid meeting him no doubt thought caleb he has got his gun in two pieces hidden under his smock he went on until he came to a small field of oats which had grown badly and had only been half reaped and here he discovered that old garge had been lying in hiding to shoot at the partridges that came to feed he had been screened from the sight of the birds by a couple of hurdles and some straw and there were feathers of the birds he had shot scattered about he had finished his sunday morning sport and was going back a little too late on this occasion as it turned out caleb went on to his flock but before getting to it his dog discovered a dead partridge in the hedge it had flown that far and then dropped and there was fresh blood on its feathers he put it in his pocket and carried it about most of the day while with his sheep on the down late in the afternoon he spied two magpies pecking at something out in the middle of a field and went to see what they had found it was a second partridge which old garge had shot in the morning and had lost the bird having flown to some distance before dropping the magpies had probably found it already dead as it was cold they had begun tearing the skin at the neck and had opened it down to the breastbone 
Caleb took this bird, too, and by and by, sitting down to examine it, he thought he would try to mend the torn skin with the needle and thread he always carried inside his cap. He succeeded in stitching it neatly up, and, putting back the feathers in their place, the rent was quite concealed. That evening he took the two birds to a man in the village who made a livelihood by collecting bones, rags, and things of that kind. The man took the birds in his hand, held them up, felt their weight, examined them carefully, and pronounced them to be two good fat birds, and agreed to pay two shillings for them. Such a man may be found in most villages. He calls himself a general dealer, and keeps a trap and pony, in some cases he keeps the alehouse, and is a useful member of the small rural community, a sort of human carrion crow. The two shillings were very welcome, but more than the money was the pleasing thought that he had got the bird shot by the hypocritical old poacher for his own profit. Caleb had good cause to hate him. He, a Caleb, was one of the shepherds who had his master's permission to take rabbits on the land, and having found his snares broken on many occasions, he came to the conclusion that they were visited in the night-time by some very cunning person who kept a watch on his movements. One evening he set five snares in a turnip-field, and went just before daylight the next morning, in a dense fog, to visit them. Every one was broken. He had just started on his way back, feeling angry and much puzzled at such a thing, when the fog all at once passed away, and revealed the figures of two men walking hurriedly off over the down. They were at a considerable distance, but the light was now strong enough to enable him to identify old Garge and young Garge. In a few moments they vanished over the brow. Caleb was mad at being deprived of his rabbits in this mean way, but pleased at the same time in having discovered who the culprits were, but what to do about it he did not know. On the following day he was with his flock on the down, and found himself near another shepherd, also with his sheep, one he knew very well, a quiet but knowing old man named Joseph Gathergood. He was known to be a skilful rabbit-catcher, and Caleb thought he would go over to him and tell him how he was being tricked by the two garges, and ask him what to do in the matter. The old man was very friendly, and at once told him what to do. "'Don't you set no more snares by the hedges and in the termites,' he said. "'Set them out in the open, down where no one would go after rabbits, and they'll not find the snares.' And this was how it had to be done. First he was to scrape the ground with the heel of his boot until the fresh earth could be seen through the broken turf. Then he was to sprinkle a little rabbit scent on the scraped spot and plant his snare. The scent and smell of the fresh earth combined would draw the rabbits to the spot. They would go there to scratch and would inevitably get caught if the snare was properly placed. Caleb tried this plan with one snare, and on the following morning found that he had a rabbit. He set it again that evening, then again, till he had caught five rabbits on five consecutive nights, all with the same snare. That convinced him that he had been taught a valuable lesson, and that old Gathergood was a very wise man about rabbits, and he was very happy to think that he had got the better of his two sneaking enemies. But Shepherd Gathergood was just as wise about hares, and, as in the other case, he took them out on the down and in the most open places. His success was due to his knowledge of the hare's taste for blackthorn twigs. He would take a good strong blackthorn stem or shoot with twigs on it, and stick it firmly down in the middle of a large grass field, or on the open down, and place the steel trap tied to the stick at a distance of a foot or so from it, the trap concealed under grass or moss and dead leaves. The smell of the blackthorn would draw the hare to the spot, and he would move round and round, nibbling the twigs until caught. Caleb never tried this plan, but was convinced that Gathergood was right about it. He told me of another shepherd who was clever at taking hares in another way, and who was often chaffed by his acquaintances on account of the extraordinary length of his shepherd's crook. It was like a lance or pole, being twice the usual length. But he had a use for it. 
this shepherd used to make hares forms on the downs in all suitable places forming them so cunningly that no one seeing them by chance would have believed they were the work of human hands the hare certainly made use of them when out with his flock he would visit these forms walking quietly past them at a distance of twenty to thirty feet his dog following at his heels on catching sight of a hare crouching in a form he would drop a word and the dog would instantly stand still and remain fixed and motionless while the shepherd went on but in a circle so as to gradually approach the form meanwhile the hare would keep his eyes fixed on the dog paying no attention to the man until by and by the long staff would be swung round and a blow descend on the poor silly head from the opposite side and if the blow was not powerful enough to stun or disable the hare the dog would have it before it got many yards from the cosy nest prepared for its destruction End of chapter eight Chapter Nine of A Shepherd's Life by William Henry Hudson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine: The Shepherd on Foxes. A fox trapping shepherd, gamekeepers and foxes, fox and stoat, a gamekeeper off his guard, pheasants and foxes, Caleb kills a fox, a fox hunting sheep dog, two varieties of foxes rabbits playing with little foxes how to expel foxes a playful spirit in the fox fox hunting a danger to sheep caleb related that his friend shepherd gathergood was a great fox killer and as with hares he took them in a way of his own he said that the fox will always go to a heap of ashes in any open place, and his plan was to place a steel trap concealed among the ashes, and made fast to a stick about three feet high, firmly planted in the middle of the heap, with a piece of strong-smelling cheese tied to the top. The two attractions of an ash heap and the smell of strong cheese were more than any fox could resist when he caught a fox he killed and buried it on the down and said nothing to nobody about it he killed them to protect himself from their depredations foxes like old garge and his son in caleb's case went round at night to rob him of the rabbits he took in his snares caleb never blamed him for this on the contrary he greatly admired him for his courage seeing that if it had been found out he would have been a marked man it was perhaps intelligence or cunning rather than courage he did not believe that he would be found out and he never was he told caleb of these things because he was sure of his man those who were interested in the hunt never suspected him and as to gamekeepers they hardly counted he was helping them no one hates a fox more than they do the farmer gets compensation for damage and the hen wife is paid for her stolen chickens by the hunt the keeper is required to look after the game and at the same time to spare his chief enemy the fox indeed the keeper's state of mind with regard to foxes has always been a source of amusement to me and by long practice i am able to talk to him on that delicate subject in a way to make him uncomfortable and self-contradictory there are various quite innocent questions which the student of wild life may put to a keeper about foxes which have a disturbing effect on his brain how to expel foxes from a covert for example and here is another is it true that the fox listens to the distressed cries of a rabbit pursued by a stoat and that he will deprive the stoat of his captive perhaps yes no i don't think so because one hunts by night and the other by day he will answer but you see that the question troubles him one keeper off his guard promptly answered i've no doubt of it i can always bring a fox to me by imitating the cry of a rabbit hunted by a stoat but he did not say what his object was in attracting the fox I say that the keeper was off his guard in this instance, because the fiction that foxes were preserved on the estate was kept up, though as a fact they were systematically destroyed by the keepers. 
as the pheasant breeding craze appears to increase rather than diminish notwithstanding the disastrous effect it has had in alienating the people from their lords and masters the conflict of interest between fox-hunter and pheasant breeder will tend to become more and more acute and the probable end will be that fox-hunting will have to go a melancholy outlook to those who love the country and old country sports and who do not regard pheasant shooting as now allowed as sport at all it is a delusion of the landlords that the country people think most highly of the great pheasant preserver who has two or three big shoots in a season during which vast numbers of birds are slaughtered every bird costing a guinea as the saying is it brings money into the country he or his apologist tells you and provides employment for the village poor in october and november when there is little doing he does not know the truth of the matter a certain number of the poorer people of the village are employed as beaters for the big shoots at a shilling a day or so and occasionally a labourer going to or from his work finds a pheasant's nest and informs the keeper and receives some slight reward if he keeps his eyes open and shows himself anxious at all times to serve the keeper he will sometimes get a rabbit for his sunday dinner this is not a sufficient return for the freedom to walk on the land and in woods which the villager possessed formerly even in his worst days of his oppression a liberty which has now been taken from him the keeper is there now to prevent him he was there before and from of old but the pheasant was not yet a sacred bird and it didn't matter that a man walked on the turf or picked up a few fallen sticks in a wood the keeper is there to tell him to keep to the road and sometimes to ask him even when he is on the road what is he looking over the hedge for he slinks obediently away he is only a poor labourer with his living to get and he cannot afford to offend the man who stands between him and the lord and the lord's tenant and he is inarticulate but the insolence and injustice rankle in his heart for he is not altogether a helot in soul and the result is that the sedition mongers the socialists the furious denouncers of all landlords who are now quartering the country and whose vans i meet in the remotest villages are listened to and their words wild and whirling words they may be are sinking into the hearts of the agricultural labourers of the new generation to return to foxes and gamekeepers there are other estates where the fiction of fox preserving is kept up no longer where it is notorious that the landlord is devoted exclusively to the gun and to pheasant breeding on one of the big estates i am familiar with in wiltshire the keepers openly say they will not suffer a fox and every villager knows it and will give information of a fox to the keepers and looks to be rewarded with a rabbit all this is undoubtedly known to the lord of the manor his servants are only carrying out his own wishes although he still subscribes to the hunt and occasionally attends the meat the entire hunt may unite in cursing him but they must do so below their breath it would have a disastrous effect to spread it abroad that he is a persecutor of foxes caleb disliked foxes too but not to the extent of killing them he did once actually kill one when a young under-shepherd but it was accident rather than intention one day he found a small gap in a hedge which had been made or was being used by a hare and thinking to take it he set a trap at the spot tying it securely to a root and covering it over with dead leaves on going to the place the next morning he could see nothing until his feet were on the very edge of the ditch when with startling suddenness a big dog fox sprang up at him with a savage snarl it was caught by a hind leg and had been lying concealed among the dead leaves close under the bank caleb angered at finding a fox when he had looked for a hare and at the attack the creature had made on him dealt it a blow on the head with his heavy stick just one blow given on the impulse of the moment but it killed the fox he felt very bad at what he had done and began to think of consequences 
he took it from the trap and hid it away under the dead leaves beneath the hedge some yards from the gap and then went to his work during the day one of the farm hands went out to speak to him he was a small quiet old man a discreet friend and caleb confided to him what he had done leave it to me said his old friend and went back to the farm in the afternoon caleb was standing on the top of the down looking down towards the village when he spied at a great distance the old man coming out to the hills and by and by he could make out that he had a sack on his back and a spade in his hand when halfway up the side of the hill he put his burden down and set to work digging a deep pit into this he put the dead fox and threw in and trod down the earth then carefully put back the turf in its place then his task done shouldered the spade and departed caleb felt greatly relieved for now the fox was buried out on the downs and no one would ever know that he had wickedly killed it subsequently he had other foxes caught in traps set for hares but was always able to release them about one he had the following story the dog he had at that time named monk hated foxes as jack hated adders and would hunt them savagely whenever he got a chance one morning caleb visited a trap he had set in a gap in a hedge and found a fox in it the fox jumped up snarling and displayed his teeth ready to fight for dear life and it was hard to restrain monk from flying at him so excited was he that only when his master threatened him with his crook did he draw back and sitting on his haunches left him to deal with the difficult business in his own way the difficulty was to open the steel trap without putting himself in the way of a bite from those terrible sharp teeth after a good deal of manoeuvring he managed to set the butt end of his crook on the handle of the gin and forcing it down until the iron teeth relaxed their grip the fox pulled his foot out and darting away along the hedge side vanished into the adjoining copse away went monk after him in spite of his master's angry commands to him to come back and fox and dog disappeared almost together among the trees sounds of yelping and of crashing through the undergrowth came back fainter and fainter and then there was silence caleb waited at the spot full twenty minutes before the disobedient dog came back looking very pleased he had probably succeeded in overtaking and killing his enemy about that same monk a sad story will have to be told in another chapter when speaking of foxes caleb always maintained that in his part of the country there were two sorts one small and very red the larger one of a lighter colour with some grey in it and it is possible that the hill foxes differed somewhat in size and colour from those of the lower country he related that one year two vixens littered at one spot a deep bottom among the downs so near together that when the cubs were big enough to come out they mixed and played in company the vixens happened to be of different sorts and the difference in colour appeared in the little ones as well caleb was so taken with the pretty sight of all these little foxes neighbours and playmates that he went evening after evening to sit for an hour or longer watching them one thing he witnessed which will perhaps be disbelieved by those who have not closely observed animals for themselves and who still hold to the fable that all wild creatures are born with an inherited and instinctive knowledge and dread of their enemies rabbits swarmed at that spot and he observed that when the old foxes were not about the young half-grown rabbits would freely mix and play with the little foxes he was so surprised at this never having heard of such a thing that he told his master of it and the farmer went with him on a moonlit night and the two sat for a long time together and saw rabbits and foxes playing pursuing one another round and round the rabbits when pursued often turning very suddenly and jumping clean over their pursuer the rabbits at this place belonged to the tenant and the farmer after enjoying the sight of the little ones playing together determined to get rid of the foxes in the usual way by exploding a small quantity of gunpowder in the burrows four old foxes with nine cubs were too many for him to have 
the powder was duly burned and the very next day the foxes had vanished in berkshire i once met with that rare being an intelligent gamekeeper who took an interest in wild animals and knew from observation a great deal about their habits during an after-supper talk kept up till past midnight we discussed the subject of strange erratic actions in animals which in some cases appear contrary to their own natures he gave an instance of such behaviour in a fox that had its earth at a spot on the border of a wood where rabbits were abundant one evening he was at this spot standing among the trees and watching a number of rabbits feeding and gambling on the green turf when the fox came trotting by and the rabbits paid no attention suddenly he stopped and made a dart at a rabbit the rabbit ran from him a distance of twenty to thirty yards then suddenly turning round went for the fox and chased it back some distance after which the fox again chased the rabbit and so they went on turn and turn about half a dozen times it was evident he said that the fox had no wish to catch and kill a rabbit that it was nothing but play on his part and that the rabbits responded in the same spirit knowing that there was nothing to fear another instance of this playful spirit of the fox with an enemy which i heard recently is of a gentleman who was out with his dog a fox terrier for an evening walk in some woods near his house on his way back he discovered on coming out of the woods that a fox was following him at a distance of about forty yards when he stood still the fox sat down and watched the dog the dog appeared indifferent to its presence until his master ordered him to go for the fox whereupon he charged him and drove him back to the edge of the wood but at that point the fox turned and chased the dog right back to its master then once more sat down and appeared very much at his ease again the dog was encouraged to go for him and hunted him again back to the wood and was then in turn chased back to its master after several repetitions of this performance the gentleman went home the fox still following and on going in closed the gate behind him leaving the fox outside sitting in the road as if waiting for him to come out again to have some more fun this incident served to remind me of an experience i had one evening in king's copse an immense wood of oak and pine in the new forest near exbury it was growing dark when i heard on or close to the ground some twenty to thirty yards before me a low wailing cry resembling the hunger cry of the young long-eared owl i began cautiously advancing trying to see it but as i advanced the cry receded as if the bird was flitting from me now just after i had begun following the sound a fox uttered his sudden startlingly loud scream about forty yards away on my right hand and the next moment a second fox screamed on my left and from that time i was accompanied or shadowed by the two foxes always keeping abreast of me always at the same distance one screaming and the other replying about every half minute the distressful bird sound ceased and i turned and went off in another direction to get out of the wood on the side nearest the place where i was staying the foxes keeping with me until i was out what moved them to act in such a way is a mystery but it was perhaps play to them another curious instance of foxes playing was related to me by a gentleman at the little village of inkpen near the beacon in berkshire he told me that when it happened a good many years ago he sent an account of it to the field his gamekeeper took him one day to see a strange thing to a spot in the woods where a fox had a litter of four cubs near a long smooth green slope a little distance from the edge of the slope three round swedes were lying on the turf how do you think these swedes came there said the keeper and then proceeded to say that the old fox must have brought them there from the field a long distance away for her cubs to play with he had watched them of an evening and wanted his master to come and see too accordingly they went in the evening and hiding themselves among the bushes near waited till the young foxes came out and began rolling the swedes about and jumping at and tumbling over them 
by and by one rolled down the slope and the young foxes went after it all the way down and then when they had worried it sufficiently they returned to the top and played with another swede until that was rolled down then with the third one in the same way every morning the keeper said the swedes were found back on top of the ground and he had no doubt that they were taken up by the old fox again and left there for her cubs to play with caleb was not so eager after rabbits as shepherd gathergood but he disliked the fox for another reason he considered that the hunted fox was a great danger to sheep when the ewes were heavy with lambs and when the chase brought the animal near if not right into the flock he had one dreadful memory of a hunted fox trying to lose itself in the flock of heavy-sided ewes and the hounds following in and driving the poor sheep mad with terror the result was that a large number of lambs were cast before their time and many others were poor sickly things many of the sheep also suffered in health he had no extra money from the lambs that year he received but a shilling half a crown is often paid now for every lamb above the number of ewes and as a rule received from three to six pounds a year from this source End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of A Shepherd's Life by William Henry Hudson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten: Bird Life on the Downs. Great Bustard, Stone Curlew, Big Hawks, Former Abundance of the Raven, Dogs Fed on Carrion, Ravens Fighting, Ravens Breeding Places in Wiltshire, Great Ridgewood Ravens, Field Fair Breeding in Wiltshire, Pewit, Missile Thrush magpie and turtle dove gamekeepers and magpies rooks and farmers starling the shepherd's favorite bird sparrowhawk and brown thrush wiltshire like other places in england has long been deprived of its most interesting birds the species that were best worth preserving its great bustard once our greatest bird even greater than the golden and sea eagles and the giant crane with its trumpet sound once heard in the land is now but a memory or a place name bustard n no longer an inn is well known to the many thousands who now go to the mimic wars on salisbury plain and there is a trappist monastery in a village on the southernmost border of the county which was once called and is still known to old men as bustard farm all that caleb bawcombe knew of this grandest bird is what his father had told him and isaac knew of it only from hearsay although it was still met with in south wiltshire when he was a young man the stone curlew our little bustard with the long wings big yellow eyes and wild voice still frequents the uncultivated downs unhappily in diminishing numbers for the private collector's desire to possess british taken birds eggs does not diminish i doubt if more than one clutch in ten escapes the searching eyes of the poor shepherds and labourers who are hired to supply the cabinets one pair haunted a flinty spot in winterbourne bishop until a year or two ago at other points a few miles away i watched other pairs during the summer of nineteen o nine but in every instance their eggs were taken the larger hawks and the raven which bred in all the woods and forests of wiltshire have of course been extirpated by the gamekeepers the biggest forest in the county now affords no refuge to any hawk above the size of a kestrel savernake is extensive enough one would imagine for condors to hide in but it is not so a few years ago a buzzard made its appearance there just a common buzzard and the entire surrounding population went mad with excitement about it and every man who possessed a gun flew to the forest to join in the hunt until the wretched bird after being blazed at for two or three days was brought down i heard of another case at fonthill abbey nobody could say what this wandering hawk was it was very big blue above with a white breast barred with black a terrible fierce-looking bird with fierce yellow eyes 
all the gamekeepers and several other men with guns were in hot pursuit of it for several days until some one fatally wounded it but it could not be found where it was supposed to have fallen a fortnight later its carcass was discovered by an old shepherd who told me the story it was not in a fit state to be preserved but he described it to me and i have no doubt that it was a goshawk the raven survived longer and the shepherd balcom talks about its abundance when he was a boy seventy or more years ago his way of accounting for its numbers at that time and its subsequent somewhat rapid disappearance greatly interested me we have seen his account of deer-stealing by the villagers in those brave old starvation days when lord rivers owned the deer and hunting rights over a large part of wiltshire extending from cranbourne chase to salisbury and when even so righteous a man as isaac balcom was tempted by hunger to take an occasional deer discovered out of bounds at that time caleb said a good many dogs used for hunting the deer were kept a few miles from winterbourne bishop and were fed by the keepers in a very primitive manner old worn-out horses were bought and slaughtered for the dogs a horse would be killed and stripped of its hide somewhere away in the woods and left for the hounds to batten on its flesh tearing at and fighting over it like so many jackals when only partially consumed the carcass would become putrid then another horse would be killed and skinned in another spot perhaps a mile away and the pack would start feeding afresh there the result of so much carrion lying about was that ravens were attracted in numbers to the place and were so numerous as to be seen in scores together later when the deer-hunting sport declined in the neighbourhood and dogs were no longer fed on carrion the birds decreased year by year and when caleb was a boy of nine or ten their former great abundance was but a memory but he remembers that they were still fairly common and he had much to say about the old belief that the ravens smell death and when seen hovering over a flock uttering its croak it was a sure sign that a sheep is in a bad way and will shortly die one of his recollections of the bird may be given here it was one of those things seen in boyhood which had very deeply impressed him one fine day he was on the down with an elder brother when they heard the familiar croak and spied three birds at a distance engaged in a fight in the air two of the birds were in pursuit of the third and rose alternately to rush upon and strike at their victim from above they were coming down from a considerable height and at last were directly over the boys not more than forty or fifty feet from the ground and the youngsters were amazed at their fury the loud rushing sound of their wings as of a torrent and of their deep hoarse croaks and savage barking cries then they began to rise again the hunted birds trying to keep above his enemies they in their turn striving to rise higher still so as to rush down upon him from overhead and in this way they towered higher and higher their barking cries coming fainter and fainter back to earth until the boys not to lose sight of them cast themselves down flat on their backs and continuing to gaze up saw them at last no bigger than three leetle blackbirds then they vanished but the boys still lying on their backs kept their eyes fixed on the same spot and by and by first one black speck reappeared then a second and they soon saw that two birds were swiftly coming down to earth they fell swiftly and silently and finally pitched upon the down not more than a couple of hundred yards from the boys the hunted bird had evidently succeeded in throwing them off and escaping probably it was one of their own young for the raven's habit is when their young are fully grown to hunt them out of the neighbourhood or when they cannot drive them off to kill them there is no doubt that the carrion did attract ravens in numbers to this part of wiltshire but it is a fact that up to that date about eighteen thirty the bird had many well-known old breeding-places in the county the rev a c smith in his birds of wiltshire names twenty-three breeding places no fewer than nine of them on salisbury plain but at the date of the publication of his work eighteen eighty seven only three of all these nesting places were still in use south tidworth wilton park and compton park compton chamberlain doubtless there were other ancient breeding places which the author had not heard of 
one was at the great ridge wood overlooking the wiley valley where ravens bred down to about thirty-five or forty years ago i have found many old men in the neighbourhood who remember the birds and they tell that the raven tree was a great oak which was cut down about sixty years ago after which the birds built their nest in another tree not far away a london friend of mine who was born in the neighbourhood of the great ridge wood remembers the ravens as one of the common sights of the place when he was a boy he tells of an unlucky farmer in those parts whose sheep fell sick and died in numbers year after year bringing him down to the brink of ruin and how his old head shepherd would say solemnly shaking his head tis not strange master he shot a raven there was no raven's breeding place very near winterbourne bishop caleb had uh, never heard tell of a nesty but he had once seen the nest of another species which is supposed never to breed in this country he was a small boy at the time when one day an old shepherd of the place going out from the village saw caleb and calling to him said you're the boy that likes birds if you come with me i'll show you what no man ever seed before and caleb fired with curiosity followed him away to a distance from home out from the downs into the woods and to a place where he had never been where there were bracken and heath with birch and thorn trees scattered about on cautiously approaching a clump of birches they saw a big thrush-like bird fly out of a large nest about ten feet from the ground and settle on a tree close by where it was joined by its mate the old man pointed out that it was a felt or field fare a thrush nearly as big as the missile thrush but different in colour and he said that it was a bird that came to england in flocks in winter from no man knows where far off in the north and always went away before breeding time this was the only felt he had ever seen breeding in this country and he didn't believe that no man had ever seen such a thing before he would not climb the tree to see the eggs or even go very near it for fear of disturbing the birds this man caleb said was a great one for birds he knew them all but seldom said anything about them he watched and found out a good deal about them just for his private pleasure the characteristic species of this part of the down country comprising the parish of winterbourne bishop are the pewit magpie turtle dove missile thrush and starling the pewit is universal on the hills but will inevitably be driven away from all that portion of salisbury plain used for military purposes the missile thrush becomes common in summer after its early breeding season is ended when the birds in small flocks resort to the downs where they continue until cold weather drives them away to the shelter of the wooded low country in this neighbourhood there are thickets of thorn holly bramble and birch growing over hundreds of acres of down and here the hill magpie as it is called has its chief breeding-ground and is so common that you can always get a sight of at least twenty birds in an afternoon's walk here too is the metropolis of the turtle-dove and the low sound of its crooning is heard all day in summer the other most common sound being that of magpies their subdued conversational chatter and their solo singing the chant or call which a bird will go on repeating for a hundred times the wonder is how the doves succeed in such a place in hatching any couple of chalk-white eggs placed on a small platform of sticks or of rearing any pair of young conspicuous in their blue skins and bright yellow down the keepers tell me they get even with these kill birds later in the year when they take to roosting in the woods a mile away in the valley the birds are waited for at some point where they are accustomed to slip in at dark and one keeper told me that one evening alone assisted by a friend he had succeeded in shooting thirty birds on winterbourne bishop down and round the village the magpies are not persecuted probably because the gamekeepers the professional bird killers have lost heart in this place it is a curious and rather pretty story there is no squire as we have seen the farmers have the rabbits and for game the shooting is let or to let by some one who claims to be lord of the manor who lives at a distance or abroad at all events he is not known personally to the people and all they know about the overlordship is that whereas in years gone by every villager had certain rights in the down 
to cut furs and keep a cow or pony or donkey or half a dozen sheep or goats now they have none but how and why and when these rights were lost nobody knows naturally there is no sympathy between the villagers and the keepers sent from a distance to protect the game so that the shooting may be let to some other stranger on the contrary they religiously destroy every nest they can find with the result that there are too few birds for any one to take the shooting and it remains year after year unlet this unsettled state of things is all to the advantage of the black and white bird with the ornamental tail and he flourishes accordingly and builds his big thorny nests in the roadside trees about the village the one big bird on these downs as in so many other places in england is the rook and let us humbly thank the gods who own this green earth and all the creatures which inhabit it that they have in their goodness left us this one for it is something to have a rook although he is not a great bird compared with the great ones lost bustard and kite and raven and goshawk and many others his abundance on the cultivated downs is rather strange when one remembers the outcry made against him in some parts on account of his injurious habits but here it appears the sentiment in his favour is just as strong in the farmer or in a good many farmers as in the great landlord the biggest rookery i know on salisbury plain is at a farmhouse where the farmer owns the land himself and cultivates about nine hundred acres one would imagine that he would keep his rooks down in these days when a boy cannot be hired to scare the birds from the crops one day near west noyle i came upon a vast company of rooks busily engaged on a ploughed field where everything short of placing a bird scarer on the ground had been done to keep the birds off a score of rooks had been shot and suspended to long sticks planted about the field and there were three formidable-looking men of straw and rags with hats on their heads and wooden guns under their arms but the rooks were there all the same i counted seven in one spot prodding the earth close to the feet of one of the scarecrows i went into the field to see what they were doing and found that it was sown with vetches just beginning to come up and the birds were digging the seed up three months later near the same spot on mere down i found these birds feasting on the corn when it had been long cut but could not be carried on account of the wet weather it was a large field of fifty to sixty acres and as i walked by it the birds came flying leisurely over my head to settle with loud cawings on the stalks it was a magnificent sight the great blue-black bird forms on the golden wheat an animated group of three or four to half a dozen on every stalk while others walked about the ground to pick up the scattered grain and others were flying over them for just then the sun was shining on the field and beyond it the sky was blue never had i witnessed birds so manifestly rejoicing at their good fortune with happy loud caw-caw or rather haw-haw what a harvest what abundance was there ever a more perfect august and september rain rain by night and in the morning then sun and wind to dry our feathers and make us glad but never enough to dry the corn to enable them to carry it and build it up in stacks where it would be so much harder to get at could anything be better but the commonest bird the one which vastly outnumbers all the others i have named together is the starling it was caleb balcombe's favourite bird and i believe it is regarded with peculiar affection by all shepherds on the downs on account of its constant association with sheep in the pasture the dog the sheep and the crowd of starlings these are the lonely man's companions during his long days on the hills from april or may to november and what a wise bird he is and how well he knows his friends and his enemies there is nothing more beautiful to see caleb would say than the behaviour of a flock of starlings when a hawk was about if it was a kestrel they took little or no notice of it but if a sparrow-hawk made its appearance instantly the crowd of birds could be seen flying at furious speed towards the nearest flock of sheep and down into the flock they would fall like a shower of stones and instantly disappear from sight there they would remain on the ground among the legs of the grazing sheep until the hawk had gone on his way and passed out of sight 
the sparrowhawk's victims are mostly made among the young birds that flock together in summer and live apart from the adults during the summer months after the breeding season is over when i find a dead starling on the downs ranged over by sparrowhawks it is almost always a young bird a brown thrush as it used to be called by the old naturalists you may know that the slayer was a sparrowhawk by the appearance of the bird its body untouched but the flesh picked neatly from the neck and the head gone that was swallowed whole after the beak had been cut off you will find the beak lying by the side of the body in summer time when birds are most abundant after the breeding season the sparrowhawk is a fastidious feeder end of chapter ten chapter eleven of a shepherd's life by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven starlings and sheep bells starling singing native and borrowed sounds imitations of sheep bells the shepherd on sheep bells the bells for pleasure not use a dog in charge of the flock shepherd calling his sheep richard warner of bath ploughmen singing to their oxen in cornwall a shepherd's loud singing the subject of starlings associating with sheep has served to remind me of something i have often thought when listening to their music it happens that i am writing this chapter in a small village on salisbury plain the time being mid-september nineteen o nine and that just outside my door there is a group of old elder bushes laden just now with clusters of ripe berries on which the starlings come to feed filling the room all day with their never-ending medley of sounds which is their song they sing in this way not only when they sing that is to say when they make a serious business of it standing motionless and a shiver on the tiles wings drooping and open beak pointing upwards but also when they are feasting on fruit singing and talking and swallowing elderberries between whiles to wet their whistles if the weather is not too cold you will hear this music daily wet or dry all the year round we may say that of all singing birds they are most vocal yet have no set song i doubt if they have more than half a dozen to a dozen sounds or notes which are the same in every individual and their very own one of them is a clear soft musical whistle slightly inflected another a kissing sound usually repeated two or three times or oftener a somewhat percussive smack still another a sharp prolonged hissing or sibilant but at the same time metallic note compared by some one to the sound produced by milking a cow into a tin pail a very good description there are other lesser notes a musical thrush-like chirp repeated slowly and sometimes rapidly till it runs to a bubbling sound also there is a horny sound which is perhaps produced by striking upon the edges of the lower mandible with those of the upper but it is quite unlike the loud hard noise made by the stork the poor stork being a dumb bird has made a sort of policeman's rattle of his huge beak these sounds do not follow each other they come from time to time the intervals being filled up with others in such endless variety each bird producing its own notes that one can but suppose that they are imitations we know in fact that the starling is our greatest mimic and that he often succeeds in recognizable reproductions of single notes of phrases and occasionally of entire songs as for instance that of the blackbird but in listening to him we are conscious of his imitations even when at his best he amuses rather than delights he is not like the mockingbird his common starling pipe cannot produce sounds of pure and beautiful quality like the blackbird's oboe voice to quote davidson's apt phrase he emits this song in a strangely subdued tone producing the effect of a blackbird heard singing at a considerable distance and so with innumerable other notes calls and songs they are often to their originals what a man's voice heard on a telephone is to his natural voice 
he succeeds best as a rule in imitations of the coarser metallic sounds and as his melody abounds in a variety of little measured tinkling and clinking notes as of tappings on a metal plate it has struck me at times that these are probably borrowed from the sheep bells of which the bird hears so much in his feeding grounds it is however not necessary to suppose that every starling gets these sounds directly from the bells the birds undoubtedly mimic one another as is the case with mocking-birds and the young might easily acquire this part of their song language from the old birds without visiting the flocks in the pastures the sheep-bell in its half-muffled strokes as of a small hammer tapping on an iron or copper plate is one would imagine a sound well within the starling's range easily imitated therefore specially attractive to him but to pass to another subject what does the shepherd himself think or feel about it and why does he have bells on his sheep he thinks a great deal of his bells he pipes not like the shepherd of the fable or of the pastoral poets nor plays upon any musical instrument and seldom sings or even whistles that sorry substitute for song he loves music nevertheless and gets it in his sheep bells and he likes it in quantity. "'How many bells have you got on your sheep? It sounds as if you had a great many,' I asked of a shepherd the other day, feeding his flock near old Sarum, and he replied, "'Just forty, and I wish there were eighty. Twenty-five or thirty is a more usual number, but only because of their cost, for the shepherd has very little money for bells or anything else. Another told me that he had only thirty but he intended getting more the sound cheers him it is not exactly monotonous owing to the bells being of various sizes and also greatly varying in thickness so that they produce different tones from the sharp tinkle tinkle of the smallest to the sonorous clonk clonk of the big copper bell then too they are differently agitated some quietly when the sheep are grazing with heads down others rapidly as the animal walks or trots on and there are little bursts or peals when a sheep shakes its head altogether producing a kind of rude harmony a music which like that of bagpipes or of chiming church bells heard from a distance is akin to natural music and accords with rural scenes as to use there is little or none a shepherd will sometimes say when questioned on the subject that the bells tell him just where the flock is or in which direction they are travelling but he knows better the one who is not afraid to confess the simple truth of the matter to a stranger will tell you that he does not need the bells to tell him where the sheep are or in which direction they are grazing his eyes are good enough for that the bells are for his solace or pleasure alone it may be that the sheep like the tinkling too it is his belief that they do like it a shepherd said to me a few days ago it is lonesome with the flock on the downs more so in cold wet weather when you perhaps don't see a person all day on some days not even at a distance much less to speak to the bells keep us from feeling it too much we know what we have them for and the more we have the better we like it they are company to us even in fair weather he seldom has any one to speak to a visit from an idle man who will sit down and have a pipe and talk with him is a day to be long remembered and even to date events from twas the month may june or october when the stranger came out to the down and talked to i one day in september when sauntering over mere down one of the most extensive and loneliest looking sheep walks in south wiltshire a vast elevated plain or tableland a portion of which is known as white sheet hill i passed three flocks of sheep all with many bells and noticed that each flock produced a distinctly different sound or effect owing doubtless to a different number of big and little bells in each and it struck me that any shepherd on a dark night or if taken blindfolded over the downs would be able to identify his own flock by the sound at the last of the three flocks a curious thing occurred there was no shepherd with it or anywhere in sight but a dog was in charge 
i found him lying apparently asleep in a hollow by the side of a stick and an old sack i called to him but instead of jumping up and coming to me as he would have done if his master had been there he only raised his head looked at me then put his nose down on his paws again i am on duty in sole charge and you must not speak to me was what he said after walking a little distance on i spied the shepherd with a second dog at his heels coming over the down straight to the flock and i stayed to watch when still over a hundred yards from the hollow the dog flew ahead and the other jumping up ran to meet him and they stood together wagging their tails as if conversing when the shepherd had got up to them he stood and began uttering a curious call a somewhat musical cry in two notes and instantly the sheep now at a considerable distance stopped feeding and turned then all together began running towards him and when within thirty yards stood still massed together and all gazing at him he then uttered a different call, and, turning, walked away, the dogs keeping with him, and the sheep closely following. It was late in the day, and he was going to fold them down at the foot of the slope, in some fields half a mile away. As the scene I had witnessed appeared unusual, I related it to the very next shepherd I talked with. "'Oh, there's nothing in that,' he said. "'Of course the dog was behind the flock.' I said, no, the peculiar thing was that both dogs were with their master, and the flock followed. Well, my sheep would do the same, he returned. That is, they'll do it if they know there's something good for them, something they like in the fold. They are very knowing. And other shepherds to whom I related the incident said pretty much the same, but they apparently did not quite like to hear that any shepherd could control his sheep with his voice alone. Their way of receiving the story confirmed me in the belief that I had witnessed something unusual. Before concluding this short chapter, I will leave the subject of the Wiltshire shepherd and his sheep to quote a remarkable passage about men singing to their cattle in Cornwall from a work on that county by Richard Warner of Bath, once a well-known and prolific writer of topographical and other books. They are little known now, I fancy, but he was great in his day, which lasted from about the middle of the eighteenth to about the middle of the nineteenth century. At all events, he died in 1857, aged ninety-four. But he was not great at first, and, finding when nearing middle age that he was not prospering, he took to the church and had several livings, some of them running concurrently, as was the fashion in those dark days. His topographical work included walks in Wales, in Somerset, in Devon, walks in many places, usually taken in a stage-coach or on horseback, containing nothing worth remembering except perhaps the one passage I have mentioned, which is as follows. We had scarcely entered Cornwall before our attention was agreeably arrested by a practice connected with the agriculture of the people, which to us was entirely novel. The farmers judiciously employ the fine oxen of the country in ploughing and other processes of husbandry, to which the strength of this useful animal can be employed. The Rev. Richard Warner is tedious, but let us be patient and see what follows. To which the strength of this useful animal can be employed, and while the hinds are thus driving their patient slaves along the furrows, they continually cheer them with conversation, denoting approbation and pleasure. This encouragement is conveyed to them in a sort of chant of very agreeable modulation, which, floating through the air from different distances, produces a striking effect both on the ear and imagination." the notes are few and simple and when delivered by a clear melodious voice have something expressive of that tenderness and affection which man naturally entertains for the companions of his labours in a pastoral state of society when feeling more forcibly his dependence upon domesticated animals for support he gladly reciprocates with them kindness and protection for comfort and subsistence this wild melody was to 
to me, I confess, peculiarly affecting. It seemed to draw more closely the link of friendship between man and the humbler tribes of fellow mortals. It solaced my heart with the appearance of humanity in a world of violence, and in times of universal hostile rage, and it gladdened my fancy with the contemplation of those days of heavenly harmony promised in the predictions of eternal truth when man freed at length from prejudice and passion shall seek his happiness in cultivating the mild the benevolent and the merciful sensibilities of his nature and when the animal world catching the virtues of its lord and master shall soften into gentleness and love when the wolf and so on clause after clause with others to be added until the whole sentence becomes as long as a fishing-rod but apart from the fiddle-dee-dee is the thing he states believable it is a charming picture and one would like to know more about that chant that wild melody the passage aroused my curiosity when in cornwall as it had appeared to me that in no part of england are the domestic animals so little considered by their masters the r s p c a is practically unknown there and when watching the doings of shepherds or drovers with their sheep the question has occurred to me what would my wiltshire shepherd friends say of such a scene if they had witnessed it there is nothing in print which i can find to confirm warner's observations and if you inquire of very old men who have been all their lives on the soil they will tell you that there has never been such a custom in their time nor have they ever heard of it existing formerly warner's tour through cornwall is dated eighteen o eight i take it that he described a scene he actually witnessed and that he jumped to the conclusion that it was a common custom for the ploughman to sing to his oxen it is not unusual to find a man anywhere singing to his oxen or horses or sheep if he has a voice and is fond of exercising it i remember that in a former book nature in downland i described the sweet singing of a cowboy when tending his cows on a heath near trotton in west sussex and here in wiltshire it amused me to listen at a vast distance to the robust singing of a shepherd while following his flock on the great lonely downs above chittern he was a sort of tamaño of the downs with a tremendous voice audible a mile away End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of a shepherd's life by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve the shepherd and the bible daniel burden the treasure seeker the shepherd's feeling for the bible effect of the pastoral life the shepherd's story of isaac's boyhood the village on the wiley one of the shepherd's early memories was of daniel burden a labourer on the farm where isaac bawcombe was head shepherd he retained a vivid recollection of this person who had a profound gravity and was the most silent man in the parish he was always thinking about hidden treasure and all his spare time was spent in seeking for it on a sunday morning or in the evening after working hours he would take a spade or pick and go away over the hills on his endless search after something he could not find he opened some of the largest barrows making trenches six to ten feet deep through them but found nothing to reward him one day he took caleb with him and they went to a part of the down where there were certain depressions in the turf of a circular form and six to seven feet in circumference burden had observed these basin-like depressions and had thought it possible they marked the place where things of value had been buried in long past ages to begin he cut the turf all round and carefully removed it then dug and found a thick layer of flints these removed he came upon a deposit of ashes and charred wood and that was all burden without a word set to work to put it all back in its place again ashes and wood and earth and flints and having trod it firmly down he carefully replaced the turf then leaning on his spade gazed silently at the spot for a space of several minutes at last he spoke maybe caleb you've heard tell about what the bible says of burnt sacrifice 
well now i be of opinion that it were here they people the bible says about they come up here to sacrifice on white bustard down and these be the places where they made their fires then he shouldered his spade and started home the boy following caleb's comment was i didn't say nothing to him cos i were only a leetle boy and he were an old man but i knowed better than that all the time because them people in the bible they was never in england at all so how could they sacrifice on white bustard down in wiltshire it was no idle boast on his part caleb and his brothers had been taught their letters when small and the bible was their one book which they read not only in the evenings at home but out on the downs during the day when they were with the flock his extreme familiarity with the whole scripture narrative was a marvel to me it was also strange considering how intelligent a man he was that his lifelong reading of that one book had made no change in his rude wiltshire speech apart from the feeling which old religious country people who know nothing about the higher criticism have for the bible taken literally as the word of god there is that in the old scriptures which appeals in a special way to the solitary man who feeds his flock on the downs i remember well in the days of my boyhood and youth when living in a purely pastoral country among a semi-civilized and very simple people how understandable and eloquent many of the ancient stories were to me the life the outlook the rude customs and the vivid faith in the unseen were much the same in that different race in a far distant age in a remote region of the earth and in the people i mixed with in my own home that country has been changed now it has been improved and civilized and brought up to the european standard i remember it when it was as it had existed for upwards of two centuries before it had caught the contagion the people i knew were the descendants of the spanish colonists of the seventeenth century who had taken kindly to the life of the plains and had easily shed the traditions and ways of thought of europe and of towns their philosophy of life their ideals their morality were the result of the conditions they existed in and wholly unlike ours and the conditions were like those of the ancient people of which the bible tells us their very phraseology was strongly reminiscent of that of the sacred writings and their character in the best specimens was like that of the men of the far past who lived nearer to god as we say and certainly nearer to nature than it is possible for us in this artificial state among the sometimes grand old men who were large landowners rich in flocks and herds these fine old dignified natives the substantial and leading men of the district who could not spell their own names there were those who reminded you of abraham and isaac and jacob and esau and joseph and his brethren and even of david the passionate psalmist with perhaps a guitar for a harp no doubt the scripture lessons read in the thousand churches on every sunday of the year are practically meaningless to the hearers these old men with their sheep and goats and wives and their talk about god are altogether out of our ways of thought in fact as far from us as incredible or unimaginable we may say as the neolithic men or the inhabitants of another planet they are of the order of mythical heroes and the giants of antiquity to read about them is an ancient custom but we do not listen even to myself the memories of my young days came to be regarded as very little more than mere imaginations and i almost ceased to believe in them until after years of mixing with modern men mostly in towns i fell in with the downland shepherds and discovered that even here in densely populated and ultra-civilized england something of the ancient spirit had survived in caleb and a dozen old men more or less like him i seemed to find myself among the people of the past and sometimes they were so much like some of the remembered old sober and slow-minded herders of the plains that i could not help saying to myself why how this man reminds me of tio isidoro or of don pasquale of the three poplar trees or of marcos who would always have three black sheep in a flock 
and just as they reminded me of these men i had actually known so did they bring back the older men of the bible history abraham and jacob and the rest the point here is that these old bible stories have a reality and significance for the shepherd of the down country which they have lost for modern minds that they recognize their own spiritual lineaments in these antique portraits and that all these strange events might have happened a few years ago and not far away one day i said to caleb bawcombe that his knowledge of the bible especially of the old part was greater than that of the other shepherds i knew on the downs and i would like to hear why it was so this led to the telling of a fresh story about his father's boyhood which he had heard in later years from his mother isaac was an only child and not the son of a shepherd his father was a rather worthless if not a wholly bad man he was idle and dissolute and being remarkably dexterous with his fists he was persuaded by certain sporting persons to make a business of fighting quite a common thing in those days he wanted nothing better and spent the greater part of the time in wandering about the country the money he made was spent away from home mostly in drink while his wife was left to keep herself and child in the best way she could at home or in the fields by and by a poor stranger came to the village in search of work and was engaged for very little pay by a small farmer for the stranger confessed that he was without experience of farm work of any description the cheapest lodging he could find was in the poor woman's cottage and then isaac's mother who pitied him because he was so poor and a stranger alone in the world a very silent melancholy man formed the opinion that he had belonged to another rank in life his speech and hands and personal habits betrayed it undoubtedly he was a gentleman and then from something in his manner his voice and his words whenever he addressed her and his attention to religion she further concluded that he had been in the church that owing to some trouble or disaster he had abandoned his place in the world to live away from all who had known him as a laborer one day he spoke to her about isaac he said he had been observing him and thought it a great pity that such a fine intelligent boy should be allowed to grow up without learning his letters she agreed that it was but what could she do the village school was kept by an old woman and though she taught the children very little it had to be paid for and she could not afford it he then offered to teach isaac himself and she gladly consented and from that day he taught isaac for a couple of hours every evening until the boy was able to read very well after which they read the bible through together the poor man explaining everything especially the historical parts so clearly and beautifully with such an intimate knowledge of the countries and peoples and customs of the remote east that it was all more interesting than a fairy tale finally he gave his copy of the bible to isaac and told him to carry it in his pocket every day when he went out on the downs and when he sat down to take it out and read in it for by this time isaac who was now ten years old had been engaged as a shepherd boy to his great happiness for to be a shepherd was his ambition then one day the stranger rolled up his few belongings in a bundle and put them on a stick which he placed on his shoulder said good-bye and went away never to return taking his sad secret with him isaac followed the stranger's counsel and when he had sons of his own made them do as he had done from early boyhood caleb had never gone with his flock on the down without the book and had never passed a day without reading a portion the incidents and observations gathered in many talks with the old shepherd which i have woven into the foregoing chapters relate mainly to the earlier part of his life up to the time when a married man and father of three small children he migrated to warminster there he was in to him a strange land far away from friends and home and the old familiar surroundings amid new scenes and new people but the few years he spent at that place had furnished him with many interesting memories, some of which will be narrated in the following chapters. 
i have told in the account of winterbourne bishop how i first went to that village just to see his native place and later i visited doveton for no other reason than that he had lived there to find it one of the most charming of the numerous pretty villages in the vale i looked for the cottage in which he had lived and thought it as perfect a home as a quiet contemplative man who loved nature could have had a small thatched cottage very old-looking perhaps inconvenient to live in but situated in the prettiest spot away from other houses near and within sight of the old church with old elms and beech trees growing close to it and the land about it green meadow the clear river fringed with a luxuriant growth of sedges flag and reeds was less than a stone's throw away so much did i like the vale of the wiley when i grew to know it well that i wish to describe it fully in the chapter that follows End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of a shepherd's life by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen vale of the wiley warminster vale of the wiley counting the villages a lost church character of the villages titherington church story of the dog lord lovell monuments and churches manor houses nook the cottages yellow stone crop cottage gardens marigolds goldenrod wild flowers of the waterside seeking for the characteristic expression the prettily named wiley is a little river not above twenty miles in length from its rise to salisbury where after mixing with the nadder at wilton it joins the avon at or near its source stands warminster a small unimportant town with a nobler sounding name than any other in wiltshire trowbridge devizes marlborough salisbury do not stir the mind in the same degree and as for chippenham merksham mere calney and corsham these all are of no more account than so many villages in comparison yet warminster has no associations no place in our mental geography at all events one remembers nothing about it its name which after all may mean nothing more than the monastery on the weir one of the three streamlets which flow into the wiley at its source is its only glory it is not surprising that caleb bowcombe invariably speaks of his migration to and of the time he passed at warminster when as a fact he was not there at all but at doveton a little village on the wiley a few miles below the town with the great name it is a green valley the greenness strikes one sharply on account of the pale colour of the smooth high downs on either side half a mile to a mile in width its crystal current showing like a bright serpent for a brief space in the green flat meadows then vanishing again among the trees so many are the great shade trees beeches and ashes and elms that from some points the valley has the appearance of a continuous wood a contiguity of shade and the wood hides the villages at some point so effectually that looking down from the hills you may not catch a glimpse of one and imagine it to be a valley where no man dwells as a rule you do see something of human occupancy the red or yellow roofs of two or three cottages a half-hidden grey church tower or column of blue smoke but to see the villages you must go down and look closely and even so you will find it difficult to count them all i have tried going up and down the valley several times walking or cycling and have never succeeded in getting the same number on two occasions there are certainly more than twenty without counting the hamlets and the right number is probably something between twenty-five and thirty but i do not want to find out by studying books and maps i prefer to let the matter remain unsettled so as to have the pleasure of counting or trying to count again at some future time but i doubt that i shall ever succeed on one occasion i caught sight of a quaint pretty little church standing by itself in the middle of a green meadow where it looked very solitary with no houses in sight and not even a cow grazing near it the river was between me and the church so i went upstream a mile and a half to cross by the bridge then doubled back to look for the church and couldn't find it yet it was no illusory church 
I have seen it again on two occasions, but again from the other side of the river, and I must certainly go back some day in search of that lost church, where there may be effigies, brasses, sad, eloquent inscriptions, and other memorials of ancient tragedies and great families now extinct in the land. This is perhaps one of the principal charms of the Wiley, the sense of beautiful human things hidden from sight among the masses of foliage. Yet another lies in the character of the villages, twenty-five or twenty-eight of them in a space of twenty miles. Yet the impression left on the mind is that these small centres of population are really few and far between, for not only are they small, but of the old, quiet, now almost obsolete type of village, so unobtrusive as to affect the mind soothingly, like the sight of trees and flowery banks and grazing cattle. The churches, too, as is fit, are mostly small and ancient and beautiful, half hidden in their tree-shaded churchyards, rich in associations which go back to a time when history fades into myth and legend not all however are of this description a few are naked dreary little buildings and of these i will mention one which albeit ancient has no monuments and no burial ground this is the church of titherington a small rustic village which has for neighbours codford st peter on one side and sutton veeney and norton bovent on the other to get into this church where there was nothing but naked walls to look at i had to procure the key from the clerk a nearly blind old man of eighty he told me that he was shoemaker but could no longer see to make or mend shoes that as a boy he was a weak sickly creature and his father a farm bailiff made him learn shoemaking because he was unfit to work out of doors i remember this church he said when there was only one service each quarter but strange to say he forgot to tell me the story of the dog what didn't he tell you about the dog exclaimed everybody there was really nothing else to tell it happened about a hundred years ago that once after the quarterly service had been held a dog was missed a small terrier owned by the young wife of a farmer of titherington named case she was fond of her dog and lamented its loss for a little while then forgot all about it but after three months, when the key was once more put into the rusty lock and the door thrown open, there was the dog, a living skeleton, it was said, dazed by the light of day, but still able to walk. It was supposed that he had kept himself alive by licking the moisture from the walls. The walls, they said, were dripping with wet and covered with a thick growth of mould. I went back to interrogate the ancient clerk, and he said that the dog died shortly after its deliverance. Mrs. Case herself told him all about it. She was an old woman then, but was always willing to relate the sad story of her pet. That picture of the starving dog coming out, a living skeleton, from the wet, moldy church, reminds us sharply of the changed times we live in and of the days when the church was still sleeping very peacefully not yet turning uneasily in its bed before opening its eyes and when a comfortable rector of codford thought it quite enough that the people of titherington a mile away should have one service every three months as a fact the titherington dog interested me as much as the story of the last lord lovell's self-incarceration in his own house in the neighbouring little village of upton lovell he took refuge there from his enemies who were seeking his life and concealed himself so effectually that he was never seen again centuries later when excavations were made on the side of the ruined mansion a secret chamber was discovered containing a human skeleton seated in a chair at a table on which were books and papers crumbling into dust a volume might be filled with such strange and romantic happenings in the little villages of the wiley and for the natural man they have a lasting fascination but they invariably relate to a great people of their day warriors and statesmen and landowners of old and noble lineage the smallest and meanest you will find being clothiers or merchants who amassed large fortunes and built mansions for themselves and almshouses for the aged poor and when dead had memorials placed to them in the churches 
but of the humble cottagers the true people of the vale who were rooted in the soil and nourished and died like trees in the same place of these no memory exists we only know that they lived and laboured that when they died three or four a year three or four hundred in a century they were buried in the little shady churchyard each with a green mound over him to mark the spot but in time these mouldering heaps subsided the bodies turned to dust and another and yet other generations were laid in the same spot among the forgotten dead to be themselves in turn forgotten yet i would rather know the histories of these humble unremembered lives than of the great ones of the vale who have left us a memory it may be for this reason that i was little interested in the manor-houses of the vale they are plentiful enough some gone to decay or put to various uses others still the homes of luxury beauty culture stately rooms rich fabrics pictures books and manuscripts gold and silverware china and glass expensive curios suits of armour ivory and antlers tiger skins stuffed goshawks and peacock's feathers houses in some cases built centuries ago standing half hidden in beautiful wooded grounds isolated from the village and even as they thus stand apart sacred from intrusion so the life that is in them does not mix with or form part of the true native life they are to the cottagers of to-day what the roman villas were to the native population of some eighteen centuries ago this will seem incredible to some to me an untrammelled person familiar in both hall and cottage the distance between them appears immense a reader well acquainted with the valley will probably laugh to be told that the manor-house which most interested me was that of knook a small little village between heightsbury and upton lovell its ancient and towerless little church with rough grey walls is if possible even more desolate looking than that of titherington in my hunt for the key to open it i disturbed a quaint old man another octogenarian picturesque in a vast white beard who told me he was a thatcher or had been one before the evil days came when he could work no more and was compelled to seek parish relief you must go to the manor-house for the key he told me a strange place in which to look for the key and it was stranger still to see the house close to the church and so like it that but for the small cross on the roof of the ladder one could not have known which was the sacred building first a monk's house it fell at the reformation to some greedy gentleman who made it his dwelling and doubtless in later times it was used as a farmhouse now a house most desolate dirty and neglected with cracks in the walls which threaten ruin standing in a wilderness of weeds tenanted by a poor working man whose wages are twelve shillings a week and his wife and eight children the rent is eighteen pence a week probably the lowest rented manor-house in england though it is not very rare to find such places tenanted by labourers but let us look at the true cottages there are i imagine few places in england where the humble homes of the people have so great a charm undoubtedly they are darker inside and not so convenient to live in as the modern box-shaped red-brick slate-roofed cottages which have spread a wave of ugliness over the country but they do not offend they please the eye they are smaller than the modern built habitations they are weathered and coloured by sun and wind and rain and many lowly vegetable forms to a harmony with nature they appear related to the trees amid which they stand to the river and meadows to the sloping downs at the side and to the sky and clouds over all and most delightful feature they stand among and are wrapped in flowers as in a garment rose and vine and creeper and clematis they are mostly thatched but some have tiled roofs their deep dark red clouded and stained with lichen and moss and these roofs too have their flowers in summer they are grown over with yellow stonecrop that bright cheerful flower that smiles down at you from the lowly roof above the door 
with such an inviting expression so delighted to see you no matter how poor and worthless a person you may be or what mischief you may have been at that you begin to understand the significance of a strange vernacular name of this plant welcome home husband though never so drunk but its garden flowers clustering and nestling around it amid which its feet are set they are to me the best of all flowers these are the flowers we know and remember for ever the old homely cottage garden blooms so old that they have entered the soul the big house garden or gardener's garden with everything growing in it i hate but these i love fragrant gilly flower and pink and close smelling carnation wallflower abundant periwinkle sweet williams larkspur love in a mist and love lies bleeding old woman's nightcap and kiss me john at the garden gate sometimes called pansy and best of all and in greatest profusion that flower of flowers the marigold how the townsman town born and bred regards this flower i do not know he is in spite of all the time i have spent in his company a comparative stranger to me the one living creature on the earth who does not greatly interest me some overpopulated planet in our system discovered a way to relieve itself by discharging its superfluous millions on our globe a pale people with hurrying feet and eager restless minds who live apart in monstrous crowded camps like wood ants that go not out to forage for themselves six millions of them crowded together in one camp alone i have lived in these colonies years and years never losing the sense of captivity of exile ever conscious of my burden taking no interest in the doings of that innumerable multitude its manifold interests its ideals and philosophy its arts and pleasure what then does it matter how they regard this common orange-coloured flower with a strong smell for me it has an atmosphere a sense or suggestion of something immeasurably remote and very beautiful an event a place a dream perhaps which has left no distinct image but only this feeling unlike all others imperishable and not to be described except by the one word marigold but when my sight wanders away from the flower to others blooming with it to all those which i have named and to the taller ones so tall that they reach halfway up and some even quite up to the eaves of the lowly houses they stand against hollyhocks and peonies and crystalline white lilies with powdery gold inside and the common sunflower i begin to perceive that they all possess something of that same magical quality these taller blooms remind me that the evening primrose long naturalized in our hearts is another common and very delightful cottage garden flower also that here on the wiley there is yet another stranger from the same western world which is fast winning our affections this is the goldenrod grandly beautiful in its great yellow plume-like tufts but it is not quite right to call the tufts yellow they are green thickly powdered with the minute golden florets there is no flower in england like it and it is a happiness to know that it promises to establish itself with us as a wild flower where the village lies low in the valley and the cottage is near the water there are wild blooms too which almost rival those of the garden in beauty water agrimony and comfrey with ivory white and dim purple blossoms purple and yellow loosestrife and gem-like water forget-me-not all these mixed with reeds and sedges and water-grasses forming a fringe or border to the potato or cabbage patch dividing it from the stream but now i have exhausted the subject of the flowers and enumerated and dwelt upon the various other components of the scene it comes to me that i have not yet said the right thing and given the wily its characteristic expression in considering the flowers we lose sight of the downs and so in occupying ourselves with the details we miss the general effect let me then once more before concluding this chapter try to capture the secret of this little river 
there are other chalk streams in wiltshire and hampshire and dorset swift crystal currents that play all summer long with the floating poa grass fast held in their pebbly beds flowing through smooth downs with small ancient churches in their green villages and pretty thatched cottages smothered in flowers which yet do not produce the same effect as the wylie not avon for all its beauty nor itchen nor test wherein then does the wily born differ from these others and what is its special attraction it was only when i set myself to think about it to analyze the feeling in my own mind that i discovered the secret that is in my own case for of its effect on others i cannot say anything what i discovered was that the various elements of interest all of which may be found in other chalk stream valleys are here concentrated or comprised in a limited space and seen together produce a combined effect on the mind it is the narrowness of the valley and the nearness of the high downs standing over it on either side with at some points the memorials of antiquity carved on their smooth surfaces the barrows and lichnets or terraces and the vast green earthworks crowning their summit up here on the turf even with the lark singing his shrill music in the blue heavens you are with the prehistoric dead yourself for the time one of that innumerable unsubstantial multitude invisible in the sun so that the sheep travelling as they graze and the shepherd following them pass through their ranks without suspecting their presence and from that elevation you look down upon the life of to-day the visible life so brief in the individual which like the swift river stream beneath yet flows on continuously from age to age and for ever and even as you look down you hear at that distance the bell of the little hidden church tower telling the hour of noon and quickly following a shout of freedom and joy from many shrill voices of children just released from school woke to life by those sounds and drawn down by them you may sit to rest or sun yourself on the stone table of a tomb overgrown on its sides with moss the two-century-old inscription well-nigh obliterated in the little grass-grown flowery churchyard which serves as village green and playground in that small centre of life where the living and the dead exist in a neighbourly way together for it is not here as in towns where the dead are away and out of mind and the past cut off and if after basking too long in the sun in that tree-sheltered spot you go into the little church to cool yourself you will probably find in a dim corner not far from the altar a stone effigy of one of an older time a knight in armour perhaps a crusader with legs crossed lying on his back dimly seen in the dim light with perhaps a coloured sunbeam on his upturned face for this little church where the villagers worship is very old norman on saxon foundations and before they were ever laid there may have been a temple to some ancient god at that spot or a roman villa perhaps for older than saxon foundations are found in the vale and mosaic floors still beautiful after lying buried so long all this the far removed events and periods in time are not in the conscious mind when we are in the vale or when we are looking down on it from above the mind is occupied with nothing but visible nature thus when i am sitting on the tomb listening to the various sounds of life about me attentive to the flowers and bees and butterflies to man or woman or child taking a short cut through the churchyard exchanging a few words with them or when i am by the water close by watching a little company of graylings their delicately shaded silver-gray scales distinctly seen as they lie in the crystal current watching for flies or when i listen to the perpetual musical talk and song combined of a family of greenfinches in the alders or willows my mind is engaged with these things but if one is familiar with the vale if one has looked with interest and been deeply impressed with the signs and memorials of past life and of antiquity everywhere present and forming part of the scene 
something of it and of all that it represents remains in the subconscious mind to give a significance and feeling to the scene which affects us here more than in most places and that i take it is the special charm of this little valley End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of A Shepherd's Life by William Henry Hudson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 A Sheep Dog's Life. Watch. His visits to a dew pond. David and his dog Monk. Watch goes to David's assistance. Caleb's new master objects to his dog. Watch and the corn crake. Watch plays with rabbits and guinea pigs. Old Nance the rook scarer the lost pair of spectacles watch in decline gray hairs in animals a gray mole last days of watch a shepherd on old sheepdogs perhaps the most interesting of the many sheepdog histories the shepherd related was that of watch a dog he had at winterbourne bishop for three years before he migrated to warminster watch he said was more like a christian otherwise a reasonable being than any other dog he had owned he was exceedingly active and in hot weather suffered more from heat than most dogs now the only accessible water when they were out on the down was in the mist pond about a quarter of a mile from his liberty as he called that portion of the down on which he was entitled to pasture his sheep when watch could stand his sufferings no longer he would run to his master and sitting at his feet look up at his face and emit a low pleading whine what be you wanting watch a drink or a swim the shepherd would say and watch cocking up his ears would repeat the whine very well go to the pond balcom would say and off watch would rush never pausing until he got to the water and dashing in he would swim round and round lapping the water as he bathed at the side of the pond there was a large round sarsen stone and invariably on coming out of his bath watch would jump upon it and with his four feet drawn up close together would turn round and round surveying the country from that elevation then jumping down he would return in all haste to his duties another anecdote which relates to the winterbourne bishop period is a somewhat painful one and is partly about monk the sheep-dog already described as a hunter of foxes and his tragic end caleb had worked him for a time but when he came into possession of watch he gave monk to his younger brother david who was under shepherd on the same farm one morning caleb was with the ewes in a field when david who was in charge of the lambs two or three fields away came to him looking very strange very much put out what are you here for what's wrong with ye demanded caleb nothing's wrong returned the other where's monk then asked caleb dead said david dead how's he dead i killed un he wouldn't mind me and made me mad and i up with my stick and gave him one crack on the head and it killed un you killed un exclaimed caleb and you come here and tell i nothing wrong is that a right way to speak of such a thing as that what be you thinking of and what be you going to do with the lambs i'm just going back to them i'm going to do without a dog i'm going to put them in the rape and they'll be all right what put them in the rape and no dog to help ye cried the other you are not doing things right but master mustn't pay for it take watch to help ye i must do without in this morning no i'll not take un he said for he was angry because he had done an evil thing and he would have no one man or dog to help him i'll do better without a dog he said and marched off caleb cried after him if you won't have the dog don't let the lambs suffer but do as i tell ye don't you let em bide in the rape more'n ten minutes then chase em out and let em stand twenty minutes to half an hour then let em in another ten minutes and out again for twenty minutes then let em go back and feed in it quietly for the danger'll be over if you don't do as i tell ye you'll have many blown david listened then without a word went his way but caleb was still much troubled in his mind how would he get that flock of hungry lambs out of the rape without a dog 
and presently he determined to send watch or try to send him to save the situation david had been gone half an hour when he called the dog and pointing in the direction he had taken he cried david wants he go to dave watch looked at him and listened then bounded away and after running full speed about fifty yards stopped to look back to make sure he was doing the right thing go to dave shouted caleb once more and away went watch again and arriving at a very high gate at the end of the field dashed at and tried two or three times to get over it first by jumping then by climbing and falling back each time but by and by he managed to force his way through the thick hedge and was gone from sight when david came back that evening he was in a different mood and said that watch had saved him from a great misfortune he could never have got the lambs out by himself as they were mad for the rape for some days after this watch served two masters caleb would take him to his ewes and after a while would say go dave wants he and away watch would go to the other shepherd and flock when bawcombe had taken up his new place at doveton his master mr ellerby watched him for a while with sharp eyes but he was soon convinced that he had not made a mistake in engaging a head shepherd twenty-five miles away without making the usual inquiries but merely on the strength of something heard casually in conversation about this man but while more than satisfied with the man he remained suspicious of the dog i'm afraid that dog of yours must hurt the sheep he would say and he even advised him to change him for one that worked in a quieter manner watch was too excitable too impetuous he could not go after the sheep in that violent way and grab them as he did without injuring them with his teeth he did never bite a sheep in his life balcom assured him and eventually he was able to convince his master that watch could make a great show of biting the sheep without doing them the least hurt that it was actually against his nature to bite or injure anything one day in the late summer when the corn had been cut but not carried Balcom was with his flock on the edge of a newly reaped cornfield in a continuous heavy rain when he spied his master coming to him he was in a very light summer suit and straw hat and had no umbrella or other protection from the pouring rain what be wrong with master to-day said balcombe he tarbly upset to be out like this in such a rain and a straw hat and no coat mr ellerby had by that time got into the habit when troubled in his mind of going out to his shepherd to have a long talk with him not a talk about his trouble that was some secret bitterness in his heart but just about the sheep and other ordinary topics and the talk caleb said would seem to do him good but this habit he had got into was observed by others and the farm men would say something's wrong to-day master's gone off to the head shepherd when he came to where balcombe was standing in a poor shelter by the side of a fence he at once started talking on indifferent subjects standing there quite unconcerned as if he didn't even know that it was raining though his thin clothes were wet through and the water coming through his straw hat was running in streaks down his face by and by he became interested in the dog's movements playing about in the rain among the stalks what has he got in his mouth he asked presently come here watch the shepherd called and when watch came he bent down and took a corn crake from his mouth he had found the bird hiding in one of the stalks and had captured without injuring it why it's alive the dog hasn't heard it said the farmer taking it in his hands to examine it watch never heard it any creature yet said balcombe he caught things just for his own amusement but never injured them he always let them go again he would hunt mice in the field, and when he captured one, he would play with it like a cat, tossing it from him, then dashing after and recapturing it. Finally he would let it go. He played with rabbits in the same way, and if you took a rabbit from him and examined it, you would find it quite uninjured. The farmer said it was wonderful. He had never heard of a case like it before, and talking of watch he succeeded in forgetting the trouble in his mind which had sent him out in the rain in his thin clothes and straw hat and he went away in a cheerful mood 
caleb probably forgot to mention during this conversation with his master that in most cases when watch captured a rabbit he took it to his master and gave it into his hands as much as to say here is a very big sort of field mouse i have caught rather difficult to manage perhaps you can do something with it the shepherd had many other stories about this curious disposition of his dog when he had been some months in his new place his brother david followed him to the wiley having obtained a place as shepherd on a farm adjoining mr ellerby's his cottage was a little out of the village and had some ground to it with a nice lawn or green patch david was fond of keeping animal pets birds in cages and rabbits and guinea pigs in hutches the last so tame that he could release them on the grass to see them play with one another when watch first saw these pets he was very much attracted and wanted to get to them and after a good deal of persuasion on the part of caleb david one day consented to take them out and put them on the grass in the dog's presence they were a little alarmed at first but in a surprisingly short time made the discovery that this particular dog was not their enemy but a playmate he rolled on the grass among them and chased them round and round and sometimes caught and pretended to worry them and they appeared to think it very good fun watch said bawcombe in the fifteen years i had an never killed and never hurt a creature no not even a leetle mouse and when he caught anything twere only to play with it watch comes into a story of an old woman employed at the farm at this period she had been at the warminster workhouse for a short time and had there heard that a daughter of a former mistress in another part of the county had long been married and was now the mistress of dufton farm close by old nance thereupon obtained her release and trudged to doveton and one very rough cold day presented herself at the farm to beg for something to do which would enable her to keep herself if there was nothing for her she must she said go back and end her days in the warminster workhouse mrs ellerby remembered and pitied her and going into her husband begged him earnestly to find some place on the farm for the forlorn old creature he did not see what could be done for her they already had one old woman on their hands who mended sacks and did a few other trifling things but for another old woman there would be nothing to do then he went in and had a good long look at her revolving the matter in his mind anxious to please his wife and finally he asked her if she could scare the crows he could think of nothing else of course she could scare crows it was the very thing for her well he said she could go and look after the swedes the rooks had just taken a liking to them and even if she was not very active perhaps she would be able to keep them off old nance got up to go and begin her duties at once then the farmer looking at her clothes said he would give her something more to protect her from the weather on such a bleak day he got her an old felt hat a big old frieze overcoat and a pair of old leather leggings when she had put on these somewhat cumbrous things and had tied her hat firmly on with a strip of cloth and fastened the coat at the waist with a cord she was told to go to the head shepherd and ask him to direct her to the field where the rooks were troublesome then when she was setting out the farmer called her back and gave her an ancient rusty gun to scare the birds it isn't loaded he said with a grim smile i don't allow powder and shot but if you'll point it at them they'll fly fast enough thus arrayed and armed she set forth and caleb seeing her approach at a distance was amazed at her grotesque appearance and even more amazed still when she explained who and what she was and asked him to direct her to the field of swedes some hours later the farmer came to him and asked him casually if he had seen an old gallus crow about well replied the shepherd i seen an old woman in man's coat and things with an old gun and i did tell her where to bide i think it will be rather cold for the old body in that field said the farmer i'd like you to get a couple of padded hurdles and put them up for a shelter for her and in the shelter of the padded or thatched hurdles by the hedge side old nance spent her days keeping guard over the turnips and afterwards something else was found for her to do and in the meanwhile she lodged in caleb's cottage and became like one of the family 
she was fond of the children and of the dog and watch became so much attached to her that had it not been for his duties with the flock he would have attended her all day in the fields to help her with the crows old nance had two possessions she greatly prized a book and a pair of spectacles and it was her custom to spend the day sitting spectacles on nose and book in hand reading among the turnips her spectacles were so tarrible good that they suited all old eyes and when this was discovered they were in great request in the village and every person who wanted to do a bit of fine sewing or anything requiring young vision in old eyes would borrow them for the purpose one day the old woman returned full of trouble from the fields she had lost her spectacles she must she thought have lent them to some one in the village on the previous evening and then forgotten all about it but no one had them and the mysterious loss of the spectacles was discussed and lamented by everybody a day or two later caleb came through the turnips on his way home the dog at his heels and when he got to his cottage watch came round and placed himself square before his master and deposited the lost spectacles at his feet he had found them in the turnip field over a mile from home and though but a dog he remembered that he had seen them on people's noses and in their hands and knew that they must therefore be valuable not to himself but to that larger and more important kind of dog that goes about on its hind legs there is always a sad chapter in the life history of a dog it is the last one which tells of his decline and it is ever saddest in the case of the sheep-dog because he has lived closer to man and has served him every day of his life with all his powers all his intelligence in the one useful and necessary work he is fitted for or which we have found for him to do the hunting and the pet or parasite dogs the dogs for sport and pleasure though one in species with him are not like beings of the same order they are like professional athletes and performers and smart or fashionable people compared to those who do the work of the world who feed us and clothe us we are accustomed to speak of dogs generally as the servants and the friends of man it is only of the sheep-dog that this can be said with absolute truth not only is he the faithful servant of the solitary man who shepherds his flock but the dog's companionship is as much to him as that of a fellow-being would be before his long and strenuous life was finished watch originally jet black without a spot became quite grey the greyness being most marked on the head which became at last almost white it is undoubtedly the case that some animals like men turn grey with age and watch when fifteen was relatively as old as a man of sixty-five or seventy but grey hairs do not invariably come with age even in our domestic animals which are more subject to this change than those in a state of nature but we are never so well able to judge of this in the case of wild animals as in most cases their lives end prematurely the shepherd related a curious instance in a mole he once noticed mole heaps of a peculiar kind in a field of saffron and it looked to him as if this mole worked in a way of his own quite unlike the others the hills he threw up were a good distance apart and so large that you could fill a bushel measure with a mold from any one of them he noticed that this mole went on burrowing every day in the same manner every morning there were new chains or ranges of the huge mounds the runs were very deep as he found when setting a mole trap over two feet beneath the surface he set his trap filling the deep hole he had made with sods and on opening it next day he found his mole and was astonished at its great size he took no measurements but it was bigger he affirmed than he could have believed it possible for a mole to be and it was grey instead of black the grey hairs being so abundant on the head as to make it almost white as in the case of old watch he supposed that it was a very old mole that it was a more powerful digger than most of its kind and had perhaps escaped death so long on account of its strength and of its habit of feeding deeper in the earth than the others to return to watch 
his hearing and eyesight failed as he grew older until he was practically blind and too deaf to hear any word given in the ordinary way but he continued strong as ever on his legs and his mind was not decayed nor was he in the least tired on the contrary he was always eager to work and as his blindness and deafness had made him sharper in other ways he was still able to make himself useful with the sheep whenever the hurdles were shifted to a fresh place and the sheep had to be kept in a corner of the enclosure until the new place was ready for them it was old watch's duty to keep them from breaking away he could not see nor hear but in some mysterious way he knew when they tried to get out even if it was but one possibly the slight vibration of the ground informed him of the movement and direction as well he would make a dash and drive the sheep back then run up and down before the flock until all was quiet again but at last it became painful to witness his efforts especially when the sheep were very restless and incessantly trying to break away and watch finding them so hard to restrain would grow angry and rush at them with such fury that he would come violently against the hurdles at one side then getting up howling with pain he would dash to the other side when he would strike the hurdles there and cry out with pain once more it could not be allowed to go on yet watch would not endure to be deprived of his work if left at home he would spend the time whining and moaning praying to be allowed to go to the flock until at last his master with a very heavy heart was compelled to have him put to death this is indeed almost invariably the end of a sheep-dog however zealous and faithful he may have been and however much valued and loved he must at last be put to death i related the story of this dog to a shepherd in the very district where watch had lived and served his master so well one who had been head shepherd for upwards of forty years at ember court the principal farm at the small downland village of ember he told me that during all his shepherding days he had never owned a dog which had passed out of his hands to another every dog had been acquired as a pup and trained by himself and he had been very fond of his dogs but had always been compelled to have them shot in the end not because he would have found them too great a burden when they had become too old and their senses decayed but because it was painful to see them in their decline perpetually craving to be at their old work with the sheep incapable of doing it any longer yet miserable if kept from it end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of a shepherd's life by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the ellerbys of doveton the Balcombs at doveton farm caleb finds favour with his master mrs ellerby and the shepherd's wife the passion of a childless wife the curse the story of the mob the attack on the farm a man transported for life the hundred and ninth psalm the end of the Ellerbys. Caleb and his wife invariably spoke of their time at Doveton Farm in a way which gave one the idea that they regarded it as the most important period of their lives. It had deeply impressed them, and doubtless it was a great change for them to leave their native village for the first time in their lives and go long miles from home among strangers to serve a new master above everything they felt leaving the old father who was angry with them and had gone to the length of disowning them for taking such a step but there was something besides all this which had served to give doveton an enduring place in their memories and after many talks with the old couple about their warminster days i formed the idea that it was more to them than any other place where they had lived because of a personal feeling they cherished for their master and mistress there hitherto caleb had been in the service of men who were but a little way removed in thought and feeling from those they employed they were mostly small men born and bred in the parish some wholly self-made with no interest or knowledge of anything outside their own affairs and almost as far removed as the labourers themselves from the ranks above the ellerbys were of another stamp or a different class 
if not a gentleman mr ellerby was very like one and was accustomed to associate with gentlemen he was a farmer descended from a long line of farmers but he owned his own land and was an educated and travelled man considered wealthy for a farmer at all events he was able to keep his carriage and riding and hunting horses in his stables and he was regarded as the best breeder of sheep in the district he lived in a good house which with its pictures and books and beautiful decorations and furniture appeared to their simple minds extremely luxurious this atmosphere was somewhat disconcerting to them at first for although he knew his own value priding himself on being a good shepherd caleb had up till now served with farmers who were in a sense on an equality with him and they understood him and he them but in a short time the feeling of strangeness vanished personally as a fellow-man his master soon grew to be more to him than any farmer he had yet been with and he saw a good deal of his master mr ellerby cultivated his acquaintance and as we have seen got into the habit of seeking him out and talking to him even when he was at a distance out on the down with his flock and caleb could not but see that in this respect he was preferred above the other men employed on the farm that he had found favour in his master's eyes when he had told me that story about watch and the corncrake it stuck in my mind and on the first opportunity i went back to that subject to ask what it really was that made his master act in such an extraordinary manner to go out on a pouring wet day in a summer suit and straw hat and walk a mile or two just to stand there in the rain talking to him about nothing in particular what secret trouble had he was it that his affairs were in a bad way or was he quarrelling with his wife no nothing of the kind it was a long story this secret trouble of the ellerbys and with his unconquerable reticence in regard to other people's private affairs he would have passed it off with a few general remarks but there was his old wife listening to us and womanlike eager to discuss such a subject she would not let it pass she would tell it and would not be silenced by him they were all dead and gone why should i not be told if i wanted to hear it and so with a word put in here and there by him when she talked and with a good many words interposed by her when he took up the tale they unfolded the story which was very long as they told it and must be given briefly here it happened that when the Balcombe settled in Doveton, just as Mr. Ellerby had taken to the shepherd, making a friend of him, so Mrs. Ellerby took to the shepherd's wife, and fell into the habit of paying frequent visits to her in her cottage. She was a very handsome woman, of a somewhat stately presence, dignified in manner, and she wore her abundant hair in curls hanging on each side to her shoulders, a fashion common at that time from the first she appeared to take a particular interest in the Balcombs, and they could not but notice that she was more gracious and friendly towards them than to the others of their station on the farm the Balcombs had three children then aged six four and two years respectively all remarkably healthy with rosy cheeks and black eyes and they were merry-tempered little things mrs ellerby appeared much taken with the children praised their mother for always keeping them so clean and nicely dressed, and wondered how she could manage it on her small earnings. The carter and his wife lived in a cottage close by, and they too had three little children, and next to the carter's was the bailiff's cottage, and he too was married and had children. But Mrs. Ellerby never went into their cottages, and the shepherd and his wife concluded that it was because in both cases the children were rather puny sickly-looking little things and were never very clean the carter's wife too was a slatternly woman one day when mrs ellerby came in to see mrs Balcombe, the carter's wife was just going out of the door and mrs ellerby appeared displeased and before leaving she said i hope mrs Balcombe, you are not going to mix too freely with your neighbours or let your children go too much with them and fall into their ways they also observed that when she passed their neighbours children in the lane she spoke no word and appeared not to see them yet she was kind to them too 
and whenever she brought a big parcel of cakes fruit and sweets for the children which she often did she would tell the shepherd's wife to divide it into three lots one for her own children and the others for those of her two neighbours it was clear to see that mrs ellerby had grown fond of her children especially of the eldest the little rosy-cheeked six-year-old boy sitting in the cottage she would call him to her side and would hold his hand while conversing with his mother she would also bear the child's arm just for the pleasure of rubbing it with her hand and clasping it round with her fingers and sometimes when caressing the child in this way she would turn her face aside to hide the tears that dropped from her eyes she had no child of her own the one happiness which she and her husband desired above all things six times in their ten married years they had hoped and rejoiced although with fear and trembling that their prayer would be answered but in vain every child born to them came lifeless into the world and so twould always be for sure said the villagers because of the curse for it was a cause of wonder to the shepherd and his wife that this couple so strong and healthy so noble-looking so anxious to have children should have been so unfortunate and still the villagers repeated that it was the curse that was on them this made the shepherd angry what be you saying about a curse that is on them a good man and a good woman he would exclaim and taking up his crook go out and leave them to their gossip he would not ask them what they meant he refused to listen when they tried to tell him but in the end he could not help knowing since the idea had become a fixed one in the minds of all the villagers and he could not keep it out look at them the gossipers would say as fine a couple as you ever saw and no child and look at his two brothers fine big strong well set up men both married to fine healthy women and never a child living to any of them and the sisters unmarried tis the curse and nothing else the curse had been uttered against mr ellerby's father who was in his prime in the year eighteen thirty one at the time of the mob when the introduction of labor-saving machinery in agriculture sent the poor farm laborers mad all over england wheat was at a high price at that time and the farmers were exceedingly prosperous but they paid no more than seven shillings a week to their miserable laborers and if they were half starved when there was work for all when the corn was reaped with sickles what would their condition be when reaping machines and other new implements of husbandry came into use they would not suffer it they would gather in bands everywhere and destroy the machinery and being united they would be irresistible and so it came about that there were risings or mobs all over the land mr ellerby the most prosperous and enterprising farmer in the parish had been the first to introduce the new methods he did not believe that the people would rise against him for he well knew that he was regarded as a just and kind man and was even loved by his own labourers but even if it had not been so he would not have hesitated to carry out his resolution as he was a high-spirited man but one day the villagers got together and came unexpectedly to his barns where they set to work to destroy his new thrashing machine when he was told he rushed out and went in hot haste to the scene and as he drew near some person in the crowd threw a heavy hammer at him which struck him on the head and brought him senseless to the ground he was not seriously injured but when he recovered the work of destruction had been done and the men had gone back to their homes and no one could say who had led them and who had thrown the hammer but by and by the police discovered that the hammer was the property of a shoemaker in the village and he was arrested and charged with injuring with intent to murder tried with many others from other villages in the district at the salisbury assizes he was found guilty and sentenced to transportation for life yet the doveton shoemaker was known to every one as a quiet inoffensive young man and to the last he protested his innocence for although he had gone with the others to the farm he had not taken the hammer and was guiltless of having thrown it 
Two years after he had been sent away, Mr. Ellerby received a letter with an Australian postmark on it, but on opening it found nothing but a long denunciatory passage from the Bible enclosed, with no name or address. Mr. Ellerby was much disturbed in his mind, and instead of burning the paper and holding his peace, he kept it and spoke about it to this person and that, and every one went to his Bible to find out what message the poor shoemaker had sent, for it had been discovered that it was the one hundred and ninth psalm, or a great portion of it, and this is what they read. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. Because that he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing, like as with a garment, so let it come into his bowels like water, and like oil into his bones. Let it be unto him as a garment which covereth him, and for a girdle wherewith he is girded continually. But do thou for me, O God the Lord, for thy name's sake, for I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. I am come like the shadow when it declineth, I am tossed up and down as the locust, my knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh faileth of fatness. From that time the hundred and ninth psalm became familiar to the villagers, and there were probably not many who did not get it by heart. There was no doubt in their minds of the poor shoemaker's innocence. Every one knew that he was incapable of hurting a fly. The crowd had gone into his shop and swept him away with them. All were in it, and some person seeing the hammer had taken it to help in smashing the machinery. And Mr. Ellerby had known in his heart that he was innocent, and if he had spoken a word for him in court, he would have got the benefit of the doubt and been discharged. But no, he wanted to have his revenge on some one, and he held his peace and allowed this poor fellow to be made the victim. Then, when he died, and his eldest son succeeded him at Doveton Farm, and he and the other sons got married, and there were no children, or none born alive, they went back to the psalm again, and read and re-read, and quoted the words, Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following let their name be blotted out. Undoubtedly the curse was on them. Alas, it was! The curse was their belief in the curse, and the dreadful effect of the knowledge of it on a woman's mind, all the result of Mr. Ellerby the father's fatal mistake in not having thrown the scrap of paper that came to him from the other side of the world into the fire. All the unhappiness of the generation following came about in this way, and the family came to an end for when the last of the Ellerbys died at a great age, there was not one person of the name left in that part of Wiltshire. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of A Shepherd's Life by William Henry Hudson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Old Wiltshire Days Old Memories Hinden as a borough and as a village, the Lamb Inn and its birds, the mob at Hinden, the blind smuggler, Rawlings of Lower Pertwood Farm, Reed the Thresher and Deer Stealer, he leaves a fortune, devotion to work, old father time, Grovely Wood and the people's rights, Grace Reed and the Earl of Pembroke, an illusion of the very aged, sedan chairs in Bath, stick gathering by the poor game preserving the incident of the unhappy young man who was transported to australia or tasmania which came out in the shepherd's history of the ellerby family put it in my mind to look up some of the very aged people of the downland villages whose memories could go back to the events of eighty years ago i found a few still lingering here who were able to recall that miserable and memorable year of eighteen thirty and had witnessed the doings of the mobs. 
one was a woman my old friend of fonthill bishop now aged ninety-four who was in her teens when the poor labourers a thousand strong some say armed with cudgels hammers and axes visited her village and broke up the thrashing machines they found there another person who remembered that time was an old but remarkably well-preserved man of eighty-nine at hendon a village a couple of miles distant from fonthill bishop hendon is a delightful little village so rustic and pretty amidst its green swelling downs with great woods crowning the heights beyond that one can hardly credit the fact that it was formerly an important market and session town and a parliamentary borough returning to members also that it boasted among other greatnesses thirteen public houses now it has two and not flourishing in these tea and mineral water drinking days naturally it was an exceedingly corrupt little borough where free beer for all was the order of the day for a period of four to six weeks before an election and where every householder with a vote looked to receive twenty guineas from the candidate of his choice it is still remembered that when a householder in those days was very hard up owing perhaps to his too frequent visits to the thirteen public houses he would go to some substantial tradesman in the place and pledge his twenty guineas due at the next election in due time after the reform bill it was deprived of its glory and later when the southwestern railway built their line from salisbury to yeovil and left Endon some miles away making their station at tisbury it fell into decay dwindling to the small village it now is and its last state sober and purified is much better than the old for although sober it is contented and even merry and exhibits such a sweet friendliness toward the stranger within its gates as to make him remember it with pleasure and gratitude what a quiet little place hendon has become after its old noisy period the following little bird story will show for several weeks during the spring and summer of nineteen o nine my home was at the lamb inn a famous posting-house of the great old days and we had three pairs of birds throstle pied wagtail and flycatcher breeding in the ivy covering the wall facing the village street just over my window i watched them when building incubating feeding their young and bringing their young off the villagers too were interested in the sight and sometimes a dozen or more men and boys would gather and stand for half an hour watching the birds flying in and out of their nests when feeding their young the last to come off were the flycatchers on eighteenth june it was on the morning of the day i left and one of the little things flitted into the room where i was having my breakfast i succeeded in capturing it before the cats found out and put it back on the ivy there were three young birds i had watched them from the time they hatched and when i returned a fortnight later there were the three still being fed by their parents in the trees and on the roof their favourite perching place being on the swinging sign of the lamb whenever an old bird darted at and captured a fly the three young would flutter round it like three butterflies to get the fly this continued until eighteenth july after which date i could not detect their feeding the young although the hunger call was occasionally heard if the fly-catcher takes a month to teach its young to catch their own flies it is not strange that it breeds but once in the year it is a delicate art the bird practices and takes long to learn but how different with the martin which dismisses its young in a few days and begins breeding again even to the third time these three broods over my window were not the only ones in the place there were at least twenty other pairs in the garden and outhouses of the end sparrows thrushes blackbirds dunnocks wrens starlings and swallows yet the inn was in the very centre of the village and being an inn was the most frequented and noisiest spot to return to my old friend of eighty-nine he was but a small boy attending the hendon school when the rioters appeared on the scene and he watched their entry from the schoolhouse window it was market day and the market was stopped by the invaders and the agricultural machines brought for sale and exhibition were broken up 
the picture that remains in his mind is of a great excited crowd in which men and cattle and sheep were mixed together in the wide street which was the market-place and of shouting and noise of smashing machinery and finally of the mob pouring forth over the down on its way to the next village he and the other little boys following their march the smuggling trade flourished greatly at that period and there were receivers and distributors of smuggled wine spirits and other commodities in every town and in very many villages throughout the county in spite of its distance from the sea-coast one of his memories is of a blind man of the village or town as it was then who was used as an assistant in this business he had lost his sight in childhood one eye having been destroyed by a ferret which got into his cradle then when he was about six years old he was running across the room one day with a fork in his hand when he stumbled and falling on the floor had the other eye pierced by the prongs but in spite of his blindness he became a good worker and could make a fence reap trim hedges feed the animals and drive a horse as well as any man his father had a small farm and was a carrier as well a quiet sober industrious man who was never suspected by his neighbours of being a smuggler for he never left his house and work but from time to time he had little consignments of rum and brandy and casks received on a dark night and carefully stowed away in his manure heap and in a pit under the floor of his pigsty then the blind son would drive his old mother in the carrier's cart to bath and call at a dozen or twenty private houses leaving parcels which had been already ordered and paid for a gallon of brandy at one two or four gallons of rum at another and so on until all was got rid of and on the following day they would return with goods to hendon this quiet little business went on satisfactorily for some years during which the officers of the excise had stared a thousand times with their eagle eyes at the quaint old woman in her poke bonnet and shawl driven by a blind man with a vacant face and had suspected nothing when a little mistake was made and a jar of brandy delivered at a wrong address the recipient was an honest gentleman and in his anxiety to find the rightful owner of the brandy made extensive inquiries in his neighbourhood and eventually the excisemen got wind of the affair and on the very next visit of the old woman and her son to bath they were captured after an examination before a magistrate the son was discharged on account of his blindness but the cart and horses as well as the smuggled spirits were confiscated and the poor blind man had to make his way on foot to hendon another of his recollections is of a family named rawlings tenants of lower pertwood farm near hendon a lonely desolate-looking house hidden away in a deep hollow among the high downs the farmer rawlings of seventy or eighty years ago was a man of singular ideas and that he was permitted to put them in practice shows that severe as was the law in those days and dreadful the punishments inflicted on offenders there was a kind of liberty which does not exist now the liberty a man had of doing just what he thought proper in his own house the rawlings had a numerous family and some died at home and other lived to grow up and go out into the world under strange names faith hope and charity were three of his daughters and justice morality and fortitude three of his sons now for some reason rawlings objected to the burial of his dead in the churchyard of the nearest village monkton deverill and the story is that he quarrelled with the rector over the question of the church bell being tolled for the funeral he would have no bell tolled he swore and the rector would bury no one without the bell thereupon rawlings had the coffined corpse deposited on a table in an outhouse and the door made fast later there was another death then a third and all three were kept in the same place for several years and although it was known to the whole countryside no action was taken by the local authorities my old informant says that he was often at the farm when he was a young man and he used to steal round to the dead house as it was called to peep through a crack in the door and see the three coffins resting on the table in the dim interior 
eventually the dead disappeared a little while before the rawlings gave up the farm and it was supposed that the old farmer had buried them in the night-time in one of the neighbouring chalk-pits but the spot has never been discovered one of the stories of the old wiltshire days i picked up was from an old woman aged eighty-seven in the wilton workhouse she has a vivid recollection of a labourer named reed in odstock a village on the ebel near salisbury a stern silent man who was a marvel of strength and endurance the work in which he most delighted was precisely that which most labourers hated before threshing machines came in despite the action of the mobs threshing out corn with the flail from earliest dawn till after dark he would sit or stand in a dim dusty barn monotonously pounding away without an interval to rest and without dinner and with no food but a piece of bread and a pinch of salt without the salt he would not eat the bread an hour after all others had ceased from work he would put on his coat and trudge home to his wife and family the woman in the workhouse remembers that once when reed was a very old man past work he came to their cottage for something and while he stood waiting at the entrance a little boy ran in and asked his mother for a piece of bread and butter with sugar on it old reed glared at him and shaking his big stick exclaimed i'd give you sugar with this if you were my boy and so terrible did he look in his anger at the luxury of the times that the little boy burst out crying and ran away what chiefly interested me about this old man was that he was a deer stealer of the days when that offence was common in the country it was not so great a crime as sheep stealing for which men were hanged taking a deer was punished with nothing worse than hard labour as a rule but reed was never caught he would labour his full time and steal away after dark over the downs to return in the small hours with a deer on his back it was not for his own consumption he wanted the money for which he sold it in salisbury and it is probable that he was in league with other poachers as it is hard to believe that he could capture the animals single-handedly after his death it was found that old reed had left a hundred pounds to each of his two surviving daughters and it was a wonder to everybody how he had managed not only to bring up a family and keep himself out of the workhouse to the end of his long life but to leave so large a sum of money one can only suppose that he was a rigid economist and never had a week's illness and that by abstaining from beer and tobacco he was able to save a couple of shillings each week out of his wages of seven or eight shillings this in forty years would make the two hundred pounds with something over it is not a very rare thing to find a farm labourer like old reed of odstock with not only a strong preference for a particular kind of work but a love of it as compelling as that of an artist for his art some friends of mine whom i went to visit over the border in dorset told me of an enthusiast of this description who had recently died in the village what a pity you did not come sooner they said alas it is nearly always so on first coming to stay at a village one is told that it has but just lost its oldest and most interesting inhabitant a relic of the olden time this man had taken to the scythe as reed had to the flail and was never happy unless he had a field to mow he was a very tall old man so lean that he looked like a skeleton the bones covered with a skin as brown as old leather and he wore his thin grey hair and snow-white beard very long he rode on a white donkey and was usually seen mounted galloping down the village street hatless his old brown bare feet and legs drawn up to keep them from the ground his scythe over his shoulder here comes old father time they would cry as they called him and ran to the door to gaze with ever fresh delight at the wonderful old man as he rushed by kicking and shouting at his donkey to make him go faster he was always in a hurry hunting for work with furious zeal and when he got a field to mow so eager was he that he would not sleep at home even if it was close by but would lie down on the grass at the side of the field and start working at dawn between two and three o'clock 
quite three hours before the world woke up to its daily toil the name of reed the zealous thresher with the flail serves to remind me of yet another reed a woman who died a few years ago aged ninety-four and whose name should be cherished in one of the downland villages she was a native of barford st martin on the nadder one of the two villages the other being wishford on the wylie river the inhabitants of which have the right to go into gravelly wood an immense forest on the wilton estate to obtain wood for burning each person being entitled to take home as much wood as he or she could carry the people of wishford take green wood but those of barford only dead they having bartered their right at a remote period to cut growing trees for a yearly sum of five pounds which the lord of the manor still pays to the village and in addition the right to take dead wood it will be readily understood that this right possessed by the people of two villages both situated within a mile of the forest has been a perpetual source of annoyance to the noble owners in modern times since the strict preservation of game especially of pheasants has grown to be almost a religion to the landowners now it came to pass that about half a century or longer ago the pembroke of that time made the happy discovery as he imagined that there was nothing to show that the barford people had any right to the dead wood they had been graciously allowed to take it as was the case all over the country at that time and that was all at once he issued an edict prohibiting the taking of dead wood from the forest by the villagers and great as the loss was to them they acquiesced not a man of barford st martin dared to disobey the prohibition or raise his voice against it grace reed then determined to oppose the mighty earl and accompanied by four other women of the village boldly went to the wood and gathered their sticks and brought them home they were summoned before the magistrates and fined and on their refusal to pay were sent to prison but the very next day they were liberated and told that a mistake had been made that the matter had been inquired into and it had been found that the people of barford did really have the right they had exercised so long to take dead wood from the forest as a result of the action of these women the right has not been challenged since and on my last visit to barford a few days before writing this chapter i saw three women coming down from the forest with as much dead wood as they could carry on their heads and backs but how near they came to losing their right it was a bold and unheard-of thing which they did and if there had not been a poor cottage woman with the spirit to do it at the proper moment the right could never have been revived grace reed's children's children are living at barford now they say that to the very end of her long life she preserved a very clear memory of the people and events of the village in the old days early in the last century they say too that in recalling the far past the old people and scenes would present themselves so vividly to her mind that she would speak of them as of recent things and would say to some one fifty years younger than herself can't you remember it surely you haven't forgotten it when twas the talk of the village it is a common illusion of the very aged and i had an amusing instance of it in my old hinden friend when he gave me his first impressions of bath as he saw it about the year eighteen thirty five what astonished him most were the sedan chairs for he had never even heard of such a conveyance but here in this city of wonders you met them in every street then he added but you've been to bath and of course you've seen them and know all about it about firewood gathering by the poor in woods and forests my old friend of fonthill bishop says that the people of the village adjacent to the fonthill and great ridge woods were allowed to take as much dead wood as they wanted from those places she was accustomed to go to the great ridge wood which was even wilder and more like a natural forest in those days than it is now it was fully two miles from her village a longish distance to carry a heavy load and it was her custom after getting the wood out to bind it firmly in a large barrel-shaped bundle of faggot as in that way she could roll it down the smooth steep slopes of the down and so get her burden home without so much groaning and sweating 
the great wood was then full of hazel trees and produced such an abundance of nuts that from mid-july to september people flocked to it for the nutting from all the country round coming even from bath and bristol to load their carts with nuts in sacks for the market later when the wood began to be more strictly preserved for sporting purposes the rabbits were allowed to increase excessively and during the hard winters they attacked the hazel trees gnawing off the bark until this most useful and profitable wood the forest produced the scrubby oaks having little value was well nigh extirpated by and by pheasants as well as rabbits were strictly preserved and the firewood gatherers were excluded altogether at present you find dead wood lying about all over the place abundantly as in any primitive forest where trees die of old age or disease or are blown down or broken off by the winds and are left to rot on the ground overgrown with ivy and brambles but of all this dead wood not a stick to boil a kettle may be taken by the neighbouring poor lest the pheasants should be disturbed or a rabbit be picked up some more of the old dame's recollections will be given in the next chapter showing what the condition of the people was in this district about the year eighteen thirty when the poor farm labourers were driven by hunger and misery to revolt against their masters the farmers who were everywhere breaking up the downs with the plough to sow more and still more corn who were growing very fat and paying higher and higher rents to their fat landlords while the wretched men that drove the plough had hardly enough to satisfy their hunger End of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of A Shepherd's Life by William Henry Hudson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen Old Wiltshire Days Continued. An Old Wiltshire Woman's Memories, Her Home, Work on a Farm, A Little Bird Scarer, Housekeeping, The Agricultural Laborers Rising, Villagers Out of Work, Relief Work, A Game of Ball with Barley Bannocks, Sheep Stealing a poor man hanged, temptations to steal, a sheep-stealing shepherd, a sheep-stealing farmer, story of Ebenezer Garlic, a sheep-stealer at Chittern, the law and the judges, a human devil in a black cap, how the revolting laborers were punished, a last scene at Salisbury Courthouse, inquest on a murdered man, policy of the farmers. The story of her early life told by my old friend Joan, aged ninety-four, will serve to give some idea of the extreme poverty and hard-suffering life of the agricultural laborers during the thirties of last century, at a time when farmers were exceedingly prosperous and landlords drawing high rents. She was three years old when her mother died after the birth of a boy, the last of eleven children there was a dame school in their little village of fonthill abbey but the poverty of the family would have made it impossible for joan to attend had it not been for an unselfish person residing there a mr king who was anxious that every child should be taught its letters he paid for little joan's schooling from the age of four to eight and now in the evening of her life when she sits by the fire with her book she blesses the memory of the man dead these seventy or eighty years who made this solace possible for her after the age of eight there could be no more school for now all the older children had gone out into the world to make their own poor living the boys to work on distant farms the girls to service or to be wives and Joan was wanted at home to keep house for her father, to do the washing, mending, cleaning, cooking, and to be mother to her little brother as well. Her father was a ploughman at seven shillings a week, but when Joan was ten he met with a dreadful accident when ploughing with a couple of young or intractable oxen. In trying to stop them he got entangled in the ropes, and one of his legs badly broken by the plough as a result it was six months before he could leave his cottage the overseer of the parish a prosperous farmer who had a large farm a couple of miles away came to inquire into the matter and see what was to be done 
His decision was that the man would receive three shillings a week until able to start work again, and as that would just serve to keep him, the children must go out to work. Meanwhile, one of the married daughters had come to look after her father in the cottage, and that set the little ones free. The overseer said he would give them work on his farm, and pay them a few pence apiece, and give them their meals. So to his farm they went, returning each evening home. That was her first place, and from that time on she was a toiler, indoors and out, but mainly in the fields, till she was past eighty-five seventy-five years of hard work then less and less as her wonderful strength diminished and her sons and daughters were getting grey until now at the age of ninety-four she does very little practically nothing in that first place she had a very hard master in the farmer and overseer he was known in all the neighbourhood as devil turner and even at that time when farmers had their men under their heel as it were he was noted for his savage tyrannical disposition also for a curious sardonic humour which displayed itself in the forms of punishment he inflicted on the workmen who had the ill luck to offend him the man had to take the punishment however painful or disgraceful without a murmur or go and starve every morning thereafter joan and her little brother aged seven had to be up in time to get to the farm at five o'clock in the morning and if it was raining or snowing or bitterly cold so much the worse for them but they had to be there for devil turner's bad temper was harder to bear than bad weather joan was a girl of all work in and out of doors and in severe weather when there was nothing else for her to do she would be sent into the fields to gather flints the coldest of all tasks for her little hands but what could your little brother a child of seven do in such a place i asked she laughed when she told me of her little brother's very first day at the farm the farmer was for a devil considerate and gave him something very light for a beginning which was to scare the birds from the ricks and if they will come back you must catch them he said and left the little fellow to obey the difficult command as he could the birds that worried him most were the fowls for however often he hunted them away they would come back again eventually he found some string with which he made some little loops fastened to sticks and these he arranged on a spot of ground he had cleared scattering a few grains of corn on it to attract the birds by this means he succeeded in capturing three of the robbers and when the farmer came round at noon to see how he was getting on the little fellow showed him his captures these are not birds said the farmer they are fowls and don't you trouble yourself any more about them but keep your eye on the sparrows and little birds and rooks and jackdaws that come to pull the straws out that was how he started then from the ricks to bird scaring in the fields and to other tasks suited to one of his age not without much suffering and many tears the worst experience was the punishment of standing motionless for long hours at a time on a chair placed out in the yard full in sight of the windows of the house so that he could be seen by the inmates the hardest the cruelest task that could be imposed on him would come as a relief after this joan suffered no punishment of that kind she was very anxious to please her master and worked hard but she was an intelligent and spirited child and as the sole result of her best efforts was that more and more work was put on her she revolted against such injustice and eventually tried beyond endurance she ran away home and refused to go back to the farm any more she found some work in the village for now her sister had to go back to her husband and joan had to take her place and look after her father and the house as well as earn something to supplement the three shillings a week they had to live on after about nine months her father was up and out again and went back to the plough for just then a great deal of down was being broken up and brought under cultivation on account of the high price of wheat and good ploughmen were in request 
he was lame the injured limb being now considerably shorter than the other and when ploughing he could only manage to keep on his legs by walking with the longer one in the furrow and the other on the higher ground but after struggling on for some months in this way suffering much pain and his strength declining he met with a fresh accident and was laid up once more in his cottage and from that time until his death he did no more farm work joan and her little brother lived or slept at home and worked to keep themselves and him now in this her own little story and in her account of the conditions of the people at that time also in the histories of other old men and women whose memories go back as far as hers supplemented by a little reading in the newspapers of that day i can understand how it came about that these poor labourers poor spiritless slaves as they had been made by long years of extremist poverty and systematic oppression rose at last against their hard masters and smashed the agricultural machines and burnt ricks and broke into houses to destroy and plunder their contents it was a desperate a mad adventure these gatherings of half-starved yokels armed with sticks and axes and they were quickly put down and punished in a way that even william the bastard would not have considered as too lenient but oppression had made them mad the introduction of thrashing machines was but the last straw the culminating act of the hideous system followed by landlords and their tenants the former to get the highest possible rent for his land the other to get his labour at the lowest possible rate it was a compact between landlord and tenant aimed against the labourer it was not merely the fact that the wages of a strong man were only seven shillings a week at the outside a sum barely sufficient to keep him and his family from starvation and rags as a fact it was not enough and but for a little poaching and stealing he would not have lived but it was customary especially on the small farms to get rid of the men after the harvest and leave them to exist the best way they could during the bitter winter months thus every village as a rule had its dozen or twenty or more men thrown out each year good steady men with families dependent on them and besides these there were the aged and weaklings and the lads who had not yet got a place the misery of these out-of-work labourers was extreme they would go to the woods and gather faggots of dead wood which they would try to sell in the villages but there were few who could afford to buy of them and at night they would skulk about the fields to rob a sweet or two to satisfy the cravings of hunger in some parishes the farmer overseers were allowed to give relief work out of the rates it goes without saying to these unemployed men of the village who had been discharged in october or november and would be wanted again when the winter was over they would be put to flint gathering in the fields their wages being four shillings a week some of the very old people of winterbourne bishop when speaking of the principal food of the labourers at that time the barley bannock and its exceeding toughness gave me an amusing account of a game of balls invented by the flint gatherers just for the sake of a little fun during their long weary day in the fields especially in cold frosty weather the men would take their dinners with them consisting of a few barley balls or cakes in their coat pockets and at noon they would gather at one spot to enjoy their meal and seat themselves on the ground in a very wide circle the men about ten yards apart then each one would produce his bannocks and start throwing aiming at some other man's face there were hits and misses and great excitement and hilarity for twenty or thirty minutes after which the earth and gravel adhering to the balls would be wiped off and they would set themselves to the hard task of masticating and swallowing the heavy stuff at sunset they would go home to a supper of more barley bannocks washed down with hot water flavoured with some aromatic herb or weed and then straight to bed to get warm for there was little firing it was not strange that sheep-stealing was one of the commonest offences against the law at that time in spite of the dreadful penalty hunger made the people reckless 
my old friend joan and other old persons have said to me that it appeared in those days that the men were strangely indifferent and did not seem to care whether they were hanged or not it is true they did not hang very many of them the judge as a rule after putting on his black cap and ordering them to the gallows would send in a recommendation to mercy for most of them but the mercy of that time was like that of the wicked exceedingly cruel instead of swinging it was transportation for life or for fourteen and at the very least seven years those who have read clark's terrible book for the term of his natural life know in a way what these poor wiltshire labourers who in most cases were never more heard of by their wives and children were sent to endure in australia and tasmania and some were hanged my friend joan named some people she knows in the neighbourhood who are the grandchildren of a young man with a wife and family of small children who was hanged at salisbury she had a vivid recollection of this case because it had seemed so hard the man having been maddened by want when he took a sheep also because when he was hanged his poor young wife travelled to the place of slaughter to beg for his body and had it brought home and buried decently in the village churchyard how great the temptation to steal sheep must have been any one may know now by merely walking about among the fields in this part of the country to see how the sheep are folded and left by night unguarded often at long distances from the village in distant fields and on the downs even in the worst times it was never customary never thought necessary to guard the flock by night many cases could be given to show how easy it was to steal sheep one quite recent about twenty years ago is of a shepherd who was frequently sent with sheep to the fairs and who on his way to wilton fair with a flock one night turned aside to open a fold and let out nineteen sheep on arriving at the fair he took out the stolen sheep and sold them to a butcher of his acquaintance who sent them up to london but he had taken too many from one flock they were quickly missed and by some lucky chance it was found out and the shepherd arrested he was sentenced to eight months hard labour and it came out during the trial that this poor shepherd whose wages were fourteen shillings a week had a sum of four hundred pounds to his credit in a salisbury bank another case which dates far back is that of a farmer named day who employed a shepherd or drover to take sheep to the fairs and markets and steal sheep for him on the way it is said that he went on at this game for years before it was discovered eventually master and man quarrelled and the drover gave information whereupon day was arrested and lodged in fisherton jail at salisbury later he was sent to take his trial at devizes on horseback accompanied by two constables at the druid's head a public-house on the way the three travellers alighted for refreshments and there day succeeded in giving them the slip and jumping on a fast horse standing ready saddled for him made his escape farmer day never returned to the plain and was never heard of again there is an element of humour in some of the sheep-stealing stories of the old days at one village where i often stayed i heard about a certain ebenezer garlic who was commonly called in allusion no doubt to his surname sweet violets he was a sober hard-working man an example to most but there was this against him that he cherished a very close friendship with a poor disreputable drunken loafer named flittermouse who spent most of his time hanging about the old coaching inn at the place for the sake of tips sweet violets was always giving coppers and sixpence to this man but one day they fell out when flittermouse begged for a shilling he must he said have a shilling he couldn't do with less and when the other refused he followed him demanding the money with abusive words to everybody's astonishment finally sweet violets turned on him and told him to go to the devil flittermouse in a rage went straight to the constable and denounced his patron as a sheep-stealer 
He, Flittermouse, had been his servant and helper, and on the very last occasion of stealing a sheep he had got rid of the skin and offal by throwing them down an old disused well at the top of the village street. To the well the constable went with ropes and hooks, and succeeded in fishing up the remains described, and he thereupon arrested Garlick and took him before a magistrate, who committed him for trial. Flittermouse was the only witness for the prosecution, and the judge, in his summing up, said that, taking into consideration Garlick's known character in the village as a sober, diligent, honest man, it would be a little too much to hang him on the unsupported testimony of a creature like Flittermouse, who was half fool and half scoundrel. The jury, pleased and very much surprised at being directed to let a man off, obediently returned a verdict of not guilty, and Sweet Violets returned from Salisbury triumphant to be congratulated on his escape by all the villagers, who, however, slyly winked and smiled at one another. Of sheep-stealing stories I will relate one more, a case which never came into court and was never discovered. It was related to me by a middle-aged man, a shepherd of Warminster, who had it from his father, a shepherd of Chittern, one of the lonely isolated villages on Salisbury Plain between the Avon and the Wiley. His father had it from the person who committed the crime and was anxious to tell it to someone, and knew that the shepherd was his true friend, a silent, safe man. He was a farm labourer named Shergold one of the South Wiltshire surnames very common in the early part of last century, which now appear to be dying out, described as a very big, powerful man, full of life and energy. He had a wife and several young children to keep, and the time was near midwinter. Shergold was out of work, having been discharged from the farm at the end of the harvest. It was an exceptionally cold season, and there was no food and no firing in the house. One evening in late December a drover arrived at Chittern with a flock of sheep which he was driving to Tilshed, another downland village several miles away. He was anxious to go to Tilshed that night and wanted a man to help him. Shergold was on the spot and undertook to go with him for the sum of fourpence. They set out when it was getting dark. The sheep were put on the road, the drover going before the flock and Shergold following at the tail it was a cold cloudy night threatening snow and so dark that he could hardly distinguish the dim forms of even the hindmost sheep and by and by the temptation to steal one assailed him for how easy it would have been for him to do it with his tremendous strength he could kill and hide a sheep very quickly without making any sound whatever to alarm the drover he was very far ahead Shergold could judge the distance by the sound of his voice when he uttered a call or shout from time to time, and by the barking of the dog as he flew up and down, first on one side of the road, then on the other, to keep the flock well on it. And he thought of what a sheep would be to him and to his hungry ones at home, until the temptation was too strong, and, suddenly lifting his big heavy stick, he brought it down with such force on the head of a sheep as to drop it with its skull crushed, dead as a stone. Hastily picking it up, he ran a few yards away and placed it among the firs bushes, intending to take it home on his way back, and then returned to the flock. They arrived at Tilshed in the small hours, and after receiving his fourpence, he started for home, walking rapidly, and then running to be in time. But when he got back to where the sheep was lying, the dawn was coming, and he knew that before he could get to Chittern with the heavy burden on his back, people would be getting up in the village, and he would perhaps be seen. The only thing to do was to hide the sheep and return for it on the following night. Accordingly, he carried it away a couple of hundred yards to a pit or small hollow in the down full of bramble and furze bushes, and here he concealed it, covering it with a mass of dead bracken and herbage, and left it. That afternoon the long-threatening snow began to fall, and with snow on the ground he dared not go to recover his sheep, since his footprints would betray him. He must wait once more for the snow to melt but the snow fell at night and what must his feelings have been when he looked at it still falling in the morning and knew that he could have gone for the sheep with safety since all traces would have been quickly obliterated 
once more there was nothing to do but wait patiently for the snow to cease falling and for the thaw but how intolerable it was for the weather continued bitterly cold for many days and the whole country was white during those hungry days even that poor comfort of sleeping or dozing away the time was denied him for the danger of discovery was ever present to his mind and shergold was not one of the callous men who had become indifferent to their fate it was his first crime and he loved his own life and his wife and children crying to him for food and the food for them was lying there on the down close by and he could not get it roast mutton boiled mutton mutton in a dozen delicious forms the thought of it was as distressing as maddening as that of the peril he was in it was a full fortnight before the wished thaw came then with fear and trembling he went for his sheep only to find that it had been pulled to pieces and the flesh devoured by dogs and foxes from these memories of the old villagers i turned to the newspapers of the day to make a few citations the law as it was did not distinguish between a case of the kind just related of the starving sorely tempted shergold and that of the systematic thief sheep-stealing was a capital offence and the man must hang unless recommended to mercy and we know what was meant by mercy in those days that so barbarous a law existed within memory of people to be found living in most villages appears almost incredible to us but despite the recommendations to mercy usual in a large majority of cases the law of that time was not more horrible than the temper of the men who administered it there were good and bad among all and in all professions but there is also a black spot in most possibly in all hearts which may be developed to almost any extent and change the justest wisest most moral men into human devils the phrase invented by canon wilberforce in another connection in reading the old reports and the expressions used by the judges in their summings up and sentences it is impossible not to believe that the awful power they possessed and its constant exercise had not only produced the inevitable hardening effect but had made them cruel in the true sense of the word their pleasure in passing dreadful sentences was very thinly disguised indeed by certain lofty conventional phrases as to the necessity of upholding the law morality and religion they were indeed as familiar with the name of the deity as any ranter in a conventicle and the enormity of the crime was an expression as constantly used in the case of the theft of a loaf of bread or an old coat left hanging on a hedge by some ill-clad half-starved wretch as in cases of burglary arson rape and murder it is surprising to find how very few the real crimes were in those days despite the misery of the people that nearly all the crimes for which men were sentenced to the gallows and to transportation for life or for long terms were offences which would now be sufficiently punished by a few weeks or even a few days imprisonment thus in april eighteen twenty five i note that mr justice park commented on the heavy appearance of the calendar it was not so much the number one hundred and seventy of the offenders that excited his concern as it was the nature of the crimes with which they were charged the worst crime in this instance was sheep stealing again this same mr justice park at the spring assizes at salisbury eighteen twenty seven said that though the calendar was a heavy one he was happy to find on looking at the dispositions of the principal cases that they were not of a very serious character nevertheless he passed sentence of death on twenty-eight persons among them being one for stealing half a crown of the twenty-eight all but three were eventually reprieved one of the fated three being a youth of nineteen who was charged with stealing a mare and pleaded guilty in spite of a warning from the judge not to do so this irritated the great man who had the power of life and death in his hand 
in passing sentence the judge expatiated on the prevalence of the crime of horse-stealing and the necessity of making an example the enormity of reed's crime rendered him a proper example and he would therefore hold out no hope of mercy towards him as to the plea of guilty he remarked that nowadays too many persons pleaded guilty deluded with the hope that it would be taken into consideration and they would escape the severer penalty he was determined to put a stop to that sort of thing if reed had not pleaded guilty no doubt some extenuating circumstance would have come up during the trial and he would have saved his life there if ever spoke the human devil in a black cap i find another case of a sentence of transportation for life on a youth of eighteen named edward baker for stealing a pocket handkerchief had he pleaded guilty it might have been worse for him at the salisbury spring assizes eighteen thirty mr justice gazily addressing the grand jury said that none of the crimes appeared to be marked with circumstances of great moral turpitude the prisoners numbered one hundred and thirty he passed sentences of death on twenty-nine life transportation on five fourteen years on five seven years on eleven and various terms of hard labour on the others the severity of the magistrates at the quarter sessions was equally revolting i notice in one case where the leading magistrate on the bench was a great local magnet an m p for salisbury etc a poor fellow with the unfortunate name of moses snook was charged with stealing a plank ten feet long the property of the aforesaid local magnet m p etc and sentenced to fourteen years transportation sentenced by the man who owned the plank worth perhaps a shilling or two when such was the law of the land and the temper of those who administered it judges and magistrates or landlords what must the misery of the people have been to cause them to rise in revolt against their masters they did nothing outrageous even in the height of their frenzy they smashed the thrashing machines burnt some ricks while the maddest of them broke into a few houses and destroyed their contents but they injured no man yet they knew what they were facing the gallows or transportation to the penal settlements ready for their reception at the antipodes it is a pity that the history of this rising of the agricultural labourer the most patient and submissive of men has never been written nothing in fact has ever been said of it except from the point of view of landowners and farmers but there is ample material for a truer and a moving narrative not only in the brief reports in the papers of the time but also in the memories of many persons still living and of their children and children's children preserved in many a cottage throughout the south of england hopeless as the revolt was and quickly suppressed it had served to alarm the landlords and their tenants and taken in conjunction with other outbreaks notably at bristol it produced a sense of anxiety in the mind of the country generally the feeling found a somewhat amusing expression in the house of commons in a motion of mr percival on fourteenth february eighteen thirty one this was to move an address to his majesty to appoint a day for a general fast throughout the united kingdom he said that the state of the country called for a measure like this that it was a state of political and religious disorganization that the elements of the constitution were being hourly loosened that in this land there was no attachment no control no humility of spirit no mutual confidence between the poor man and the rich the employer and the employed but fear and mistrust and aversion where in the time of our fathers there was nothing but brotherly love and rejoicing before the lord the house was cynical and smilingly put the matter by but the anxiety was manifested plainly enough in the treatment meted out to the poor men who had been arrested and were tried before the special commissions sent down to salisbury winchester and other towns no doubt it was a pleasant time for the judges at salisbury thirty-four poor fellows were sentenced to death thirty-three to be transported for life ten for fourteen years and so on 
and here is one last little scene about which the reports in the newspapers of the time say nothing but which i have from one who witnessed and clearly remembers it a woman of ninety-five whose whole life has been passed at a village within sound of the salisbury cathedral bells it was when the trial was ended when those who were found guilty and had been sentenced were brought out of the court-house to be taken back to prison and from all over the plain and from all parts of wiltshire their women-folk had come to learn their fate and were gathered a pale anxious weeping crowd outside the gates the sentenced men came out looking eagerly at the people until they recognized their own and cried out to them to be of good cheer tis hanging for me one would say but there'll perhaps be a recommendation to mercy so don't you fret till you know then another don't go on so old mother tis only for life i'm sent and yet another don't you cry old girl tis only fourteen years i've got and maybe i'll live to see you all again and so on as they filed out past their weeping women on their way to fisherton jail to be taken thence to the transports in portsmouth and plymouth harbours waiting to convey their living freights to that hell on earth so far from home not criminals but good brave men were these wiltshire men of that strong enduring patient class who not only as labourers on the land but on many a hard-fought field in many parts of the world from of old down to our war of a few years ago in africa have shown the stuff that was in them but alas for the poor women who were left for the old mother who could never hope to see her boy again and for the wife and her children who waited and hoped against hope through long toiling years and dreamed and started as they slept for joy that he was come but waking saw his face no more very few so far as i can make out not more than one in five or six ever returned this it may be said was only what they might have expected the law being what it was just the ordinary thing the hideous part of the business was that as an effect of the alarm created in the minds of those who feared injury to their property and loss of power to oppress the poor labourers there was money in plenty subscribed to hire witnesses for the prosecution it was necessary to strike terror into the people the smell of blood-money brought out a number of scoundrels who for a few pounds were only too ready to swear away the life of any man and it was notorious that numbers of poor fellows were condemned in this way one incident as to this point may be given in conclusion of this chapter about old unhappy things it relates not to one of those who were sentenced to the gallows or to transportation but to an inquest and the treatment of the dead i have spoken in the last chapter of the mob that visited hendon fonthill and other villages they ended their round at pitt house near tisbury where they broke up the machinery on that occasion a body of yeomanry came on the scene but arrived only after the mob had accomplished its purpose of breaking up the thrashing machines when the troops appeared the rioters as they were called made off into the woods and escaped but before they fled one of them had met his death a number of persons from the farms and villages around had gathered at the spot and were looking on when one a farmer from the neighbouring village of chilmark snatched a gun from a gamekeeper's hand and shot one of the rioters killing him dead on twenty seventh january eighteen thirty one an inquest was held on the body and some one was found to swear that the man had been shot by one of the yeomanry although it was known to everybody that when the man was shot the troop had not yet arrived on the scene the man this witness stated had attacked or threatened one of the soldiers with his stick and had been shot this was sufficient for the coroner he instructed his jury to bring in a verdict of justifiable homicide which they obediently did this verdict the coroner then said entailed the same consequences as an act of fellow de se and he felt that he could not give a warrant for the burial of the deceased however painful the duty devolved on him in thus adding to the sorrows of the surviving relations the law appeared too clear to him to admit of an alternative 
the coroner was just as eager as the judges to exhibit his zeal for the gentry who were being injured in their interests by these disturbances and though he could not hang anybody being only a coroner he could at any rate kick the one corpse brought before him doubtless the surviving relations for whose sorrows he had expressed sympathy carried the poor murdered man off by night to hide him somewhere in the earth after the law had been thus vindicated and all the business done with even to the corpse kicking by the coroner the farmers were still anxious and began to show it by holding meetings and discussions on the condition of the labourers everybody said that the men had been very properly punished but at the same time it was admitted that they had some reason for their discontent that with bread so dear it was hardly possible for a man with a family to support himself on seven shillings a week and it was generally agreed to raise the wages one shilling but by and by when the anxiety had quite died out when it was found that the men were more submissive than they had ever been the lesson they had received having sunk deep into their minds they cut off the extra shilling and wages were what they had been seven shillings a week for a hard-working seasoned labourer with a family to keep and from four to six shillings for young unmarried men and for women even for those who did as much work in the field as any man but there were no more risings End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of a shepherd's life by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen the shepherd's return yarnborough castle sheep fair caleb leaves doveton and goes to dorset a land of strange happenings he is homesick and returns to winterbourne bishop joseph his brother leaves home his meeting with caleb's old master settles in dorset and is joined by his sister hannah they marry and have children i go to look for them joseph bowcombe in extreme old age hannah in decline caleb's shepherding period in doveton came to a somewhat sudden conclusion it was nearing the end of august and he was beginning to think about the sheep which would have to be taken to the castle sheep fair on fifth october and it appeared strange to him that his master had so far said nothing to him on the subject by castle he meant yarnborough castle the name of a vast prehistoric earthwork on one of the high downs between warminster and amesbury there is no village there and no house near it is nothing but an immense circular wall and trench inside of which the fair is held it was formerly one of the most important sheep fairs in the country but for the last two or three decades has been falling off and is now of little account when bowcombe was shepherd at doveton it was still great and when he first went there as mr ellerby's head shepherd he found himself regarded as a person of considerable importance at the castle before setting out with the sheep he asked for his master's instructions and was told that when he got to the ground he would be directed by the person in charge to the proper place the Ellerbys, he said, had exhibited and sold their sheep there for a period of eighty-eight years without missing a year, and always at the same spot. Every person visiting the fair on business knew just where to find the Ellerby sheep, and, he added with pride, they expected them to be the best sheep at the castle. One day Mr. Ellerby came to have a talk with his shepherd, and in reply to a remark of the latter about the October sheep fair, he said that he would have no sheep to send. "'No sheep to send, master?' exclaimed Caleb in amazement. Then Mr. Ellerby told him that he had taken a notion into his head that he wanted to go abroad with his wife for a time, and that some person had just made him so good an offer for all his sheep that he was going to accept it, so that for the first time in eighty-eight years there would be no sheep from Doveton Farm at the castle fair. When he came back he would buy again, but if he could live away from the farm he would probably never come back. He would sell it. Caleb went home with a heavy heart and told his wife. 
it grieved her too because of her feelings for mrs ellerby but in a little while she set herself to comfort him why what's wrong about it she asked twill be more in three months before the year's out and master'll pay for all the time sure and we can go home to bishop and abide a while without work and see if that father of yours has forgiven ee for going away to warminster so they comforted themselves and were beginning to think with pleasure of home when mr ellerby informed his shepherd that a friend of his a good man though not a rich one was anxious to take him as head shepherd with good wages and a good cottage rent free the only drawback for the balcombs was that it would take them still farther from home for the farm was in dorset although quite near the wiltshire border eventually they accepted the offer and by the middle of september were once more settled down in what was to them a strange land how strange it must have seemed to caleb how far removed from home and all familiar things when even to this day more than forty years later he speaks of it as the ordinary modern man might speak of a year's residence in uganda tierra del fuego or the andaman islands it was a foreign country and the ways of the people were strange to him and it was a land of very strange things one of the strangest was an old ruined church in the neighbourhood of the farm where he was shepherd it was roofless more than half fallen down and all the standing portion with the tower overgrown with old ivy the building itself stood in the centre of a huge round earthwork and trench with large barrows on the ground outside the circle concerning this church he had a wonderful story its decay and ruin had come about after the great bell in the tower had mysteriously disappeared stolen one stormy night it was believed by the devil himself the stolen bell it was discovered had been flung into a small river at a distance of some miles from the church and there in summer time when the water was low it could be distinctly seen lying half buried in the mud at the bottom but all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't pull it out the devil who pulled the other way was strongest eventually some wise person said that a team of white oxen would be able to pull it out and after much seeking the white oxen were obtained and thick ropes were tied to the sunken bell and the cattle were goaded and yelled at and tugged and strained until the bell came up and was finally drawn right up to the top of the steep cliff-like bank of the stream then one of the teamsters shouted in triumph now we've got out the bell in spite of all the devils in hell and no sooner had he spoken the bold words than the ropes parted and back tumbled the bell into its old place at the bottom of the river where it remains to this day caleb had once met a man in those parts who assured him that he had seen the bell with his own eyes lying nearly buried in mud at the bottom of the stream the legend is not in the history of dorset a much more prosaic account of the disappearance of the bell is there given in which the devil took no part unless he was at the back of the bad men who were concerned in the business but in this strange remote country outside of wiltshire balcom was in a region where anything might have happened where the very soil and pasture were unlike that of his native country and the mud adhered to his boots in a most unaccountable way it was almost uncanny doubtless he was homesick for a month or two before the end of the year he asked his master to look out for another shepherd this was a great disappointment to the farmer he had gone a distance from home to secure a good shepherd and had hoped to keep him permanently and now after a single year he was going to lose him what did the shepherd want he would do anything to please him and begged him to stay another year but no his mind was set on going back to his own native village and to his own people and so when his long year was ended he took his crook and set out over the hills and valleys followed by a cart containing his sticks and wife and children and at home with his old parents and his people he was happy once more in a short time he found a place as head shepherd with a cottage in the village and followed his flock on the old familiar down and everything again was as it had been from the beginning of life and as he desired it to be even to the end 
His return resulted incidentally in other changes and migrations in the Balcombe family. His elder brother Joseph, unmarried still, although his senior by about eight years, had not got on well at home. He was a person of a peculiar disposition, so silent with so fixed and unsmiling an expression that he gave the idea of a stolid thick-skinned man but at bottom he was of a sensitive nature and feeling that his master did not treat him properly he gave up his place and was for a long time without one he was singularly attentive to all that fell from caleb about his wide wanderings and strange experiences especially in the distant dorset country and at length about a year after his brother's return he announced his intention of going away from his native place for good to seek his fortune in some distant place where his services would perhaps be better appreciated when asked where he intended going he answered that he was going to look for a place in that part of dorset where caleb had been shepherd for a year and had been so highly thought of now joseph being a single man had no sticks all his possessions went into a bundle which he carried tied to his crook and with his sheep-dog following at his heels he set forth early one morning on the most important adventure of his life then occurred an instance of what we call a coincidence but which the shepherd of the downs nursed in the old beliefs and traditions prefers to regard as an act of providence about noon he was trudging along in the turnpike road when he was met by a farmer driving in a trap who pulled up to speak to him and asked him if he could say how far it was to winterbourne bishop joseph replied that it was about fourteen miles he had left bishop that morning then the farmer asked him if he knew a man there named caleb bawcombe and if he had a place as shepherd there as he was now on his way to look for him and to try and persuade him to go back to dorset where he had been his head shepherd for the space of a year joseph said that caleb had a place as head shepherd on a farm at bishop that he was satisfied with it and was moreover one that preferred to bide in his native place the farmer was disappointed, and the other added, "'Maybe you've heard Caleb speak of his elder brother Joseph. I be he.' "'What?' exclaimed the farmer. "'You're Caleb's brother. Where be going, then? To a new place?' "'I've got no place. I be going to look for a place in Dorsetshire.' "'Tis strange to hear you say that,' exclaimed the farmer. "'He was going,' he said, "'to see Caleb.' and if he would not or could not go back to dorset himself to ask him to recommend some man of the village to him for he was tired of the ways of the shepherds of his own part of the country and his heart was set on getting a man from caleb's village where shepherds understood sheep and knew their work now look here shepherd he continued if you'll engage yourself to me for a year i'll go no farther but take you right back with me in the trap the shepherd was very glad to accept the offer he devoutly believed that in making it the farmer was but acting in accordance with the will of a power that was mindful of man and kept watch on him even on his poor servant joseph who had left his home and people to be a stranger in a strange land so well did servant and master agree that joseph never had occasion to look for another place when his master died an old man his son succeeded him as tenant of the farm and he continued with the son until he was past work before his first year was out his younger sister hannah came to live with him and keep house and eventually they both got married joseph to a young woman of the place and hannah to a small working farmer whose farm was about a mile from the village children were born to both and in time grew up joseph's sons following their father's vocation while hannah's were brought up to work on the farm and some of them too got married in time and had children of their own these are the main incidents in the lives of joseph and hannah related to me at different times by their brother he had followed their fortunes from a distance sometimes getting a message or hearing of them incidentally but he did not see them joseph never returned to his native village and the visits of hannah to her old home had been few and had long ceased but he cherished a deep enduring affection for both 
he was always anxiously waiting and hoping for tidings of them for joseph was now a feeble old man living with one of his sons and hannah long a widow was in declining health but still kept the farm assisted by one of her sons and two unmarried daughters though he had not heard for a long time it never occurred to him to write nor did they ever write to him then when i was staying at winterbourne bishop and had the intention of shortly paying a visit to caleb it occurred to me one day to go into dorset and look for these absent ones so as to be able to give him an account of their state it was not a long journey, and, arrived at the village, I soon found a son of Joseph, a fine-looking man who took me to his cottage, where his wife led me into the old shepherd's room. I found him very aged in appearance, with a grey face and sunken cheeks, lying on his bed and breathing with difficulty. But when I spoke to him of Caleb, a light of joy came into his eyes, and he raised himself on his pillows and questioned me eagerly about his brother's state and family, and begged me to assure Caleb that he was still quite well, although too feeble to get around much, and that his children were taking good care of him. From the old brother I went on to seek the young sister, there was a difference of more than twenty years in their respective ages, and found her at dinner in the large old farmhouse kitchen. At all events she was presiding, the others present being her son, their hired labourer, the farm boy, and two unmarried daughters. She herself tasted no food. I joined them at their meal, and it gladdened and saddened me at the same time to be with this woman, for she was Caleb's sister, and was attractive in herself, looking strangely young for her age, with beautiful dark soft eyes and but few white threads in her abundant black hair. The attraction was also in her voice and speech and manner but alas there was that in her face which was painful to witness the signs of long suffering of nights that bring no refreshment an expression in the eyes of one that is looking anxiously out into the dim distance a vast unbounded prospect but with clouds and darkness resting on it it was not without a feeling of heaviness at the heart that i said good-bye to her nor was i surprised when less than a year later Caleb received news of her death. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of A Shepherd's Life by William Henry Hudson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 The Dark People of the Village How the materials for this book were obtained, The Hedgehog Hunter, A Gypsy Taste, history of a dark-skinned family, hedgehog-eaters, half-bred and true gypsies, perfect health, eating carrion, mysterious knowledge and faculties, the three dark Wiltshire types, story of another dark man of the village, account of Liddy, his shepherding, a happy life with horses, dies of a broken heart, his daughter. I have sometimes laughed to myself when thinking how a large part of the material composing this book was collected. It came to me in conversations, at intervals, during several years, with the shepherd. In his long life in his native village, a good deal of it spent on the quiet down, he had seen many things it was or would be interesting to hear. The things which had interested him too at the time, and had fallen into oblivion, yet might be recovered. I discovered that it was of little use to question him. The one valuable recollection he possessed on any subject would, as a rule, not be available when wanted. It would lie just beneath the surface, so to speak, and he would pass and repass over the ground without seeing it. He would not know that it was there. It would be like the acorn which a jay or squirrel has hidden and forgotten all about which he will nevertheless recover some day if by chance something occurs to remind him of it the only method was to talk about the things he knew and when by chance he was reminded of some old experience or some little observation or incident worth hearing to make a note of it then wait patiently for something else 
It was a very slow process, but it is not unlike the one we practice always with regard to wild nature. We are not in a hurry, but are always watchful, with eyes and ears and mind open to what may come. It is a mental habit, and when nothing comes we are not disappointed. The act of watching has been a sufficient pleasure, and when something does come we take it joyfully, as it were a gift, a valuable object picked up by chance in our walks. When I turned into the shepherd's cottage, if it was in winter and he was sitting by the fire, I would sit and smoke with him, and if we were in a talking mood, I would tell him where I had been and what I had heard and seen, on the heath, in the woods, in the village, or anywhere, on the chance of its reminding him of something worth hearing in his past life. One Sunday morning, in the late summer, during one of my visits to him, I was out walking in the woods and found a man of the village, a farm labourer, with his small boy hunting for hedgehogs. He had caught and killed two, which the boy was carrying. He told me he was very fond of the flesh of hedgehogs. Pigs, he called them for short. He said he would not exchange one for a rabbit. He always spent his holidays pig-hunting. He had no dog and didn't want one. He found them himself, and his method was to look for the kind of place in which they were accustomed to live, a thick mass of bramble growing at the side of an old ditch as a rule. He would force his way into it, and, moving round and round, trample down the roots and loose earth and dead leaves with his heavy iron-shod boots until he broke into the nest or cell of the spiny little beast hidden away under the bush. He was a short, broad-faced man with a brown skin, black hair, and intensely black eyes. Talking with the shepherd that evening, I told him of the encounter, and remarked that the man was probably a gypsy in blood, although a labourer, living in the village, and married to a woman with blue eyes who belonged to the place. This incident reminded him of a family named Target in his native village, consisting of four brothers and a sister. He knew them first when he was a boy himself, but could not remember their parents. It seemed as if they didn't have any, he said. The four brothers were very much alike, short with broad faces, black eyes and hair, and brown skins. They were good workers, but somehow they were never treated by the farmers like the other men. They were paid less wages, as much as two to four shillings a week less per man, and made to do things that others would not do, and generally imposed upon. It was known to every employer of labour in the place that they could be imposed upon, yet they were not fools, and occasionally, if their master went too far in bullying and abusing them, and compelling them to work overtime every day, they would have sudden violent outbursts of rage, and go off without any pay at all. What became of their sister he never knew, but none of the four brothers ever married. They lived together always, and two died in the village, the other two going to finish their lives in the workhouse. One of the curious things about these brothers was that they had a passion for eating hedgehogs. They had it from boyhood, and as boys used to go a distance from home and spend the day hunting in hedges and thickets. When they captured a hedgehog, they would make a small fire in some sheltered spot and roast it, and while it was roasting, one of them would go to the nearest cottage to beg for a pinch of salt, which was generally given. These two, I said, must have been gypsies, at all events on one side. Where there is a cross, the gypsy strain is generally strongest, although the children, if brought up in the community, often remain in it all their lives, but they are never quite of it. Their love of wildness and of eating wild flesh remains in them, and it is also probable that there is an instability of character, a restlessness, which the small farmers who usually employ such men know and trade on. The gypsy who takes to farm work must not look for the same treatment as the big-framed, white-skinned man who is as strong, enduring, and unchangeable as a draft-horse or ox, and constant as the sun itself. 
the gypsy element is found in many if not most villages in the south of england i know one large scattered village where it appears predominant as dirty and disorderly looking a place as can be imagined the ground round every cottage resembling a gypsy camp but worse owing to its greater litter of old rags and rubbish strewn about but the people like all gypsies are not so poor as they look and most of the cottagers keep a trap and pony with which they scour the country for many miles around in quest of bones rags and bottles and anything else they can buy for a few pence also anything they can pick up for nothing this is almost the only kind of settled life which a man with a good deal of gypsy blood in him can tolerate it affords some scope for his chaffering and predatory instincts and satisfies the roving passion which is not so strong in those of mixed blood but it is too respectable or humdrum a life for the true undegenerate gypsy one wet evening in september last i was prowling in a copse near shrewton watching the birds when i encountered a young gypsy and recognized him as one of a gang of about a dozen i had met several days before near salisbury they were on their way they had told me to a village near shaftesbury where they hoped to remain a week or so what are you doing here i asked my gypsy he said he had been to admonston he had been on his legs out in the rain and wet to the skin since morning he didn't mind that much as the wet didn't hurt him and he was not tired but he had eight miles to walk yet over the downs to a village on the wylie where his people were staying i remarked that i had thought they were staying over shaftesbury way he then looked sharply at me ah yes he said i remember we met you and had some talk a fortnight ago yes we went there but they wouldn't have us they soon ordered us off they advised us to settle down if we wanted to stay anywhere settle down i'd rather be dead there spoke the true gypsy and they are mostly of that mind but what a mind it is for human beings in this climate it is in a year like this of nineteen o nine when a long cold winter and a miserable spring with frosty nights lasting well into june was followed by a cold wet summer and a wet autumn that we can see properly what a mind and body is his how infinitely more perfect the correspondence between organism and environment in his case than in ours who have made our own conditions who have not only houses to live in but a vast army of sanitary inspectors physicians and bacteriologists to safeguard us from that wicked stepmother who is anxious to get rid of us before our time in all this miserable year during which i have met and conversed with and visited many scores of gypsies i have not found one who was not in a cheerful frame of mind even when he was under a cloud with the police on his track nor one with a cold or complaining of an ache in his bones or of indigestion the subject of gypsies catching cold connects itself just now in my mind with that of the gypsy's sense of humour he has that sense and it makes him happy when he is reposing in the bosom of his family and can give it free vent but the instant you appear on the scene its gracious outward signs vanish like lightning and he is once more the sly subtle animal watching you furtively but with intensity when you have left him and he relaxes the humour will come back to him for it is a humour similar to that of some of the lower animals especially birds of the crow family and of primitive people only more highly developed and is concerned mainly with the delight of trickery with getting the better of some one and the huge enjoyment resulting from the process one morning between nine and ten o'clock during the excessively cold spell near the end of november nineteen o nine i paid a visit to some gypsies i knew at their camp the men had already gone off for the day but some of the women were there a young married woman two big girls and six or seven children it was a hard frost and their sleeping accommodation was just as in the summer time bundles of straw and old rugs placed in or against little half-open canvas and rag shelters but they all appeared remarkably well and some of the children were standing on the hard frozen ground with bare feet they assured me that they were all well that they hadn't caught colds and didn't mind the cold 
I remarked that I had thought the severe frost might have proved too much for some of them in that high, unsheltered spot in the downs, and that if I had found one of the children down with a cold, I should have given it a sixpence to comfort it. "'Oh!' cried the young married woman. "'There's my poor six-months-old baby, half dead of a cold. He's very bad, poor dear, and I'm in great trouble about him.' he is bad the darling cried one of the big girls i'll soon show you how bad he is and with that she dived into a pile of straw and dragged out a huge fat sleeping baby holding it up in her arms she begged me to look at it to see how bad it was the fat baby slowly opened its drowsy eyes and blinked at the sun but uttered no sound for it was not a crying baby but was like a great fat retriever pup pulled out of its warm bed how healthy they are is hardly known even to those who make a special study of these aliens, who, albeit aliens, are yet more native than any Englishman in the land. It is not merely their indifference to wet and cold. More wonderful still is their dog-like capacity of assimilating food, which to us would be deadly. This is indeed not a nice or pretty subject, and I will give but one instance to illustrate my point the reader with a squeamish stomach may skip the ensuing paragraph an old shepherd of chittern relates that a family or gang of gipsies used to turn up from time to time at the village he generally saw them at lambing time when one of the heads of the party with whom he was friendly would come round to see what he had to give them on one occasion his gipsy friend appeared and after some conversation on general subjects asked him if he had anything in his way no nothing this time said the shepherd lambing was over two or three months ago and there's nothing left no dead lamb i hung up a few calls on a beam in the old shed thinking they would do for the dogs but forgot them and they went bad and then dried up they'll do very well for us said his friend no don't you take them cried the shepherd in alarm i tell you they went bad months ago and twould kill any one to eat such stuff they've dried up now and are dry and black as old skin oh that doesn't matter we know how to make em all right said the gipsy soaked with a little salt then boiled they'll do very well and off he carried them in reading the reports of the assizes held at salisbury from the late eighteenth century down to about eighteen forty it surprised me to find how rarely a gipsy appeared in that long sad monotonous procession of criminals who passed before the man sitting with his black cap on his head and were sent to the gallows or to the penal settlements for stealing sheep and fowls and ducks or anything else yet the gipsies were abundant then as now living the same wild lawless life quartering the country and hanging round the villages to spy out everything stealable the man caught was almost invariably the poor slow-minded heavy-footed agricultural labourer the light quick-moving cunning gipsy escaped in the salisbury journal for eighteen twenty i found a communication on this subject in which the writer says that a common trick of the gipsies was to dig a deep pit at their camp in which to bury a stolen sheep and on this spot they would make their campfire if the sheep was not missed or if no report of its loss was made to the police the thieves would soon be able to dig it up and enjoy it but if inquiries were made they would have to wait until the affair had blown over it amused me to find from an incident related to me by a workman in the village where i was staying lately that this simple ancient device is still practised by the gipsies my informant said that on going out at about four o'clock one morning during the late summer he was surprised at seeing two gipsies with a pony and cart at the spot where a party of them had been encamped a fortnight before he watched them himself unseen and saw that they were digging a pit on the spot where they had had their fire they took out several objects from the ground but he was too far away to make out what they were they put them in the cart and covered them over then filled up the pit trampled the earth well down and put the ashes and burnt sticks back in the same place after which they got into the cart and drove off of course a man even a nomad must have some place to conceal his treasures or belongings in and the gipsy has no cellar nor attic nor secret cupboard 
and as for his van it is about the last place in which he would bestow anything of value or incriminating for though he is always on the move he is moving or sitting still always under a cloud the ground is therefore the safest place to hide things in especially in a country like the wiltshire downs though he may use rocks and hollow trees in other districts his habit is that of the jay and magpie and of the dog with a bone to put by till it is wanted possibly the rural police have not yet discovered this habit of the gipsy indeed the contrast in mind and locomotive powers between the gipsy and the village policeman has often amused me the former most like the thievish jay ever on mischief bent the other who has his eye on him is more like the portly cochin china fowl of the farmyard or the muscovy duck or stately gobbler to go back when the buried sheep had to be kept too long buried and was found gone bad when disinterred i fancy it made little difference to the diners one remembers thoreau's pleasure at the spectacle of a crowd of vultures feasting on the carrion of a dead horse the fine healthy appetite and boundless vigour of nature filled him with delight but it is not only some of the lower animals dogs and vultures for instance which possess this power and immunity from the effects of poisons developed in putrid meat the greenlanders and african savages and many other peoples in various parts of the world have it as well sometimes when sitting with gypsies at their wild hearth i have felt curious as to the contents of that black pot simmering over the fire no doubt it often contains strange meats but it would not have been etiquette to speak of such a matter it is like the pot on the fire of the venezuela savage into which he throws whatever he kills with his little poisoned arrows or fishes out of the river probably my only quarrel with them would be about the little fledglings it angers me to see them beating the bushes in spring in search of small nesties and the callow young that are in them after all the gypsies could retort that my friends the jays and magpies are at the same business in april and may it is just these habits of the gypsy which i have described shocking to the moralist and sanitarian and disgusting to the person of delicate stomach it may be which pleases me rather than the romance and poetry which the scholar gypsy enthusiasts are fond of reading into him he is to me a wild untamable animal of curious habits and interests me as a naturalist accordingly it may be objected that being a naturalist occupied with the appearance of things i must inevitably miss the one thing which others find in a talk i had with a gypsy a short time ago he said to me you know what the books say and we don't but we know other things that are not in the books and that's what we have it's ours our own and you can't know it it was well put but i was not perhaps so entirely ignorant as he imagined of the nature of that special knowledge or shall we say faculty which he claimed i take it to be cunning the cunning of a wild animal with a man's brain and a small and infinitesimal dose of something else which eludes us but that something else is not of a spiritual nature the gypsy has no such thing in him the soul growths are rooted in the social instinct and are developed in those in whom that instinct is strong i think that if we analyze that dose of something else we will find that it is still the animal cunning a special a sublimated cunning the fine flower of his whole nature and that it has nothing mysterious in it he is a parasite but free and as well able to exist free as the fox or jackal but the parasitism pays him well and he has followed it so long in his intercourse with social man that it has come to be like an instinct or secret knowledge and is nothing more than a marvellously keen penetration which reveals to him the character and degree of credulity and other mental weakness of his subject it is not so much the wind on the heath brother as the fascination of lawlessness which makes his life an everlasting joy to him to pit himself against gamekeeper farmer policeman and everybody else and defeat them all 
to flourish like the parasitic fly on the honey in the hive and escape the wrath of the bees i must now return from this long digression to my conversation with the shepherd about the dark people of the village there were i continued other black-eyed and black-haired people in the village who had no gypsy blood in their veins so far as i could make out there were dark people of three originally distinct and widely different races in the wiltshire downs there was a good deal of mixed blood no doubt and many dark persons could not be identified as belonging to any particular race nevertheless three distinct types could be traced among the dark people and i took them to be first the gypsy rather short of stature brown-skinned with broad face and high cheekbones like the men we had just been speaking of secondly the men and women of white skins and good features who had rather broad faces and round heads and were physically and mentally just as good as the best blue-eyed people these were probably the descendants of the dark broad-faced wilsitas who came over at the time when the country was being overrun with the english and other nations or tribes and who colonized in wiltshire and gave it their name the third type differed widely from both the others they were smallest in size and had narrow heads and long or oval faces and were very dark with brown skins they also differed mentally from the others being of a more lively disposition and hotter temper the characters which distinguish the ancient british or iberian race appeared to predominate in persons of this type the shepherd said he didn't know much about all that but he remembered that they once had a man in the village who was like the last kind i had described he was a labourer named tark who had several sons and when they were grown up there was a last one born he had to be the last because his mother died when she gave him birth and that last one was like his father small very dark-skinned with eyes like sloes and exceedingly lively and active Tark himself, he said, was the liveliest, most amusing man he had ever known, and the quickest to do things, whatever it was he was asked to do, but he was not industrious and not thrifty. The Tarks were always very poor. He had a good ear for music and was a singer of the old songs. He seemed to know them all. One of his performances was with a pair of cymbals which he had made for himself out of some old metal plates and with these he used to play while dancing about clashing them in time striking them on his head his breast and legs in these dances with the cymbals he would whirl and leap about in an astonishing way standing sometimes on his hands then on his feet so that half the people in the village used to gather at his cottage to watch his antics on a summer evening one afternoon he was coming down the village street and saw the blacksmith standing near his cottage looking up at a tall fir tree which grew there on his ground what be looking at cried tark the blacksmith pointed to a branch the lowest branch of all but about forty feet from the ground and said a chaffinch had his nest in it about three feet from the trunk which his little son had set his heart on having he had promised to get it down for him but there was no long ladder and he didn't know how to get it tark laughed and said that for half a gallon of beer he would go up legs first and take the nest and bring it down in one hand which he would not use in climbing and would come down as he went up head first do it then said the blacksmith and i'll stand the half gallon tark ran to the tree and turning over and standing on his hands clasped the bowl with his legs and then with his arms and went up to the branch when taking the nest and holding it in one hand he came down head first to the ground in safety there were other anecdotes of his liveliness and agility then followed the story of the youngest son known as liddy i don't rightly know said caleb what the name was he was given when they christened him, but he were always called liddy and nobody knowed any other name for him liddy's grown-up brothers all left home when he was a small boy one enlisted and was sent to india and never returned the other two went to america so it was said 
He was twelve years old when his father died, and he had to shift for himself, but he was no worse off on that account, as they had always been very poor, owing to poor Tark's love of beer. Before long he got employed by a small working farmer, who kept a few cows and a pair of horses, and used to buy weathers to fatten them, and these the boy kept on the down. Liddy was always a leetle chap, and looked no more than nine when twelve, so that he would do no heavy work. But he was a very willing and active little fellow, with a sweet temper, and so lively and full of fun as to be a favourite with everybody in the village. The men would laugh at his pranks, especially when he came from the fields on the old plough-horse, and urged him to a gallop, sitting with his face to the tail, and they would say that he was like his father, and would never be much good except to make people laugh. But the women had a tender feeling for him, because although motherless and very poor, he yet contrived to be always clean and neat. He took the greatest care of his poor clothes, washing and mending them himself, he also took an intense interest in his weathers, and almost every day he would go to Caleb, tending his flock on the down, to sit by him and ask a hundred questions about sheep and their management. He looked at Caleb as head shepherd on a good-sized farm, as the most important and most fortunate person he knew, and was very proud to have him as guide, philosopher, and friend. Now it came to pass that once, in a small lot of thirty or forty weathers, which the farmer had bought at a sheep fair, and brought home, it was discovered that one was a ewe, a ewe that would perhaps at some future day have a lamb. Liddy was greatly excited at the discovery. He went to Caleb and told him about it, almost crying at the thought that his master would get rid of it. For what use would it be to him? But what a loss it would be! And at last, plucking up courage, he went to the farmer and begged and prayed to be allowed to keep the ewe, and the farmer laughed at him, but he was a little touched at the boy's feeling, and at last consented. Then Liddy was the happiest boy in the village, and whenever he got the chance, he would go out to Caleb on the down to talk about and give him news of the one beloved ewe. And one day, after about nineteen or twenty weeks, Caleb, out with his flock, heard shouts at a distance, and turning to look, saw Liddy coming at great speed towards him, shouting out some great news as he ran. But what it was, Caleb could not make out, even when the little fellow had come to him, for his excitement made him incoherent. The ewe had lambed, and there were twins, two strong healthy lambs, most beautiful to see. Nothing so wonderful had ever happened in his life before, and now he sought his friend oftener than ever to talk of his beloved lambs and to receive the most minute directions about their care. Caleb, who is not a laughing man, could not help laughing a little when he recalled poor Liddy's enthusiasm. But that beautiful shining chapter in the poor boy's life could not last, and when the lambs were grown they were sold, and so were all the weathers. Then Liddy, not being wanted, had to find something else to do. I was too much interested in this story to let the subject drop. What had been Liddy's afterlife? Very uneventful. There was, in fact, nothing in it nor in him, except an intense love for all things, especially animals and nothing happened to him until the end, for he has been dead now these nine or ten years. In his next place he was engaged, first as a carter's boy, and then under carter, and all his love was lavished on the horses. They were more to him than sheep, and he could love them without pain, since they were not being prepared for the butcher with his abhorred knife. Liddy's love and knowledge of horses became known outside of his own little circle, and he was offered, and joyfully accepted, a place in the stables of a wealthy young gentleman farmer, who kept a large establishment and was a hunting man. From stable boy he was eventually promoted to groom. Occasionally he would reappear in his native place. His home was but a few miles away, and when out exercising a horse, he appeared to find it a pleasure to trot down the old street, where as a farmer's boy he used to make the village laugh at his antics. But he was very much changed from the poor boy, who was often hatless and barefooted, to the groom in his neat, well-fitting black suit, 
mounted on a showy horse in this place he continued about thirty years and was married and had several children and was very happy and then came a great disaster his employer having met with heavy losses sold all his horses and got rid of his servants and liddy had to go this great change and above all his grief at the loss of his beloved horses was more than he could endure he became melancholy and spent his days in silent brooding and by and by to everybody's surprise liddy fell ill for he was in the prime of life and had always been singularly healthy then to astonish people still more he died what ailed him what killed him everyone asked of the doctor and his answer was that he had no disease that nothing ailed him except a broken heart and that was what killed poor liddy in conclusion i will relate a little incident which occurred several months later when i was again on a visit to my old friend the shepherd we were sitting together on a sunday evening when his old wife looked out and said lor here be mrs taylor with her children coming in to see us and mrs taylor soon appeared wheeling her baby in a perambulator with two little girls following she was a comely round rosy little woman with black hair black eyes and a singularly sweet expression and her three pretty little children were like her she stayed half an hour in pleasant chat then went her way down the road to her home who i asked was mrs taylor Balcom said that in a way she was a native of their old village of winterbourne bishop at least her father was she had married a man who had taken a farm near them and after having known her as a little girl they had been glad to have her again as a neighbour she's a daughter of that liddy i told ye about some time ago he said End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of a shepherd's life by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty some sheep dogs breaking a sheep dog the shepherd buys a pup his training he refuses to work he chases a swallow and is put to death the shepherd's remorse bob the sheep dog how he was bitten by an adder period of the dog's receptivity tramp the sheep dog roaming lost about the country a rage of hunger sheep-killing dogs dogs running wild anecdotes a russian sheep-dog caleb parts with tramp to caleb the proper training of a dog was a matter of the very first importance a man he considered must have not only a fair amount of intelligence but also experience and an even temper and a little sympathy as well to sum up the animal in hand its special aptitudes its limitations its disposition and that something in addition which he called a kink and would probably have described as its idiosyncrasy if he had known the word there was as much individual difference among dogs as there is in boys but if the breed was right and you went the right way about it you could hardly fail to get a good servant if a dog was not properly broken if its trainer had not made the most of it he was not a good shepherd he lacked the intelligence understanding was his word or else the knowledge or patience or persistence to do his part it was however possible for the best shepherd to make mistakes and one of the greatest to be made which was not uncommon was to embark on the long and laborious business of training an animal of mixed blood a sheep-dog with a taint of terrier retriever or some other unsuitable breed in him in discussing this subject with other shepherds i generally found that those who were in perfect agreement with caleb on this point were men who were somewhat like him in character and who regarded their work with the sheep as so important that it must be done thoroughly in every detail and in the best way one of the best shepherds i know who is sixty years old and has been on the same downland sheep farm all his life assures me that he has never had and never would have a dog which was trained by another 
but the shepherd of the ordinary kind says that he doesn't care much about the animal's parentage or that he doesn't trouble to inquire into its pedigree he breaks the animal and finds that he does pretty well even when he has some strange blood in him finally that all dogs have faults and you must put up with them caleb would say of such a man that he was not a good shepherd one of his saddest memories was of a dog which he bought and broke without having made the necessary inquiries about its parentage it happened that a shepherd of the village who had taken a place at a distant farm was anxious to dispose of a litter of pups before leaving and he asked caleb to have one caleb refused my dog's old i know he said but i don't want a pup now and i won't have him a day or two later the man came back and said he had kept one of the best of the five for him he had got rid of all the others you can't do better he persisted no said caleb what i said i say again i won't have an i've no money to buy a dog never mind about money said the other you've got a bell i like the sound of give it to me and take the pup and so the exchange was made a copper bell for a nice black pup with a white collar its mother balcom knew was a good sheep dog but about the other parent he made no inquiries on receiving the pup he was told that its name was tory and he did not change it it was always difficult he explained to find a name for a dog a name that is to say which any one would say was a proper name for a dog and not a foolish name one could think of a good many proper names jack and watch and so on but in each case one would remember some dog which had been called by that name and it seemed to belong to that particular well-remembered dog and to no other and so in the end because of this difficulty he allowed the name to remain the dog had not cost him much to buy but as it was only a few weeks old he had to keep it at his own cost for fully six months before beginning the business of breaking it which would take from three to six months longer a dog cannot be put to work before he is quite half a year old unless he is exceptionally vigorous sheep are timid creatures but not unintelligent and they can distinguish between the seasoned old sheep dog whose furious onset and bite they fear and the raw young recruit as easily as the rook can distinguish between the man with a gun and the man of straw with a broomstick under his arm they will turn upon and attack the young dog and chase him away with his tail between his legs he will also work too furiously for his strength and then collapse with the result that he will make a cowardly sheep-dog or as the shepherd says broken-hearted another thing he must be made to work at first with an old sheep-dog for though he has the impulse to fly about and do something he does not know what to do and does not understand his master's gestures and commands he must have an object lesson he must see the motion and hear the word and mark how the old dog flies to this or that point and what he does the word of command or the gesture thus becomes associated in his mind with a particular action on his part but he must not be given too many object lessons or he will lose more than he will gain a something which might almost be described as a sense of individual responsibility that is to say responsibility to the human master who delegates his power to him instead of taking his power directly from the man he takes it from the dog and this becomes a fixed habit so quickly that many shepherds say that if you give more than from three to six lessons of this kind to a young dog you will spoil him he will need the mastership of the other dog and will thereafter always be at a loss and work in an uncertain way a timid or unwilling young dog is often coupled with the old dog two or three times but this method has its dangers too as it may be too much for the young dog's strength and give him that broken heart from which he will never recover he will never be a good sheep dog to return to tory in due time he was trained and proved quick to learn and willing to work so that before long he began to be useful and was much wanted with the sheep as the old dog was rapidly growing stiffer in his legs and harder of hearing one day the lambs were put into a field which was half clover and half rape and it was necessary to keep them on the clover 
this the young dog could not or would not understand again and again he allowed the lambs to go to the rape which so angered caleb that he threw his crook at him tory turned and gave him a look then came very quietly and placed himself behind his master from that moment he refused to obey and bawcombe after exhausting all his arts of persuasion gave it up and did as well as he could without his assistance that evening after folding time he by chance met a shepherd he was well acquainted with and told him of the trouble he was in over tory you tie him up for a week said the shepherd and treat him well till he forgets all about it and he'll be the same as he was before you offended him he's just like old tom he's got his father's temper what's that you say exclaimed bawcombe be ye say that tory's old tom's son i'd never have taken him if i'd known that tom's not pure bred he's got retriever's blood well tis known and i could have told ye if ye'd asked me said the shepherd but you do just as i tell ye and it'll be all right with the dog tory was accordingly tied up at home and treated well and spoken kindly to and patted on the head so that there would be no unpleasantness between master and servant and if he was an intelligent animal he would know that the crook had been thrown not to hurt but merely to express disapproval of his naughtiness then came a busy day for the shepherd when the lambs were trimmed before being taken to the wilton sheep fair there was bawcombe his boy the decrepit old dog and tory to do the work but when the time came to start tory refused to do anything when sent to turn the lambs he walked off to a distance of about twenty yards sat down and looked at his master caleb hoped he would come round presently when he saw them all at work and so they did the best they could without him for a while but the old dog was stiffer and harder of hearing than ever and as they could not get on properly caleb went at intervals to tory and tried to coax him to give him his help and every time he was spoken to he would get up and come to his master then when ordered to do something he would walk off to the spot where he had chosen to be and calmly sit down once more and look at them caleb was becoming more and more incensed but he would not show it to the dog he still hoped against hope and then a curious thing happened a swallow came skimming along close to the earth and passed within a yard of tory when up jumped the dog and gave chase darting across the field with such speed that he kept very near the bird until it rose and passed over the hedge at the farther side the joyous chase over tory came back to his old place and sitting on his haunches began watching them again struggling with the lambs it was more than the shepherd could stand he went deliberately up to the dog and taking him by the straw collar still on his neck drew him quietly away to the hedge side and bound him to a bush then getting a stout stick he came back and gave him one blow on the head so great was the blow that the dog made not the slightest sound he fell his body quivered a moment and his legs stretched out he was quite dead bawcombe then plucked an armful of bracken and threw it over his body to cover it and going back to the hurdles sent the boy home then spreading his cloak at the hedge side laid himself down on it and covered his head an hour later the farmer appeared on the scene what are you doing here shepherd he demanded in surprise not trimming the lambs bawcombe raising himself on his elbow replied that he was not trimming the lambs that he would trim no lambs that day oh but we must get on with the trimming cried the farmer bawcombe returned that the dog had put him out and now the dog was dead he had killed him in his anger and he would trim no more lambs that day he had said it and would keep to what he had said then the farmer got angry and said that the dog had a very good nose and would have been useful to him to take rabbits master said the other i got he when he were a pup and i broke him to help me with the sheep and not to catch rabbits and now i killed him and he'll catch no rabbits the farmer knew his man and swallowing his anger walked off without another word later on in the day he was severely blamed by a shepherd's friend who said that he could easily have sold the dog to one of the drovers who were always anxious to pick up a dog in their village and he would have had the money to repay him for his trouble 
to which Balcom returned, "'If he wouldn't work for I that broken, he wouldn't work for another. But I'll never again break a dog that isn't pure bread." But though he justified himself, he had suffered remorse for what he had done, not only at the time when he'd covered the dead dog up with bracken and refused to work any more that day, but the feeling had persisted all his life that he could not relate the incident without showing it very plainly. He bitterly blamed himself for having taken the pup and for spending long months in training him without having first taken pains to inform himself that there was no bad blood in him, and although the dog was perhaps unfit to live, he had finally killed him in anger. If it had not been for that sudden impetuous chase after a swallow, he would have borne with him and considered afterwards what was to be done. But that dash after the bird was more than he could stand, for it looked as if Tory had done it purposely, in something of a mocking spirit, to exhibit his wonderful activity and speed to his master, sweating there at his task, and make him see what he had lost in offending him. The shepherd gave another instance of a mistake he once made, which caused him a good deal of pain. It was the case of a dog named Bob, which he owned when a young man. He was an exceptionally small dog, but his quick intelligence made up for lack of strength, and he was of a very lively disposition, so that he was a good companion to a shepherd as well as a good servant. One summer day at noon, Caleb was going to his flock in the fields, walking by a hedge, when he noticed Bob sniffing suspiciously at the roots of an old holly tree growing on the bank. It was a low but very old tree with a thick trunk rotten and hollow inside the cavity being hidden with the brushwood growing up from the roots as he came abreast of the tree bob looked up and emitted a low whine that sound which says so much when used by a dog to his master and which his master does not always rightly understand at all events he did not do so in this case it was august and the shooting had begun and Caleb jumped to the conclusion that a wounded bird had crept into the hollow tree to hide, and so to Bob's whine, which expressed fear, and asked what he was to do, the shepherd answered, Get him! Bob dashed in, but quickly recoiled, whining in a piteous way, and began rubbing his face on his legs. Balcom, in alarm, jumped down and peered into the hollow trunk, and heard a slight rustling of dead leaves, but saw nothing. His dog had been bitten by an adder, and he at once returned to the village, bitterly blaming himself for the mistake he had made, and greatly fearing that he would lose his dog. Arrived at the village, his mother at once went off to the down to inform Isaac of the trouble, and ask him what they were to do. Caleb had to wait some time, as none of the villagers who gathered round could suggest a remedy, and in the meantime Bob continued rubbing his cheek against his foreleg, twitching and whining with pain. And before long the face and head began to swell on one side, the swelling extending to the nape and downwards to the throat. Presently Isaac himself, full of concern, arrived at the scene, having left his wife in charge of the flock and at the same time a man from a neighbouring village came riding by and joined the group. The horseman got off and assisted Caleb in holding the dog, while Isaac made a number of incisions with his knife in the swollen place and let out some blood, after which they rubbed the wounds and all the swollen part with an oil used for the purpose. The composition of this oil was a secret. It was made by a man in one of the downland villages, and sold at eighteen pence a small bottle. Isaac was a believer in its efficacy, and always kept a bottle hidden away somewhere in his cottage. Bob recovered in a few days, but the hair fell out from all the part that had been swollen, and he was a curious-looking dog with half his face and head naked until he got his fresh coat, when it grew again. He was as good and active a dog as ever, and lived to a good old age, but one result of the poison he never got over. His bark had changed from a sharp ringing sound to a low and hoarse one. He always barked, said the shepherd, like a dog with a sore throat. To go back to the subject of training a dog, once you make a beginning, it must be carried through to a finish. 
you take him at the age of six months and the education must be fairly complete when he is a year old he is then lively impressionable exceedingly adaptive his intelligence at that period is most like man's but it would be a mistake to think that it will continue so that to what he learns now in this wonderful year other things may be added by and by as opportunity arises at a year he has practically got to the end of his capacity to learn he has lost his human-like receptivity but what he has been taught will remain with him for the rest of his life we can hardly say that he remembers it it is more like what is called inherited memory or lapsed intelligence all this is very important to a shepherd and explains the reason an old head shepherd had for saying to me that he had never had and never would have a dog he had not trained himself no two men follow precisely the same method in training and a dog transferred from his trainer to another man is always a little at a loss method voice gesture personality are all different his new master must study him and in a way adapt himself to the dog the dog is still more at a loss when transferred from one kind of country to another where the sheep are worked in a different manner and one instance caleb gave me of this is worth relating it was i thought one of his best dog stories his dogs as a rule were bought as pups occasionally he had had to get a dog already trained a painful necessity to a shepherd seeing that the pound or two it costs the price of an ordinary animal is a big sum of money to him and once in his life he had got an old trained sheep-dog for nothing he was young then and acting as under-shepherd in his native village when the report came one day that a great circus and menagerie which had been exhibiting in the west was on its way to salisbury and would be coming past the village about six o'clock on the following morning the turnpike was a little over a mile away and thither caleb went with half a dozen other young men of the village at about five o'clock to see the show pass and sat on a gate beside a wood to wait its coming in due time the long procession of horses and mounted men and women and gorgeous vans containing lions and tigers and other strange beasts came by affording them great admiration and delight when it had gone on and the last van had disappeared at the turning of the road they got down from the gate and were about to set out on their way back when a big shaggy sheep-dog came out of the wood and running to the road began looking up and down in a bewildered way they had no doubt that he belonged to the circus and had turned aside to hunt a rabbit in the wood then thinking the animal would understand them they shouted to it and waved their arms in the direction the procession had gone but the dog became frightened and turning fled back into cover and they saw no more of it two or three days later it was rumoured that a strange dog had been seen in the neighbourhood of winterbourne bishop in the fields and women and children going to or coming from outlying cottages and farms had encountered it sometimes appearing suddenly out of the furze bushes and staring wildly at them or they would meet him in some deep lane between hedges and after standing still a moment eyeing them he would turn and fly in terror from their strange faces shepherds began to be alarmed for the safety of their sheep and there was a good deal of excitement and talk about the strange dog two or three days later caleb encountered it he was returning from his flock at the side of a large grass field where four or five women were occupied cutting the thistles and the dog which he immediately recognized as the one he had seen at the turnpike was following one of the women about she was greatly alarmed and called to him come here caleb for goodness sake and drive this big dog away he do look so desperate i'm afeard o he don't you be feared he shouted back he won't hurt ee he's starvin don't you see his bone stickin out he's askin to be fed then going a little nearer he called to her to take hold of the dog by the neck and keep him while he approached he feared that the dog on seeing him coming would rush away after a little while she called the dog but when he went to her she shrank away from him and called out no i daren't touch ye he'll tear my hand off i never seed such a desperate-looking beast 
"'Tis hunger,' repeated Caleb, and then very slowly and cautiously he approached the dog, all the time eyeing him suspiciously, ready to rush away at the slightest alarm. And while approaching him he began to speak gently to him, then coming to a stand, stooped, and patting his legs, called the dog to him. Presently he came, sinking his body lower as he advanced, and at last crawling, and when he arrived at the shepherd's feet, he turned himself over on his back, that eloquent action which a dog uses when humbling himself before and employing mercy from one mightier than himself, man or dog. Caleb stooped, and after patting the dog, gripped him firmly by the neck and pulled him up, while with his free hand he undid his leather belt to turn it into a dog's collar and leash. Then, the end of the strap in his hand, he said, Come, and started home with the dog at his side. Arrived at the cottage, he got a bucket and mixed as much meal as would make two good feeds, the dog all the time watching him with his muscles twitching and the water running from his mouth. The meal well mixed, he emptied it out on the turf, and what followed, he said, was an amazing thing to see. The dog hurled himself down on the food and started devouring it as if the mass of meal had been some living savage creature he had captured and was frenziedly tearing to pieces. He turned round and round, floundering on the earth, uttering strange noises like half-choking growls and screams while gobbling down the meal. Then, when he had devoured it all, he began tearing up and swallowing the turf for the sake of the little wet meal still adhering to it. Such rage of hunger Caleb had never seen, and it was painful to him to think of what the dog had endured during those days when it had been roaming foodless about the neighborhood. Yet it was among sheep all the time, scores of flocks left folded by night at a distance from the village one would have imagined that the old wolf and wild dog instinct would have come to life in such circumstances but the instinct was to all appearance dead my belief is that purebred sheep-dog is indeed the last dog to revert to a state of nature and that when sheep-killing by night is traced to a sheep-dog the animal has a bad strain in him of retriever or cur or rabbit-dog as the shepherds call all terriers when i was a boy on the pampas sheep-killing dogs were common enough and they were always curs or the common dog of the country a smooth-haired animal about the size of a coach-dog red or black or white I recall one instance of sheep-killing being traced to our own dogs. We had about six or eight just then. A native neighbor a few miles away caught them at it one morning. They escaped in spite of his good horse, with lasso and bolas also, but his sharp eye saw them pretty well in the dim light, and by and by he identified them, and my father had to pay him for about thirty slain and badly injured sheep after which a gallows was erected and our guardians ignominiously hanged here we shoot dogs in some countries the old custom of hanging them which is perhaps less painful is still followed to go back to our story from that time the stray dog was caleb's obedient and affectionate slave always watching his face and every gesture and starting up at his slightest word in readiness to do his bidding when put with the flock, he turned out to be a useful sheep-dog, but unfortunately he had not been trained on the Wiltshire Downs. It was plain to see that the work was strange to him, that he had been taught in a different school, and could never forget the old and acquire a new method. But as to what conditions he had been reared in, or in what district or country, no one could guess. Everyone said he was a sheep-dog, but unlike any sheep-dog they had ever seen. He was not Wiltshire, nor Welsh, nor Sussex, nor Scotch, and they could say no more. Whenever a shepherd saw him for the first time, his attention was immediately attracted, and he would stop to speak with Caleb. "'What sort of a dog do you call that?' he would say. "'I never seed one just like him before.' At length, one day, when passing by a new building, which some workers had been brought from a distance to erect in the village, one of the men hailed Caleb and said, where did you get that dog, mate? Why do you ask me that? said the shepherd. 
because i know where he come from he's a russian that's what he is i've seed many just like him in the crimea when i was there but i never seed one before in england caleb was quite ready to believe it and was a little proud at having a sheep-dog from that distant country he said that it also put something new into his mind he didn't know nothing about russia before that though he had been hearing so much of our great war there and of all the people that had been killed now he realized that russia was a great country a land where there were hills and valleys and villages where there were flocks and herds and shepherds and sheep-dogs just as in the wiltshire downs he only wished that tramp that was the name he had given his dog could have told him his history tramp in spite of being strange to the downs and the downland sheep-dog's work would probably have been kept by caleb to the end but for his ineradicable passion for hunting rabbits he did not neglect his duty but he would slip away too often and eventually when a man who wanted a good dog for rabbits one day offered caleb fifteen shillings for tramp he sold him and as he was taken away to a distance by his new master he never saw him again End of chapter twenty